don't know if you've seen the speedrunning Naruto or Naruto Shippuden videos, but if you haven't, we're basically gonna go through the story and plot of a series as fast as humanly possible. And today we're going to do Hunter x Hunter. I already feel my heart racing and my throat getting dry. Also, obligatory, if you like this video, please check if you're subscribed because YouTube does this thing where they unsubscribe people from channels. Why? Who knows? It's weird. Also, check out our other accounts like the Amagi too. Anyway, let's get to the video. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Pre-Hunter exam. Gon is first seen at his home of Whale Island, fishing for the Master of the Swamp. A fish that five grown fishermen pulling together couldn't land. Gon made a wager to his aunt Mito that if he could catch the fish, she would allow him to take part in the hunter exam. After a week of work, Gon finally succeeds and his aunt signs his application. Gon returns home and speaks to his aunt. She asks if Gon always knew about his father's trade, and also tells him that his father left Gon with her when he was only a baby. Gon replies being a hunter must be an important job that family comes only second and that it's time for him to meet his father. He's then seen preparing to board a ship heading for the hunter exam. Everyone in the town comes to say goodbye and wish him luck. Preliminary phase. The first night on the boat, there's a huge storm that tosses about most of the would-be hunters. After the storm, the ship's drunkard of a captain walks around to see only three candidates still able to move. One of them, Gon, is running back and forth trying to take care of the seasick. Later on, Gon is standing at the front of the boat, predicting that they'll be hit by another storm, this time three times the size of the previous night. The captain knows he's correct and not guessing, as he sees Jin and Gon and suspects Jin is Gon's father. He asks and finds that he's correct. The captain shows Gon how to steer the boat and also announces that the next storm was coming and anyone who wanted to get off should right now. All but Gon, Kurapika, and Leorio live. The captain asks why they all want to be hunters. Gon answers while the other two don't. Leori asks why they should tell him as he just steers the ship. The captain replies he screens applicants and it's up to him whether or not they pass. The remaining two tell him. While explaining, Karapika annoys Leorio to the point that they go into the storm to fight. When a crew member jumps in to stop them, he falls overboard and Gon jumps after him, narrowly missing his fall into the ocean thanks to Karapika and Leorio grabbing his ankles in time to pull them both back on board. When they reach land, the captain gives them a hint to head to a lone cedar tree outside of the city to find the navigators. Gon decides to go and Karapika decides to tag along. Leorio stays until he finds that there was another trick to weed out the weak, and he runs off to join the other two. Later, they reach a village that seems to be deserted, but Gon says he can hear them and so can Karapika. Then the whole population of the village comes out to start the mind ball going two choice quiz. The leader of the village asks two questions and all they can say is one or two. The man who heard the clue walks in and says he'll go first. She asks him, men have taken your mother and true love captive, who do you save? He chooses one thinking that's what she wants him to say. She says he may go. Leorio starts yelling because of the preposterous question. Kurapika tells him to be quiet, seeing Gon has heard something. She asks another impossible question and Leorio attacks her. Kurapika blocks it stating they passed since silence is the answer. He adds he heard the other man scream meaning he was killed but no one knows how. After a short walk the trio reach a house and find the two navigators posing as a couple being attacked by a magical beast called Kiriko. The beast takes off with the lady followed by Gon and Kurapika with Leorio staying behind to take care of the man. While chasing after the creature, Gon pulls ahead of Kurapika, closes in on the Kiriko, and bashes him in the head. The Kiriko drops the woman, who is caught by Kurapika. The creature still manages to get away from Gon, who continues chasing it. Soon, he comes to a clearing where the creature attacks him. Gon merely greets it and asks where the one he hit went to. It's revealed that both the Kiriko and the couple are a family, and the ones who would take the three to the hunter exam. The next day, they arrive at a small restaurant. The disguised magical beast orders a specific meal, then the cook sends them to a special room and delivers the meal. The room is actually an elevator that starts to drop. As they make their way down, Kurapika and Leorio try to find out whether Gon is taking the test for the wealth or for the adventure. He doesn't answer. Gon's hunter exam begins with him getting targeted by Tonpa, the rookie crusher. Tonpa first introduces himself as a friend trying to help Gon. Tonpa then introduces some of the other regulars such as Bourbon, the snake charmer, Toto the wrestler, the Amori brothers, Cherry, and Gerita the huntsman. While doing the introductions, they hear a blood-curdling scream, and they look to see a man missing his arms, courtesy of Hisuka the magician, who maimed him simply because he bumped into him. Tonpa fills the others in on Hisuka, recalling that last year, Hisuka was assessed by most as a favorite to pass and become certified. However, Hisuka was determined to have failed the exam when he injured a proctor. Realizing Hisuka was permitted to try again for his license, those listening question whether someone as wicked as Hisuka should be allowed to become a hunter. Tonpa shrugs and suggests that the Hunter Association is morally unbiased. Since the examiners are newly draft every year, Hisuka's state would effectively be wiped clean, disregarding the fact that he earned the prejudice of a previous administrator. Tonpa then offers Gon and the other two some juice. Gon, being the first to taste it, spits it back out saying it tastes funny, leading Kurapika and Leorio to dump theirs in the ground. Afterwards, Tonpa makes a hasty apology. First phase. Satots, the first examiner, begins the 287th hunter exam with an extremely long run down a tunnel. A kid on a skateboard ends up next to Gon, and he asks how old Gon is. Discovering that he and Gon are the same age, he decides to run too and jumps off his board. The kid introduces himself as Kilua. Gon looks back to see Leorio heavily fatigued on the verge of dropping out of the exam. Gon and Kilua pause to wait for Leorio, who then gets his second win and runs past. After running for 80 kilometers, they come to a set of stairs and start climbing, while Sato starts picking up the pace. At this point, many applicants have failed the exam due to the sheer exhaustion or succumbing to extreme mental strain. Kurapika notices that Leorio was able to continue the Stairmaster challenge by going topless. He decides he should follow Leorio's example and remove some of his outer garments, possibly storing them in his shoulder bag. 
As the two run, Kurapika brings up an earlier remark that Leorio made about wanting to become a hunter for the sake of getting rich, stating that he doesn't believe Leorio's motives to be so worldly. Leorio reaffirms that he's doing it for money, but then reveals he lost a dear friend because of the inability to pay for the medical bills. Now he wants to become a doctor to heal the sick for free, but he lacks the funds needed to pay for medical school. Therefore, he sees a hunter license as a sponsorship opportunity for his cause. Leorio, in turn, asks Kurapika why he desires to become a hunter. Kurapika recounts how his entire clan, the Kurda, were massacred by an organization of thieves known as the Phantom Troop. Kurapika wishes to track down the troop and confront them to avenge his brethren, but he lacks ties to the criminal network known as the Underworld in order to pursue them. He seeks to obtain a hunter license in order to gain clearance into mafia operations to become an inside man. Leorio remarks to take such a path may force Kurapika to become the very darkness that he detests, but Kurapika agrees that while that may be the case, he will do what it takes to carry out his mission and he only worries about that his resolve may falter when the time comes. Meanwhile, the top of the stairs is in sight. Gon and Kilwa race to see who will be the first to meet Sato Tatsai. When they reach the finish line, Sato states that they both crossed over simultaneously. Most of the other applicants make it to the crest of the hill, at which point Sato addresses all those who have come so far. Sato announces that he will continue to lead the group through the rest of the phase, but warns that the next part is extra dangerous as they will be passing through the Millsy Wetlands, aka the Swindler's Swamp, a zone renowned for endemic magical beasts who prey on humans. The entire party consents to go on. As they attempt to follow Sato, a thick fog envelops the participants. A number of examinees are consumed by the various species of magical beasts. Additionally, some of the applicants who appear to resent Hisoka band together and endeavor to murder him. Hisoka kills every single member of the belligerent faction gracefully and in an instant. This brief battle triggers Hisoka's bloodlust, causing him to declare that he will serve as an examiner to see who is worthy to carry on in the exam. Leorio and Gon, though afraid, confront Hisoka, and while they're easily defeated by Hisoka's superior combat skills, the latter proclaims that they have passed his judgment and would be a waste to kill as they have potential. Leorio is unconscious, so Hisoka carries him to the next phase while Gon meets up with Kurapika. Second phase. The second phase of the exam takes place in the Visca Forest Preserve, where the examinees meet gourmet hunters and proctors Menchi and Buhara. Buhara's test is to find the world's most dangerous pig and bring it back to him so he can eat it. Gon and his friends complete the task easily along with 70 other applicants. However, Menchi, the second examiner, baffles the other examinees when she tells them to make sushi, a traditional dish from Japan, as none of them know what sushi is. Menchi overreacts because of an examinee making them all fail as a result. No one passes, which requires the chairman Netaro to intervene. The test is taken to Split Mountain where examinees hunt for spider eagle eggs. At the end of the stage, there are 42 applicants left. A game at midnight. The 42 remaining applicants board the selection committee's airship, where it's revealed that their next phase of the exam will begin at 8 a.m. the next day. As everyone rests up for tomorrow, Gon and Kilwa encounter Netero, who challenges them to a game. If they win, he'd issue their licenses on the spot. All they have to do is take away a ball from Netero. Kilwa eagerly goes first, but fails. Gon then takes his turn to take the ball, but he also fails. Time passes, and when it seems Gon and Kilwa have tried every possible tactic, Netero suggests they attack together. Though they come seemingly close to it at one point, Netero rockets in between them at lightning speed and takes the ball. Kilwa calls it quits and ends up killing two applicants in his frustration. Gon, however, decides to play until he forces Netero to use his right hand. When he succeeds in doing so, Gon collapses in exhaustion where he is. Third phase. In the morning, the airship arrives at the top of Trick Tower. The 40 applicants are informed that the objective of Stage 3 is to get down from the tower alive within 72 hours. The group is forced to team up with Tonpa. The first series test is to win 3 out of 5 matches against tower prisoners. Tonpa takes the first match with a hardened looking criminal and promptly gives up. Gon faces the next prisoner, a serial bomber by the name of Setokan, in a match to see whose candle can burn the longest. Kurapika engages in a death match with the next opponent, Majitani, but refuses to kill him after seeing red, literally, and knocking the criminal unconscious. Majitani fades unconsciousness in an attempt to run out the clock. Leorio and the leader of the prisoners bet on whether he's faking. Leorio holds the man above a long drop, and Majitani wakes up. He concedes the match to Kurapika, but the group loses a large chunk of their time because of the bet. Leorio goes next. His opponent is Larut, an attractive woman. He loses 10 hours in a bet. He then loses the rest of their betting hours to her. Kilua then faces Jonas the Dissector, a man responsible for the murder of at least 146 people with his bare hands. Kilua rips out his heart, explaining afterwards that Jonas is an amateur and he is a pro. The last test to get out of the tower has two paths. One is too long and the other only allows three of the five to enter. Leorio and Tonpa start fighting to see who will stay when Gon thinks outside the box. They choose the longer path, destroy the wall between the paths with axes provided so they can fight, and all five make it out. Fourth phase. The fourth phase is a manhunt on Zevil Island, where the 25 remaining competitors are being required to target and acquire their prey's plate. Go enjoys Hisoka and spends much of his time strategizing. He manages to get Hisoka's plate, but is attacked in the process by Geteta and paralyzed with a neurotoxin. Hisoka then kills Geteta, but gives Gon back his plate and then his own. Gon recovers in three days and comes across Leorio and Kodapika. He eventually helps Leorio to acquire his target's badge. The final phase. The final phase was a tournament with each of the participants. After being selected by the judges as being the most exceptional applicants, Hanzo and Gon face off first. Gon is outmatched when it comes to combat, but his unwillingness to submit causes Hanzo to forfeit the battle, making Gon the first applicant to pass the 287th Hunter exam. 
Hunter exam. Hanzo knocks Gon out and he doesn't awake until the exam has ended. Sato fills in the details and explains to Gon that only two people didn't pass the exam, Bodoro and Kilawa. It's revealed that Gitaraka is actually an alias for Kilawa's older brother, Ilumi. Kilawa was manipulated into murdering another contestant and subsequently failed the exam. Gon, enraged, confronts Ilumi and gets Kilawa's address. Gon, Kurapika, and Leorio all then depart to Kilawa's home in Kukuro Mountain. Arrival at Kukuro Mountain Gon, Leorio, and Kurapika arrive in the Republic of Padokia, Kilawa's home country. They board a tour bus which will take them to the entrance of the Zoldic estate. During the ride, they notice two suspicious tourists. The guide, Kokolu, informs everyone in the bus about the background of the Zoldic family. When they arrive, Gon asks Kokolu to let them inside the gate, but the guide is unable to do so as she doesn't have the permission. The two suspicious tourists take action and try to take the keys from the gatekeeper, Zebro. Zebro warns the two not to enter, but they continue anyway. The two open and enter a side door to the estate in hopes of finding the Zoldic family. However, soon after, screams are heard from within the gate. Zebro shrugs and calls Mike, telling him not to eat too much. The gate opens and the skeletons of the two ruffians are thrown out. The bus with the other tourists takes off in fear, leaving Go and Kurapika and Leorio. The three introduce themselves to Zebro as friends of Kilua, saying that they're here to visit him. Although delighted that someone cares to visit the family, Zebro is unable to let them in. The creature from before, Mike, guards the entrance to the property. He informs them that if anyone enters through this side door, they will be eaten just as the two before had. However, Gon is insistent and Zebro decides to take them inside through the testing gate. The three meet Mike, a gigantic wolf-like dog. Zebro asks Gon if he wants to befriend Mike, but Gon refuses and admits that Mike is scary. They move on through the estate until they reach the gatekeeper's quarters. The three meet a fellow hunter, Sequan, who was after the Zoldic family before he came to serve them. Sequan insults the three of them, saying that they're not able to open the testing gate, saying that if they're not able to open the testing gate, they're not good enough to meet the Zoldics. Enraged by this, the three agree to train within the Zoldic property for a few days in order to open the gates. After a total of 10 days of training, all three are able to open the gates. Both Gon and Kodapika are able to open at least one gate, weighing two tons each. Leorio is able to open two gates, a total of four tons. With this, Zebro and Sequant let the three proceed towards Kukuru Mountain and the manor. However, Sequant worries about the next trial the three will face. The Butler's Apprentice Inside the Zoldic Mansion, a lady and a child are seen walking along the hallway. They enter a room where Kilua is currently tortured by his older brother Miluki. Kilua's mother, Kikyo, informs him about his friend's arrival in their estate, but obviously confident that they will not pass through the gates. Gon, Kurapika, and Leorio continue towards the mountain, but another servant stops them. She introduces herself as Canary, a butler's apprentice. She was ordered not to let anyone pass her post, including Gon and his friends. When Gon tries to pass, she hits him hard with her staff. While Gon is attacked, a young child is watching the scene behind the bushes. The sun will soon set, but Gon still insists on going. Gon tells Canary that she's not like Mike, who is like a machine. Although she hides her feelings, she cares for Kilua and has a heart. Canary starts to cry and stops hitting Gon, and she asks him to save Kilua, but she's knocked unconscious. All of them look in the direction where the projectile came from. A lady with an elaborate gown, who is accompanied by a child, complains about Canary for talking too much about their family. She informs Gon that she is there to deliver a message from Kilua, saying that he will not be able to see them. She introduces herself as Kilua's mother and the child beside her as Kaluto. Kikyo begins to explain that Kilua is currently in the isolation room to regret his past actions. Meanwhile, in the isolation room, Miluki continues torturing Kilua, but is furious when he finds out Kilua is actually sleeping. Miluki informs him his friends have made their way through the gardens and are currently confronted by their mother. Miluki mocks Kilua by telling him that he'll call their mother and have his friends taken away. Kilua then breaks out of one of the chains, threatening Miluki. Their grandfather comes in and orders Kilua to go see his father. After he leaves, Miluki expresses his anger to Zeno. Instead, Zeno asks Miluki what he thinks of Kilua's abilities. Miluki praises him, saying that Kilua is one of the most talented members of the family, but he's emotionally weak, making him a failure as an assassin. Zeno then informs Kikyo about Kilua's freedom and his talk to his father. Kikyo is clearly upset and starts scolding her father-in-law through her visor. She excuses herself and leaves immediately. Kaluto stays for a while, glaring at Gon and his friends. When his mother called him, Kaluto quickly runs off after her. Canary regains consciousness and agrees to take Gon and his friends to the butler's headquarters, where they can make direct calls to the Zoldic family members. Father and Son before Kilua sees his father, he remembers the day he ran away from home. He goes inside the room and his father Silva is sitting across the room. He asks Kilua many things such as how the hunter exam was like and the friends he made. Silva makes Kilua sit with him to tell him about his adventures. When Silva finally asks him if he wants to see his friends again, Kilua nods. Silva makes Kilua promise never to betray his friends and sets him free. Before Kilua can get out of the mansion, Kikyo and Kalato arrive just in time to stop him. Kikyo tells Kilua that his friends already left and he should go back to the isolation room. Instead of listening, Kilua glares at his mother threateningly and leaves. Kikyo is surprised and proud that Kilua has become mature. The coin toss game. Canary leads Gon and his friends to the butler's headquarters. The head butler Goto insists they should make themselves feel at home. He informs them that Kilua is on the way and should stay here to wait for him. To pass the time, Goto suggests a coin toss game. Whoever gets it wrong will be out of the game and if all three of them lose, they will be expelled from the Zoldic property. 
Goto begins with a simple warm-up, with each level becoming harder and harder. Lario is the first to lose, then Kurapika. Goen gets serious as Goto asks assistance from two other butlers. To their surprise, Goen guesses the right answer. The coin is actually in the butler behind him. The butlers applaud for their performance. Kilua finally arrives and reunites with his friends. Before he leaves, Kilua reminds Goto not to take orders from his mother anymore, as they can't stop him. Goto then asks Goen to watch over Kilua as they leave. During their trip back to the airport, Kilua tells Goen that Goto hates cheating. He also tells Goen his recurring nightmares about Goto chasing him with a knife. Next meeting, York New City on September 1st. When they arrive at the airport, Kurapika tells everyone that he'll leave. He'll find a job to become a blacklist hunter that he's always wanted. Leorio also bids farewell as he wants to get ready to become a doctor. Before leaving, Kurapika tells them what Hisuka whispered to him during the hunter exam. Hisuka knows about the spiders and that they'll be at York New City on September 1st. Everyone agrees on meeting at the given location and time. As Kurapika and Leorio leave, Kilua suggests for the two of them to start training and earning money. And the one perfect place is Heaven's Arena. Gon agrees and they set off on their own adventure. Mecha for fighters and then? Gon and Kilua arrive in Heaven's Arena, a place where fighters gather. Their objective is to train, earn money, and find Hisuka so Gon can give back Hisuka's badge during the hunter exam. They start off in the lowest floor, easily winning their matches. They notice a fellow fighter, a boy named Zushi who's around their age. Later, Zushi faces off against Kilua in battle. Confident in his abilities, Kilua doesn't try his best to knock out Zushi. To his surprise, Zushi is able to withstand Kilua's attacks. When Zushi is unable to take another hit, he releases an energy that sends Kilua back. The feeling reminds Kilua of his older brother Ilumi, and he thinks they're somehow using the same technique. Zushi's master Wing, who's watching with the audience, shouts loudly to warn Zushi not to use that. Kilua wastes no more time, so he gives Zushi a powerful punch, which throws him out of the arena. Although defeated, Zushi can still get up despite the attack. Gon congratulates Kilua for winning yet another match, but Kilua is wondering about the technique Zushi used. He tells Gon that he overheard Zushi's conversation with Wing, and he apologized for using that. Gon suggests that they should ask Zushi instead. Later, Zushi explains to them everything. Gon and Kilua are unable to understand what Zushi's saying. Instead, Wing approaches them, and Kilua asks him if he could teach them about the technique called Nen. In their quarters, Wing starts to explain what Nen is and its principles. He demonstrates the same energy Zushi used before. When they get back to the tower, Kilua tells Gon that Wing was lying to them. The 200th Floor they finally arrive to the 200th floor. The hallway leading to the register is blocked by a strong aura. As they move forward, an employee shows herself. She informs them that they only have until midnight to register for the fight. Hisuka shows himself and tells them they're not ready yet to set foot on the floor. They try to force their way through, but Hisuka is stronger. Wing appears behind them and volunteers to teach them the real Nen. Back in Wing's room, he demonstrates Nen and makes them feel the pressure. He opens their aura node so that they can use Nen's technique called Ten. Two hours later, they come back to the 200th floor to face Hisuka. They successfully pass through the Nen barrier. After Hisuka leaves, they're confronted by three fighters, Gido, Sadaso, and Rayvelt, who challenge them to a fight. Gon Freaks vs. Gido the next day, Gon faces against Gido. Gido already has four victories and one defeat. He starts the match by taking out his dancing tops. Unaware what the tops do, Gon keeps on getting hit. He tries to dodge multiple times to no avail. Gon states that the tops are as strong as hammers. Gido continues on hitting him and gets five clean points. Gon tries to feel the movement of the tops, but still fails. When Gon was thrown out of the ring, he sees the top near, but not attacking him. He deduces that the tops are moving in all directions and shock themselves. Gon finally realizes how to dodge his tops. He then tries to kick Gido, but Gido himself spins like a top. Gon gets hit again, which earns Gido another three points. Gon stays calm and uses Zetsu. Wing, who's watching from the sidelines, is shocked because he didn't teach Zetsu to Gon yet. With Zetsu, Gon is able to dodge the top with his eyes closed. He can feel the movements of the tops and he can still fight. Hisuka also watches Gon's match and gets pumped up. The Aftermath After his fight with Gido, Gon earns three fractures and twelve cracks on his ribs. It will take him four months to recover. Kilwa starts ranting to him about his recklessness. Wing enters the room and slaps Gon. He proceeds to rant all the things Kilwa said before. Wing forbids Gon to fight for two months and will not let Gon practice Nen or study it. Gon promises and Wing gives him a wire of pledge. Wing then asks Kilwa what his objectives are in competing. Kilwa replies that he wants to earn money and Gon wants to train and ultimately fight Hisaka, noting that their plans change slightly upon meeting Wing and Zushi. Kilwa then comes back to see Gon meditating in his room so he joins in with Gon. Meanwhile, Kurapika approaches the Sengi Guild agency only to be rejected by an agent. She tells him that Kurapika is a rookie and smart, and Clients don't bother having rookies, but Kurapika is beyond being an amateur. She states Kurapika's exam isn't over yet and asks if he can see something right beside her. And since Kurapika can't, she suggests for him to come back again after he learns it. On his way back, Kurapika meets a man whose name is yet unknown, who steals his hunter license and so enters in on a match with Kurapika. After being utterly defeated, Kurapika receives his hunter license back, while the stranger tells him that he's going to teach him about Nen, to which Kurapika accepts, and as such, the older man becomes his master. Hisuka vs. Castro one month later, Gon is perfectly healed, which surprises Kilua because it needs four months for him to recover. Kilua then presents two tickets for Hisuka's match. He claims that he's able to get reserved seats because they're the fighters in the 200th floor and Hisuka's matches are quite popular. Before they can proceed any longer, Wing says no. Wing tells them that watching a match is considered learning Nen. Kilua leaves alone. One hour before the match, Kilua uses his assassination skills to approach Kashiro's room. He spots him sitting on a couch, but before he knew it, Kashiro is already by his side. This left Kilua surprised, yet he stays calm and lies to Kashiro that he's there for an autograph. Kashiro praises Kilua for his zetsu, although he already knew Kilua was there ever since he arrived at the floor. Hisuka's match against Kashiro is about to begin. 
Kashiro states he's gone through vigorous training to be able to defeat him. Kashiro attacks first and hits Hisuka while Hisuka wonders what just happened. In the sidelines, Kilua deduces Kashiro made an illusion. Kashiro charges at Hisuka again, this time Hisuka dodges the first punch, yet gets hit by the second. Kashiro continues to attack Hisuka through punches and kicks, and with the help of his speed, Kashiro is able to knock Hisuka down. The score is now 4-0. Hisuka stands up and begins to deduce Kashiro's fighting ability. Kashiro states that he'll take Hisuka's arm by using his signature move, the Tiger Bite Fist. Hisuka then gladly states he'll give his arm. Kashiro is able to cut off Hisuka's right arm. Hisuka finally realizes the secret of Kashiro's strength. Kashiro actually has a double. Kashiro shows off his double doppelganger ability and tells Hisuka he'll take his left arm next. Hisuka then hides his right arm with a piece of cloth. Out from the cloth, cards come out flying. He tells Kashiro to choose a card and memorize it, and asks what number would he get if he applied the following formula. X plus 4, which is in parentheses, times 2 minus 6, which is bracket divided by 2 minus x. He pulls a card out of his broken arm and shows an ace, which is one, of spades. He gives the card to Castro as a souvenir, telling him that he knew that the answer would be one. Castro charges again and takes his left arm. To their surprise, Hisuka's right arm is back and he starts to approach Castro. Castro continues to attack Hisuka with his double. Hisuka sends his cards towards Castro, which hits Castro's left arm. Castro continues to dodge, but he eventually gets hit all over his body. Hisuka wins the match, leaving a dead Castro behind. The Spider Back in the shadows, a female awaits Hisuka and lets him show his wounds. She comments on Hisuka being a stupid jerk and proceeds to treat his wounds as she's getting paid. Machi begins to stitch Hisuka's left arm with the help of her Nen ability. A few seconds later, Hisuka's left arm works perfectly. Machi proceeds to treat his right arm and charges him 20 million jenny for the left arm and 50 million jenny for the right arm. He uses a combination of bungee gum and texture surprise to hide his wounds. Machi then tells Hisuka she's leaving and not to push himself before his wounds are fully healed. She reminds Hisuka the most important thing, be in York New City at August 30th before noon. All members must be present. Hisuka asks her if the boss will be there, and she replies that he most likely will, and also if Hisuka doesn't show up, the boss will probably go after him. Hisuka also asks Machi if she could stay with him, but she had already left. Later, Hisuka takes a shower and removes the Phantom Troop tattoo on his back with the help of his texture surprise. Triple Threat Wing tells Gon and Kilawa that they'll start training again with Zushi. As part of their training, Wing lets Gon watch Hisuka's previous match with Kastro. Wing orders Kilawa and Gon to do 10, while Zushi uses Ren. Wing tells him to use Gon and look at Hisuka's aura on his body during the match. Then, Wing tells Gon that he has 28 days left to register in another match, and Kilua has 27. Gon will have his match on June 10th, while Kilua on June 9th. Until then, they'll master using Gyo. Later, Gon, Kilua, and Zushi arrive at the 200th floor and are confronted again by Gido, Rayovelt, and Sadaso. Kilua expresses his irritation to them, and Sadaso tells him that they want to know when Gon and Kilua are able to fight. Gon tells Sadaso that he'll fight on June 10th. However, Sadaso can't fight after May 29th, but he assures Gon that they'll fight. In the room, Gon and Kilua continue to practice, and Zushi is watching them. After training, Zushi leaves and is followed by Sadaso. He uses his Nen ability to stop Zushi from moving. Kilua approaches them and agrees to be their opponent. He assures them that he'll let them win and will offer victory to each one of them. However, Gon will not be able to fight them. The trio agrees and the match date is set to May 29th. Sadaso gives Zushi back to Kilua. Meanwhile, Gido is talking to Gon about Zushi's case. The next day, Kilua hears a man selling out tickets to Sadaso and Gon's match. In the room, Wing thanks Kilua for looking after Zushi last night. Kilua lies to Gon that someone called Kilua on the phone saying his friend fell asleep in the main entrance. Then Kilua asks Wing to let him see Hisuka's match again as he can do Gyo. Wing praises them for being able to learn Gyo in one evening. Kilua tells Wing he already decided what date he's going to fight, which is May 29th, his birthday, which is also a mega lie. Gon approaches Kilua because he knows they threaten Kilua too. Gon is willing to lose on purpose, but Kilua has another plan. In his room, Sadaso is delighted, believing he'll gain a sixth victory against Kilua and will soon become a floor master. Kilua enters his room and threatens him. If Sadaso moves, uses then, or makes a sound, he's dead. Kilua makes Sadaso swear that he'll never appear before them again. A few moments later, Kilua wins his match by withdrawal. Sadaso contacts Riovel through a phone and informs him that Kilua is like a person who lives in the dark side. By just looking through his eyes, Sadaso knows the difference between their strength, so he decided to quit, rather than die. Riovel claims that Kilua will not be able to scare him, but to his surprise, Kilua is already in their room. He tells them to respect the rules. Out of fear, Riovel and Guido agree to fight fair. Face Off, Part 1 the day of their matches has come. Gon thinks of using his father's old fishing rod as a weapon, to which Wing agrees. In the arena, Gon is the first one to make a move. Before Gon can come in any closer, Gido spins himself like a top. Next, he sends his dancing tops charging at Gon, but he simply blocks the tops. Gon successfully pulverizes the tops, which made Gido surprised how his Nen increased. Gon makes the next move by attacking with his fishing rod, and it seems ineffective against Gido. After a series of attacks, Gon lifts a flagstone of the ring with his fishing rod and smashes it onto Gido. Gido's knocked down, and Gon delivers his finishing punch and breaks Gido's metal leg. Gon threatens Gido not to lay a finger at Zushi again. Shortly after Gon's fight, Kilua faces against Riovelt. This time, Riovelt is completely confident. Kilua starts off by jumping too high and fast as Riovelt thought he had disappeared. Kilua appears behind him and tries to punch him, but Riovelt is able to dodge using Aura Burst. Kilua merely shrugs this off, thinking he jumped too high. Riovelt takes out two bull whips, calling them Twin Snake. He rapidly circles himself within the whips, and it looks like the perfect defense called Song of Defense. While boasting about his abilities, he sends the whips towards Kilua, but he simply catches them. Albeit surprised, Riovelt then switches Thunder Snake, which electrocutes anyone who's made physical contact with it. Riovelt begins to laugh and boast about his abilities again. 
This time, Kilo was sends him soaring through the air. He states that electricity doesn't hurt him as it was part of his training and torture. Riovelt begs for Kilowa to save him, and Kilowa agrees. Riovelt falls into his arms while Kilowa is holding the twin snakes. Due to the electricity, Riovelt gets electrocuted and loses the fight. Face Off Part 2 A few days later, Gon faces off against Riovelt. This time, Gon didn't bring his fishing rod. Riovelt starts a match by using his Song of Defense. Gon crashes on the floor, picks up a flagstone with his bare hands, and smashes against Riovelt. However, he manages to dodge the attack. Gon runs after him and grabs both his arms, which made Riovelt drop his whips. Gon takes the whips and wraps it around Riovelt's neck. Gon pretends to switch on the Thunder Snake, and because of fear, Riovelt passes out, making Gon the winner. Hisoka congratulates Gon on the sidelines. Hisoka agrees to fight Gon and let him decide when their fight is going to be. Wing says it's time to see what Nen-type Zushi, Gon, and Kilowa are. Using wine glasses filled full with water with a leaf on top, Wing demonstrates the water divination by using Ren around the glass. He reveals he's an enhancer by increasing the volume of water. Gon is an enhancer, Zushi is a manipulator, and Kilowa is a transmuter. After training, the three come back to see how they've improved. Kilowa's water tastes like honey, Zushi struggles, and Gon creates an amazing amount of water, impressing and scaring Wing. Kilowa and Gon pass the final hunter test. Gon versus Hisoka When Hisoka and Gon finally fight, it's a huge deal. The place is packed. Gon starts with a barrage of attacks, but gets hit quite a lot, and the score becomes 1-0, Hisoka. Gon comes up with a plan by flipping part of the arena's floor, much like he did in the previous fight, but this time punches it, causing a wave of rubble to fly towards Hisoka. In the rubble, Gon is able to get a very hard punch to Hisoka's face, scoring two points and fulfilling his goal to hit Hisoka in the face. 2-1, Gon. Hisoka casually walks towards Gon, and Gon does the same. Gon finally hands Hisoka his number 44 tag from the Hunter exam, because he just punched him in the face. Hisoka then takes some time to discover Gon is an enhancer, since he's simple-minded, and tells everyone the personality analysis method for discovering a person's Nen type, although Hisoka admits that this isn't exactly a science. Enhancers like Gon and Wing are simple and determined, transmuters, Hisoka and Kilowa are whimsical and liars, emitters are short-tempered, specialists tend to be independent, conjurers are high-strung and nervous, and manipulators are argumentative. Hisoka gets serious attacking Gon at will, with Gon barely able to even dodge. Hisoka eventually scores a critical hit. Gon must back off and the score becomes 3-2, Hisoka. Gon tries to think of a strategy, but Hisoka gets bored. He wants Gon to attack, but Gon refuses. It's revealed at some point that Hisoka put his bungee gum power in Gon's cheek. Hisoka pulls him over, giving a devastating punch. 6-2, Hisoka. The crowd doesn't seem pleased by the scoring. Hisoka explains when he attached the power, and Gon realizes the bungee gum can't be taken off. Hisoka becomes turned on like always, which I never knew I was ever going to say that in one of these videos, and allows Gon to punch him repeatedly. Hisoka then punches Gon using the bungee gum, is about to again, but Gon blocks the second punch. The judge gives Gon two points and Hisoka three points. One for a knockdown. Gon argues he never was knocked down as the crowd begins to boo loudly. Gon realizes he only has one point till he loses when suddenly a piece of rubble from the arena floor smacks him in the face and he loses. Hisoka used the time Gon argued to attach the bungee gum to it. Hisoka is pleased with how strong Gon has become. Gon is upset but realizes he still has a chance one day of defeating Hisoka. The judge admits he was in favor of Hisoka winning because he was worried about Gon dying during the fight. Kilo and Gon say goodbye to Wang and Zushi and head to Whale Island. Back home! Gon returns home to Whale Island with Kilowa. He introduces Kilowa to Mito, and they have a great meal together with his great-grandmother. Gon then shows his new hunter license to Mito, who almost breaks it. Later, Gon shows Kilowa around the island. In the late evening, Mito decides to bring them food. Kilowa tells Gon that he's envious of him, saying that Gon has goals while he has no direction and doesn't want to run the family business. Gon eventually convinces Kilowa to join him, with Gon looking for Jin and Kilowa deciding what he wants to do with his life. Kilowa then asks about Gon's mom, and Gon explains that he never wanted to ask Mito about her since he thinks of her as a mom. When Gon and Kilowa return to the house, Mito gives Gon a strange box that Jin left for him. She then tells him about how Jin left, and it's revealed that her parents died in a car accident, which is what she had told Gon had happened to his parents. After 10 years, Jin dropped off Gon as a baby and asked the two to look after him. Mito tells Gon that she and her grandmother really don't know anything about his mother, and even if he asked, she adds that she and Jin always played together growing up. The next day, Gon and Kilwa try to figure out how to open the box. Kilwa realizes that it involves Nen, and the box falls apart immediately after Gon uses it. The two notice that steel plates have the same strange markings as the thread put on Gon's finger by Wing. There's another colorful box inside, and Gon uses his hunter license to open it. The two find a tape, a ring, and a memory card inside. After putting the first item into a tape player, they discover a recording from Jin. Jin asks Gon if he truly wants to see him, but says that he doesn't want to see him because he feels selfish. Meanwhile, Jin is shown elsewhere sitting on top of a giant creature, which itself is sitting on top of an even larger creature that takes flight. At the end of the tape, Jin mentions Gon's mother, but Gon quickly turns it off. Suddenly, the tape uses Nen to rewind itself and record over the message, also preventing the two from destroying the tape player. They then turn to the memory card, and Kilowa explains that it's from a Joy Station console. After Kilowa buys one, they see that the only game on the memory card is called Greed Island. They learn that it's incredibly rare and insanely expensive. Kilowa calls his brother Miloki for more information and bribes him with the memory card, eventually learning that an auction will take place on September in New York New City. Meanwhile, Miloki finds out that a tycoon named Batara is willing to pay 50 billion jenny for anyone who completes the game. At the Flesh Collector's Mansion at some point after parting ways with his friends, Karapika succeeds in finding an agency specializing in providing rich and famous people with bodyguards and assistants. 
However, he's immediately told that despite his hunter license, he's not qualified for such work because he can't see something beside her. The agent says that his hunter exam isn't finished and tells him to come back. Kurapika returns at the beginning of August and accepts an offer to be hired as a bodyguard. In the Nurshrad's mansion, he meets Melody, Bass, Tochino, Basho, and Squala. The head bodyguard welcomes the applicants and sets a challenge for them to acquire one item from the list. However, he also tells them that they must escape alive. An 11 hood and assailants armed with guns and swords suddenly attack the group. With the use of his dowsing chain, Kurapika defends himself and observes the situation from above. He notices that Tochino is the only one not being attacked. Kurapika jumps comes towards him and puts a knife to his neck, ordering him to stop the attack. The 11 assailants fall empty to the floor, but Kurapika still suspects that another infiltrator is involved. Using his dowsing chain and pointing out Squala, Base, and Melanie and Basho confirm this by using their own men abilities. The four applicants then escape from the mansion. Gathering of Heroes Goat and Kilwa arrive in New York, New City and immediately visit an internet cafe to try the URL given to them by Miluki. With Goan's hunter license, they're able to access the hunter website and find out that Greed Island is a game for Nen users. Once a player starts the game, they're pulled into the world of Greed Island. Players cannot simply leave the game by cutting the power to the console. If a player dies within the game, he dies in real life. The two are also told that someone once hired 50 Nen users to enter the game, with none returning alive. While the game is indeed out of print, seven copies will be at the York New Auction with a starting bid of 8.9 billion jenny, a price higher than the two expected. Go and Kilwa decide to find a way to raise the money needed to acquire the game. Meanwhile, Kurapika, Base, Basho, and Melody are hired as bodyguards by Dalzone and their first task is to exhort their boss, Neon Nostrad, to York New City. As Neon arrives in York New, she uses her ability to read the fortunes of several Mafia members, which continues to increase the wealth and prestige of the Nostrad family. Elsewhere, the members of the Phantom Troop gather together, and their leader, Krollo, gives the order for them to steal everything at the underground auction and to kill anyone who gets in their way. The Underground Auction Massacre as Gon and Kilua visit the market to buy a new cell phone, they run into Leorio. The Nostrad bodyguards have been assigned for the upcoming underground auction. Three will attend the auction, and the others will provide surveillance around the cemetery building. Gon, Kilua, and Leorio discover a way to raise money and begin inviting people to their arm wrestling contest. If someone wins against Gon, they'll receive a diamond worth 3 million jenny. Gon continuously wins until a female troop member, Shizuku, challenges him. The match is intense, and Gon is forced to use his full strength to defeat her. Before the auction starts, Kurapika and Melody watch over the building's front entrance. While Kurapika wonders if the spiders will ever show up, Melody hears the rage in his heart. Knowing that he can't lie to her, Kurapika tells her the massacre of his clan, the stolen Scarlet Eyes, and his revenge. Meanwhile, Base, Tuchino, and Ivlenkov make their way inside the auction hall. While all the guests seated, Feitan and Franklin disguise themselves as hosts and proceed to kill everyone in the room. Tochino attempts to defend himself and his companions with his ability, but Franklin's Nen bullets easily rip through everything they touch. Base and Ivlenkov flee the room but are confronted by Shizuku. She easily kills them both and proceeds to clean the auction room, leaving no evidence behind. Kurapika calls Galzone and tells them that all the auction attendees are missing and the vault is empty as well. Galzone is then intent on joining the other Mafia members to chase after the thieves. A fierce clash between spiders and shadow beasts. As the troop members make their escape in the hot air balloon, Uvagen tells Krollo that the items were already taken and that there must be a traitor among the group. Krollo quickly convinces him that none of the members would have a reason to do so, guessing that the Mafia received a vague tip about their plan. Uvagen tells him about the Ten Dawns and their Shadow Beasts, one of whom named Owl was responsible for emptying the vault. Krollo then tells him to make enough noise to draw out the Shadow Beasts. In the Gordo Desert, the Mafia shoots down the hot air balloon and surrounds the troop members. The Nostrad bodyguards arrive in the scene shortly afterwards. Uvagen tells his comrades that he'll handle the Mafia, easily massacring them all and even withstanding a missile explosion. Kurapika and the other bodyguards are amazed by Uvagin's strength, and Melody senses someone approaching. It turns out to be Worm, one of the Shadow Beasts, and he and the three others, Leech, Rabbit Dog, and Porcupine, arrive to apprehend Uvogin. The other troop members continue to watch or play cards while Uvogin fights by himself. Worm is able to punch Uvogin directly in the face, but the attack does little to no damage. Uvogin then punches Worm back in the face, smashing it in. Worm survives the strike and tries to immobilize Uvogin by pulling him underground while the other Shadow Beasts take care of him. But Uvogin uses a Big Bang Impact to free himself. He tries to punch Porcupine, but Porcupine's hairs stop the attack, and Uvogin can't free himself from them. Rabbit Dog starts biting him and reveals that his bites contain paralyzing poison. After Uvogin is immobilized, Leech injects leeches into him and explains the powerful process that will lead to his death. However, Uvogin proceeds to bite off half of Leech's head, spitting out part of his skull towards Rabbit Dog's head and killing him instantly. While Porcupine's still on his hand, Uvogin then yells extremely loud and kills him with sound. Uvogin asks Shizuku if she can remove the poison in leeches, but she reminds him that Blinky can only suck up non-living things. Having caught sight of Uvogin's spider tattoo, Kurapika is enraged and prepares to attack him, only to be calmed by Melody's music. However, Kurapika continues with his plan and uses Chain Jail to capture Uvogin, hauling him into the car as he and the other bodyguards make their escape. The troop members then chase after them by using one of Machi's Nen threads. Owl suddenly lands on the troop member's car and uses his Fun Fun Cloth, trapping Nobunaga inside as the others escape. The remaining Shadow Beasts arrive and prepare to fight the troop members who remain completely unfazed. Uvogin captive? Where is the merchandise? The Nostrad bodyguards take Uvogin to an undisclosed location in order to interrogate him. Uvogin tells them that he'll let them live if they release them, revealing the auction items were already gone when they arrived. Kurapka asks what happened to the auction attendees, and Uvogin answers that they killed them all. 
Kurapika becomes enraged and punches Uvagin in the face. Dalzone calls the Mafia and says that they've captured one of the thieves. He also learns that all the Shadow Beasts have been killed. As Kurapika and Hisuka meet to discuss the troop, several spiders disguise themselves as Mafia members and free Uvogin, with Finks killing Dalzone. Uvogin is enraged and vows to find the chain user, telling his comrades that he won't return until he kills him. After Shalnark and Uvogin work together to track down the chain user, the latter eventually confronts him at the hotel where Neon and her bodyguards are staying. They agree to fight one-on-one -on -one in a remote location. Meanwhile, Gon Kilwa and Leorio attend a conditional auction and plan to capture members of the Phantom Troop to make enough money to purchase a copy of Greed Island. Kurapika eventually captures Uvogin with his chain jail and questions him about the location and abilities of the other troop members. Uvogin refuses to answer any of his questions, only asking Kurapika to kill him. Finally, Kurapika pierces Uvogin's chest with his judgment chain, ordering him to answer all questions truthfully. Kurapika once again asks Uvogin the location of the other troop members, but Uvogin only smiles and tells him to get lost. Kurapika's judgment chain pierces Uvogin's heart and kills him instantly. Uvogin is buried in an unmarked grave at the site of their battle. Back at the troop's hideout, after Phaeton tortures Owl to recover their auction items, Krola tells the troop members that they will change their plans if Uvogin doesn't return by dawn. After Gon pawns his hunter license for 100 million jenny, he heads to the Sudden Peace auction house with Kilo and Leorio to purchase a catalog. The three learn when copies of Greed Island will be auctioned and continue to follow any leads about the troop. After heading to the bull market, Gon and Kilua realize that they can use Gyo to spot rare items. Leorio plans to keep track of the bulletin board while Gon and Kilua continue to look for items to sell for profit. The two win several items and eventually encounter an antiques dealer named Zepile, who helps them take the items to a preview market. After the two learn about multiple doctoring methods, they receive a call from Leorio that two troop members have been spotted. Gon and Kilua leave Zepile in charge of the auction while they meet up with Leorio to tail the spiders. Mafia Massacre, the Phantom Troops Requiem. On September 3rd, Machi and Nobunaga wait in the middle of the square in an attempt to lure out the chain user, but they attract Gon and Kilua's attention instead and are tailed by them. At the Hotel Baitical, Light Nostrad arrives and tells the bodyguards that the underground auction will continue even after the deaths of the Shadow Beasts. He also reveals that the Ten Tons have hired professional assassins to eliminate the Phantom Troop. He then personally asks Kurapika to join the team. With the help of Finks and Pakunada, who have been secretly following them, they easily capture Gon and Kilua and bring them back to their hideout. Nobunaga ends up liking Gon because he reminds him of Uvogin, telling the others that he wants to nominate him to be a troop member when Krola returns. Meanwhile, Shalnark prints a list of Nostrad family employees from the Hunter website and hands the photos to the other spiders, telling them to memorize their faces. He adds that according to Uvogin, the chain user isn't among them, so he suggests that they work in pairs to find someone who knows them. While the other spiders leave the hideout to look for the chain user, Nobunaga watches over Gon and Kilua, but the two end up escaping, utilizing what Zepile taught them, and kicking through the building's walls. Using a picture of her that was just uploaded to the Hunter website, Krola finds and approaches Neon Nostrad who had slipped away from her bodyguard to attend the rescheduled underground auction without her father's knowledge. After helping her get into the cemetery building, he asks her to tell his fortune, which she gladly does. Elsewhere, Kurapika and Light attend the meeting of assassins, with Kurapika defending Light from Zenji. As the two leave the car, they learn from Melanie that Neon ran away from her shopping spree. Light begins to panic and has the police put out an APB, but Kurapika quickly uses his dowsing chain to assure them that she's already inside the cemetery building. Upon reading his fortune, Krolo cries once he sees the illusion of Uvogin's death. After the two talk and make their way to the auction, he knocks Neon unconscious with a swift blow to the back of her neck in order to get the Mafia members to call an ambulance. He then kills several of the hired assassins with ease and orders the other spiders, excluding Nobunaga, to come to the cemetery building and cause chaos. As the spiders slaughtered the police and 2,000 Mafia members outside, Krolo finishes killing Assassin A and dedicated the rec room to Uvogin. As the troops' massacre continues outside, Krolo is cornered in the building's basement by Silva and Zeno Zoldic. Noticing how skilled Zeno is, Krolo fights with the intention of sealing his abilities. However, Zeno sees through him and has him pinned against the wall while Silva throws two huge R sears at him, triggering an enormous explosion. Silva's transmitter suddenly rings and Elamy informs him that the Ten Dons have been eliminated and that Krolo was the one who hired him. Since Silva and Zeno were hired by the Ten Dons, they tell Krolo that he's no longer the target now that the Dons are dead, leaving Krolo alone and exhausted as he tells himself that he wouldn't have been able to steal Zeno's ability. Krolo then contacts the other members and tells them to forget about the ambulance and that they will go ahead as planned. The troop then makes use of Cortope's ability to fool the Mafia with fake corpses of five members, taking over the rescheduled underground auction held on the building's 10th floor and selling the copies of the items made by Cortope's ability. After seeing the troop's corpses for himself, Kurapika heads back to the auction and is forced to bid 2.9 billion jenny to win a pair of scarlet eyes. After a short confrontation with Zenji, he delivers them to Neon at the hospital. After the troop returns to their hideout and celebrates their successful plan, Hisaka tries to call Kurapika with news that the corpses were fake, but he's unable to get through since Kurapika was talking with Gon and Kilua. Fortunes in the Spider. A mafia hacker is unable to identify the troop's corpses and guesses that they are from Meteor City, advising two mafia members to avoid them and that the Ten Dons would agree with his assessment. At the troop's hideout, Krolo tells the members that they will leave York New the night once they retrieve the rest of the loot, but Nobunaga insists on fighting the chain user. Go and Kilua, Kurapika, and Leorio finally all meet up at an extravagant hotel. Kurapika tells the others about his ability and admits that he feels dispirited now that the troop's leader is dead. However, Kilua stresses that some of the members are still alive, emphasizing Pakunota's ability and suggesting that they should stop the troop before they have time to regroup. In order to persuade 
betrayed Nobunaga, Kurolo uses Neon's stolen ability to tell the fortunes of Nobunaga and the other members, and they learn that five more of them will die in the next two weeks if they keep chasing after the chain user, intending to leave York New to avoid the fortunes. As Kurapika tells Kilowa that he plans to focus on retrieving the other eyes of his clan, he suddenly receives a text from Hisuka saying that the corpses were fake. Kurapika then learns that the Mafia has cancelled the bounties of the troop, and Leorio helps to explain the relationship between Meteor City and the Mafia. At the troop's hideout, the members are concerned by Hisuka's fortune, which implies that he may be a traitor. While Kurolo summarizes that Hisuka is being controlled, it's revealed that Hisuka used Texture Surprise to alter his fortune so that the troop would stay in York New and he would have the chance to fight Krolo. Go and Kilowa, Kurapika, and Leorio come up with a plan to capture Pakanoda, and Go and suddenly asks Kurapika if he can use his Den Dagger on him. While Kurapika explains his Emperor Time ability in great detail and how the process would work, he ultimately decides against using his Judgment Chain on any of them because of the nature of Pakanoda's ability. As Kilowa tries to find the troop's hideout after Kortopi uses his ability to make dozens of copies, Krolo is able to deduce that Kurapika is one of Neon's bodyguards and a surviving member of the Kurta clan. Thanks to a pair of the copy Scarlet Eyes that they sold to the No Shred family the night before, they determine that he and the other bodyguards are staying at the Hotel Baitical. Krolo then tells Kortopi, Machi, Nobunaga, Pakanoda, and Shizuku to go with him to the hotel while the others stay behind at the hideout. Kilowa and Melody continue to tail the troop, and Kurapika realizes that the group is heading towards the Hotel Baitical. He then warns Squalor to leave, and the bodyguard takes the Scarlet Eyes with him. On the way, noticing that they're being followed by two people, Krolo tells Kortopi, Nobunaga, and Pakanoda to go ahead while he, Machi, and Shizuku stay behind. They then capture Gon and Kilowa again. Meanwhile, Pakanoda and the other two are able to learn Kurapika's name and face after capturing and killing Swala. The Exchange Krolo, Machi, and Shizuku take the two boys to the hotel and meet up with Pakanoda's group in the lobby. He tells Pakanoda to check their memories again, but before she can reveal what she's learned about Kurapika, a power outage suddenly happens, allowing Gon and Kilowa to make an escape attempt. However, Machi and Nobunaga easily recapture them despite the total darkness. Shizuku is then the first one to notice that Krolo is missing. After the others also realize that Krolo is missing, Pakanoda reads a note left by Kurapika that threatens Krolo's life if she reveals Gon and Kilowa's memories to the others. Nobunaga tells her to stay quiet while they wait for the chain user's call, stressing that they need to keep the two boys as hostages. In a flashback, Pakanoda remembers the formation of the troop in Meteor City where Krolo stressed the importance of the spider as a whole, telling them to never forget that someone else will take over if he dies. Back in the present, Pakanoda considers betraying the spider to save Krolo and wonders what Krolo would do, with Nobunaga calling Finks and telling him to hurry after revealing that Krolo was captured. Sitting chained in the seat next to Kurapika as Leorio drives, Krolo says that he didn't think the chain user would be a woman, but Kurapika quickly removes his wig and warns him that his words could be his last. Krolo then reminds Kurapika that he can't kill him since he left his friends behind. He then points out that the encounter wasn't even mentioned in his fortune, which means that it's entirely insignificant, causing Kurapika to fly into a rage. Finks, Feitan, and Shalnark soon arrive at the hotel. The troop members receive a call from Kurapika, who tells him not to follow him, not to hurt the hostages, and to give the phone to Pakanoda. He then tells Pakanoda to go to Lincoln Airport alone to negotiate the terms of the hostage exchange, and the other members have to return to their hideout. Finks, Feitan, and Shalnark try to follow Pakanoda, but Nobunaga stops them for fear that Krolo will be killed, leading to a heated quarrel between the two groups, with Feitan stressing that Krolo would agree with their decision to follow her, and that Nobunaga's way of thinking is an insult to the spiders. The quarrel is eventually settled after Shizuku knocks Nobunaga unconscious and reminds the others the troop's rules. After learning that Kurapika has a way to see through their lies, the troop members agree to return to the hideout. Meanwhile, after Krolo again provokes Kurapika, the latter punches him in the face multiple times before Leorio and Melody calm him down. As Krolo stresses that he's worthless as a hostage, Melody listens to his heartbeats and says that he enjoys the fact that death is always near him. Kurapika asks if he was the troop's leader five years earlier when they massacred the Kurta clan, but Krolo stays silent as Kurapika readies his judgment chain. Krolo then asks if he used the chain to kill Uvogin, also asking about his final words. He again refuses to answer Kurapika, who feels powerless about having to keep Krolo alive. As Kurapika backs down and calls back Pakanoda, Krolo realizes that Kurapika will prioritize his friends over his mission, hoping that Pakanoda will bring the other members with her to the meeting. At the troop's hideout, after Hisuka enlists the help of Ilami, Franklin, Bonolonov, and Hisuka wait for the others to return. When Kurapika meets Pakanoda aboard an airship, he uses his judgment chain on both her and Krolo, setting two conditions for each of them. He then tells her to return to the airport with the hostages by midnight and to not tell the others where she's going. After Pakanoda agrees and returns to the hideout, she tells the others about the exchange and that she's leaving with just the two boys. Finks becomes so angry that he wants to get rid of them and then go after the chain user, but Manji and Kortobi side with Pakanoda. They prepare to confront Finks and Phaeton, who think that she and the others are being manipulated by the chain user, but Gon interrupts her quarrel and emphasizes that Pakanoda just wants to save their leader. Finks finally agrees to let Pakanoda leave after Franklin tells him that if they all keep fighting, it will be the end of the troop. Just before the exchange, Hisaka unexpectedly appears and threatens to kill Gon and Kilwa if he can't board Pakanoda's airship. Kurapika has no choice but to let him go to the exchange site with them. After the exchange is successful, Kurapika looks down at Krolo and hopes that he realizes what it's like to have all his support system taken away. Standing opposite him, Hisaka happily challenges Krolo to a fight. He then reveals that he's never been a true member of the troop, removing the fake spider tattoo from his back, and points out that it won't be considered infighting now. Krolo laughs and tells Hisaka that he isn't worth fighting since Kurapika stabbed him with his judgment chain and rendered him unable to use Nen. 
Losing interest, Hizuka quickly leaves and tells Bakunoda that he isn't interested in broken toys, assuring her that Krollo isn't in danger from him anymore. At the hideout, Finks demands answers from Bakunoda and wonders to himself why she's holding her gun. Bakunoda tells him that Krollo can't return and Finks angrily asks if she's joking, ordering her to explain and threatening her with violence if they don't like her answer. Bakunoda readies her ability and tells herself that she can fire six shots simultaneously for the founding members. She then asks Phaeton, Finks, Machi, Nobunaga, Shellnark, and Franklin if they will trust her and accept it. As Pakunoda prepares to shoot out her memories, Finks thinks that the chain user is manipulating her, but Nobunaga assures him that it's really Pakunoda. Once Pakunoda fires six shots along with her memories into the heads of the founding members, Kurapika's judgment chain activates around her heart. She prays that she'll be the last as she falls dead to the ground. With the founding members left stunned, all of Pakunoda's memories suddenly flood into their minds. Shizuka checks on Pakunoda and confirms that she's dead, asking the others how it happened. Finks says that he'll explain everything and begins to tell the others why Pakunoda made her decision. Still standing alone at the exchange site, Krollo looks towards the east. Southern Peace Auction Gon and Kilwa go to the Southern Peace Auction for Great Island. Rather than attempt to directly obtain it, Gon and Kilwa plan to let someone else buy it and then enter the game for that client. After a brief run-in with Phaeton and Finks, the auction for Great Island begins. Gon and Kilwa raise their bid as high as they can, but are ultimately outdone by Batara. After the auction, they ask Batara and his assistant, Tezgeta, if they could enter the game for him. Despite their knowledge of the game and Nen, Tezgeta refuses, stating that their display of Nen was not strong enough. He also says that Nen users would be able to enter the game only if they pass a test a few days later. Wishing to prove the two wrong, Gon and Kilwa continue to train. At the same time, Phaeton and Finks obtain a copy of Greed Island by stealing it. Entering the game. Kurapika, Melody, and the rest of Light Nostrad's employees leave York New City. Gon and Kilwa go to the examination room where the applicants would be screened. Kilwa shows off his new electricity Nen ability, whereas Gon shows off his enhancement Nen ability by breaking a wall, frightening Sesgeta, but passing the two. After passing, the two celebrate with Leorio. Leorio departs to take the exam for medical school. Gon and Kilwa then head to Batera's mansion. Gon is the first to enter the game and uses his own game card and ring to do so. He enters the game where he's greeted by Etza. She explains the rules of Greed Island as well as the spells Gain and Book. She also goes over the objective of the game to collect all 100 restricted cards. Before Gon enters the actual playing area, he receives a message from Jean stating that he would find no clues towards Jean, rather Jean just wanted to show off his game. He ends up in an open field and Kilwa follows soon after. They both sense that they're being watched when suddenly a man appears with a book. He uses Trace on Kilua to track him at all times, but Kilua scares him away with his killing intent. Gon and Kilua arrive at Antokiba and decide to participate in the monthly tournament. First, they would eat though. At the restaurant, the chef tells them that if they eat their meals in 30 minutes, they wouldn't have to pay and they would receive the Galgaida card. They complete the challenge, but they find the card useless. All of a sudden, they hear an explosion and rush outside to find Jeet, one of the higher players, dead. Gon asks if the spell cast on Kilua could do that, but a man assures him that it would be impossible. The man introduces himself as Nix, the head of the Alliance, and invites Gon and Kilua to come to their meeting. At the meeting, Gon and Kilua are offered a place in the Alliance, as well as Puat and Abengane, two of the hired players. Gon refuses. As a result, Kilua does too, though the other two join. They walk around the city, unaware that a little girl is stalking them. They make it to the finals of a Rock Paper Scissors tournament. Kilua wins, earning himself the Sword of Truth. Soon after, they're attacked by Motorik, who attempts to steal a card, but Gon takes the card away. From this, they learn that the spell must be enchanted before being used. Kilua decides that they should go to Masadora to buy spell cards. They sell their Galgaida cards for a map. The Antokiba trade shop NPC informs them of the monsters that lie outside the town. Rather than being afraid, the boys are exhilarated by the prospect of a challenge. It's at this point that their stalker asks to join, but they deny her accompaniment. Meanwhile, at the Phantom Troop hideout, Chalnark invites Shizuku and Kortopi to play the game with him, to which they concur. In the game, they find Kortopi's duplication ability doesn't work on spell cards, and Shizuku's vacuum doesn't always suck in objects. He concludes that they're indeed in a real place, and theorizes that one might be able to take a card out without clearing the game. At the same time, Phaeton and Finks kill players for cards. Gon and Killua run through a forest where the girl impressively manages to keep up. They're confronted by ninjas who beg Gon and Killua for their exact amount of Jenny to cure an epidemic. They agree, and when the girl offers to pay, they refuse her money, angering her. They also give their shirt to a sick boy, but they receive nothing in return. As they make their way into a canyon, they're attacked by a cyclops. After trial and error, Killua finds their weakness to be their eyes. They encounter a melanin lizard who has a spot as its weakness, but they don't pick up on this. They encounter several other creatures that they can't bring down because of their lack of experience and Nen capability. While this is happening, the girl watches and comments, proving herself to be knowledgeable, but she's ignored by the two players. When Gon and Kilwa face an armored monster, she instructs them to use Go, and find that the monster is being controlled by a timid radio rat, which faints and transforms into a card immediately. The girl demands that the boys use Go. Gon follows her instructions while Kilwa defies. The girl introduces herself as Biscuit Kruger, a woman with 40 years of Nen experience. She declares that she will be their mentor. Biscuit's Nen Training Kilo and Gon reject Biscuit, explaining that they already have a mentor, Wing. Biscuit then reveals that she was Wing's mentor. She says that they won't survive in the game solitary when she suddenly senses a hostile presence. She has the boys act as they got into a falling out with her, and the two parties go in opposite directions. When they reach the tall pillar, they use Zets and run back. The enemy chases Biscuit, but is easily defeated by her. 
their assailant is Binolt, a blacklist hunter and a wanted criminal. The boys learn that Biscuit's goal in the game is to obtain the Blue Planet, a rare gem exclusive to Greed Island. Gon asks her to train them in Nen. She agrees and begins by having the boys fight Binolt, but with rules. The rules are that Binolt must evade the boys' attacks for two weeks, and then he may leave. Otherwise, if he gets knocked out or can't stand, she would kill him. Killua tries to attack Binolt while the latter recovers, but he swipes his scissors at Killua, nearly blinding the boy. Gohan also finds himself unable to overcome the scissors. Kilua decides to throw many rocks at Binolt to prevent him from dodging, and if he does, Gohan would attack. While this is unsuccessful, Biscuit notes that they indeed have potential. Kilua is going to attack, but Gohan stops him, pointing out that they should rest. They continue to fight until Binolt surrenders on day 10. He is prepared to have Gohan kill him, but Gohan thanks him for the training. Surprised and touched, Binolt leaves to turn himself in. Following this, they continue to Masadora, but Biski has them dig their way there through the rocky area with shovels. At one point, Gon finds the rocks to be too tough for the shovel to be effective. He concocts the idea of letting aura flow to the shovel to enhance his digging, which Biski later identifies as an application of 10, Shu. They finally reach Masadora only for Biski to command them to return to where they started, much to their indignation. She planned on having them train in fighting by re-challenging beasts they were previously unable to overcome. They both do it and succeed. Biski then begins aura training. She uses Ko, the concentration of aura in one spot, on her fist, and as the boys defend with Ken, the amalgamation of Ten and Ren, similar to the unconcentrated Ko. Gon is surprised to find that a slow punch can have much force. He can only hold up Ken for two minutes and Biski informs him that he would have to hold it up for at least half an hour for it to be useful. After much training, the boys achieve this goal as well. The next step is the controlled movement of aura for different circumstances, Ryu. The boys become competent with this skill, so Biski begins sparring. While their sparring begins slowly, after two weeks they become much faster. So Biski begins category-specific training. The first exercise is an enhancement, breaking 1,000 rocks with a single stone in a day. They find that they break the stones that they're supposed to use. Biski then transmutes her aura into a number, which both boys simultaneously identify. They play a game of rock, paper, scissors where the loser would be punished. Gon wins. Biski then narrates the legend of the game. Meanwhile, Nix's alliance has gathered in a cave. The alliance has collected 90 restricted cards. Suddenly, one of the members, Genthru, reveals himself to be the bomber. Jispa tries to attack Genthru from behind, but Genthru uses Little Flower to blow up his face. Genthru then explains his net ability and the soul condition for the release of the bombs, touching him and saying, I caught the bomber. However, he reminds them that he could use Little Flower for melee. He shows the bombs on everyone's body, which count down and explode at zero. He makes them an offer, their lives for the restricted cards. He then leaves the game and enters Batera's mansion where he meets his accomplices Sub and Bara, and is confronted by Puhan. He demands Puhat's ring, Puhat refuses, and Genthru kills him. Twelve hours before the revelation, Shalnark, accompanied by the rest of the Phantom Troop members, excluding Krollo, was on a ship, stating that they found the real-world location of Greed Island. They're confronted by Razor, a maker of the game. He gives them a choice, fight him now or in the game. Finx chooses in the game, so he uses an Eliminate card to send them away, and then emits a dodgeball to blow up the boat. Gon continues practicing, having excelled at craning an enhancement and ability, Rock. However, he struggles with the emission-oriented paper as it's not his affinity. Gon desires to learn Scissors, a transmutation attack, but Biski is unsure that it would work. Gon explains that Biski indirectly helped him create an ability by explaining the history of Rock, Paper, Scissors and that his enjoyment was a factor. Biski is glad since his emotions would make the Nen ability stronger. Kilua shows off his electricity, scaring Biski as she deduces that Kilua must have had a rough childhood. She decides to have the boys take a break from training, and during the break, Gon remembers that the hunter exam would be taking place soon. They go to Masadora to find out how to leave the game, and they're told that they have to use a leave card or bribe or defeat the harbor master. They go to the harbor master, and Kilua easily defeats him and leaves the game to take the 288th hunter exam. He's taken to Dole Harbor by Lena. Gon and Biski run into Amigane while training, and learn of Genthru's status as the bomber and the curse he has inflicted upon the members of Nix's alliance. He asks them to warn everyone they see about Genthru, and to avenge the deaths of its victims. Amigane is under the suspicion that Genthru's deal is just a setup. At the same time, Nyx meets the bomber trio. He gives Genthru the cards and begs for his life. At the same time, elsewhere, Amigane begins an exorcism ritual, getting a worm to eat the bomber off his shoulder. Genthru, Sub, and Bara lock fingers, claiming that it will deactivate the bombs. In actuality, the formation triggers them. The still counting bombs detonate, killing all of the Alliance members except Abingane and Kuzco. Kiloba takes part in the hunter exam, defeating all the other applicants and easily becoming a hunter. He returns to the game where he is updated on the events that have transpired since he left. Kilua tells Gon to use contact to look at the people whom they've met, and they notice Krolo Lucifer. They are utterly confused by this as Krolo is supposed to be incapable of using Nen after his confrontation with Kurapika. The Phantom Troop themselves also notice this, laughing at it for being a fake. Out of the shadows comes Hisuka, who reveals that he's the one using Krolo's name as an alias. When Kilua informs Kurapika of what happened, Kurapika confirms that Krolo has not yet rid himself of the chain on his heart. Gon is contacted by Kazuul, who previously stole Gon's cards in an offer for an exchange. They do a trade and then go to Dorias, where Kilua uses a risky dice to make big winnings. Meanwhile, Sazgera's team barters with Genthru's team. Unbeknownst to them, Genthru has disguised two random players as Sub and Bara, and when the trade takes place, the real Sub and Bara ambush Sazgera's team and steal all their cards. Seeing the level threat Genthru poses, Sazgera begins to formulate a counter plan. Gon and the others go back to the sick villagers. Gon uses his paladin necklace to transform them to healthy villagers' cards, earning him the Wild Luck Alexandrite. 
They're once again contacted by Kazuo, who wants to meet them in person. At the meeting attended by several other teams, they talk about the bombers and trade information regarding the cards Genthru lacks. After some tension between Kilowa and Asta, they decide to form an alliance. They go to Sofrabi to find a plot of Beach Card, where a lady NPC informs them that pirates have taken over and will kill anyone who leaks information regarding the plot of Beach. The United teams decide to confront the pirates. Sofrabi Pirates the teams locate the pirate's base at a tavern. One of the pirates, Bopopo, offers to take them to his boss if they manage to force him out of a circle, which is surrounded by fire. Zeho attempts to do it, but Bopopo effortlessly overpowers him. Kilowa takes over, using some alcohol and electricity to ignite Bopopo's hat, burning his head. Bopopo leaves the ring to extinguish the fire, earning them both the right to see the boss, and to Kilowa, Bopopo's hatred. At the pirate's lighthouse base, they meet the boss named Razor, who challenges them to several sports matches where the first team to reach 8 points wins. Razor promises to leave Sofrabi if his team loses. The first match is boxing, where it's a pirate boxer versus Montru. Montru is easily defeated by his opponent's Nen ability, which allows him to teleport his punch. The next match is juggling soccer balls. Bisky versus the pirate footballer. Bisky loses, so the third match is Kilowa versus Popobo and Sumo. Kilowa forfeits, giving Razor's team the third point. This string of losses continues, and Gota Inu loses the basketball match, giving Razor eight points and sealing Goen's loss. The other players leave, believing their objective to be accomplished. Goen, Bisky, Kilowa, and Gota Inu go in search of stronger players. They decide to go look for Krolo. They teleport to his location to find that it's Hisuka, who is currently bathing. While Bisky is infatuated over Hisuka, Gon and Kilwa ask him his intention. He lies, stating that it's to find Krolo. In actuality, it's to find an exorcist. He asks what Gon's intention is, and Gon says there is none. Hisuka recommends going to the city of Ai, Ai to find more partners. As they travel to Ai, Ai Bisky alerts Kilwa that Hisuka is indeed lying. Kilowa becomes more suspicious of Hisuka's testimony. They reach Ai, Ai where they meet strange characters. Hisuka remarks that Ai, Ai won't bore him. Kilowa picks up on the nuance and realizes that Hisuka is looking for an exorcist and that he's already met the other members of the troop. They leave Ai, Ai and go and decide to recruit Sezgera. Kilowa uses Hisuka's binder to test whether Hisuka has the troop members' names or not. Gon uses it to call Sesgera, but none of the troop members' names are there. Gon manages to schedule a rendezvous with Sesgera. It's revealed that Hisuka used texture surprise to mask the names of the troop members. With Sesgera's team, Goreino and Hisuka, as well as some random players, Gon decides to re-challenge Razor. After a week of training, they go back to the lighthouse and easily defeat Razor's team in the sporting matches. Razor requests his team to stand down. Bopobo decides to hold a mutiny in order to settle his vendetta against Kilowa. In response, Razor uses an end ball to blow up his head. After four matches, Razor suddenly changes the rules and decides that there will be a dodgeball game involving all players that's worth eight points, with eight players on each side. The random players would go and decide to retreat after seeing Razor's deadly force, leaving Gon with only six players. Razor refuses to have anything other than eight players angering Gon as Razor has so callously killed his own teammate. When Gon asks Razor his reason for killing Bopobo, Razor reveals that Bopobo was a death row convict for rape, murder, and torture murder. In fact, all the pirates are death row convicts, and Razor reserves the right to carry out their sentence if they disobey him. Razor also reveals that Greed Island is the location of the real world. Gon asks if Jean is in Greed Island, but Razor only says that Jean ordered him not to hold back. Gorino creates two gorillas in order to compensate for the missing two players. After explaining the rules, the match begins. Razor initially gains the upper hand, managing to destroy an ape and incapacitate Sesgera. Hisuka uses bungee gum to attack the opponents, alerting Kilowa to its potential advantages in the game. Hisuka and Kilowa decide to take out the devils, leaving only Razor in the match. Before Hisuka's attack lands, two devils combine to withstand it, managing to regain possession of it. They pass it to Razor, who throws it at Gon. Gon uses Ko to block it, sending him flying but otherwise unharmed. Gon is now out. Goreino throws the ball at Razor to avenge his demolished ape. Goreino hits Razor, but Razor's devil catches the ball before it hits the ground and throws it back at Goreino, knocking him out. Razor throws the ball at Kilowa, but at the last minute, it has a change in trajectory and makes for Bisky and Hisuka. It hits Bisky's dress, which is counted as part of her body. As a result, she's now out. Hiska, having managed to gain possession of the ball, has sustained damage to his hands. Gon uses back to return to the game, aiming to beat Razor at his own game. He has Kilowa hold the ball while he hits it with his enhancement and ability, Junken. The force generated is enough to send one of Razor's devils out. He tries it again, this time using more concentration, and aims it at Razor. Razor deflects the ball to the ceiling, and while waiting for it to come down, Hiska uses bungee gum to move it away, so that Razor is out. Razor uses back to return. Zezgeta requests Gon to not have Kilowa hold the ball as Kilowa's hands are severely injured from Junken. Kilowa is adamant on staying in because he's Gon's friend, and likewise, Gon believes that he feels most confident when Kilo is there. Bisky takes out the last devil in the game, leaving only Razor. Razor recalls all the devils since they're out in order to maximize his power. He throws the ball, but Gon, Kilowa, and Hisuka make a formation that allows them to regain possession without any outs. Gon uses an even stronger Junkin than before to hit Razor, impressing the man. He does what he did before, except it returns it to Gon this time. Gon falls unconscious, but Hisuka uses bungee gum to catch the ball and send it back to Razor. The bungee gum causes the ball to stick to Razor while pushing him out of bounds. As Razor's now out, Gon's team is victorious. After the game, Gon and Razor have a discussion, with Razor revealing his past with Jin. He admits that he doesn't know where Jean is. After defeating Razor, they leave and return to the woman who informed them of the pirate's invasion. She presents them with a plot of beach card. Hiska then leaves the group. The Bombers They're then called by Genthru, demanding that they give him the plot of beach. He had murdered the players that were formerly on Gon's team. Gon challenges Genthru to a fight, one to which Genthru accepts, once he's finished with Sesgera. 
The bombers decide to go after Sesgera, believing him to have the plot a beach. Sesgera agrees to buy time while Gon concocts a plan to fight Genthru. He rebukes Gon for impulsively provoking Genthru, noting that Kilua would have been endangered if Genthru accepted the challenge then and there. After leaving, Gon and Kilua heal and train with Biski. Hisuka and the troop monitor Abengane, interested in his exorcism. Hisuka meets the member of the troop that serves as his replacement, Kalato Zoldik. Sesgera participates in various confrontations with Genthru, using a hit-and-run strategy to keep him occupied. In turn, Genthru becomes much more belligerent against other players, forcing them to collect cards for him or even murder them. Gorinu remotely monitors Genthru's actions, informing him that the sub and Baro with Genthru are fakes. After Sesgera's team uses his last accompany card, they return to Batera's mansion. There, they find no one except Sabzushi, who tells them that everyone Batera employed had left. Sesgera finds Batera, who's visibly shaken and demands an explanation. Batera divulges the story of his lover, who was in severe condition following a grave incident. The only thing that could heal her was the Angel's Breath card. However, now she's dead. Gon trains in a mission to prepare new Nen ability, while Kilua comes up with a plan to defeat Genthru. Goreino informs Gon's team that Sesgera has left the game for good, meaning that the bombers will turn their attention towards them. The group gets ready, set on following Kilua's plan. The bombers arrive, demanding cards. Gon's group feigns unpreparedness and refuses all of Genthru's demands. Genthru becomes impatient and Gon's group flees with the company. It becomes a cat and mouse game until they reach Masadora, after having used up all their company cards. As per plan, they lure Genthru's group to the forest where Biski and Kilua leave Gon in order to split up the bombers. Biski takes Bara to the beach where they duel. Biski at first seems to be disadvantaged due to her smaller build, however she reveals her true form, a large and muscular woman, and knocks out Bara with a single punch. Kilua takes Sub to a field where he uses his heavy yo-yos and electricity to restrain and defeat him. Gon and Genthru get into a fight, with Genthru gaining the upper hand. Genthru refuses to use his Nen ability, which upsets the rival Gon. Gon decides to act independently and make Genthru's Nen ability backfire on him despite the risk involved. Seeing how Gon would never back down, Genthru decides to overwhelm him mentally by using his Nen ability. Genthru attempts to use the little flower on Gon's hand, but Gon defends adequately. Genthru tries the same move again, only this time striking Gon's unprotected stomach. The sequence repeats, with Gon being able to defend because of Biski's lesson on Little Flower and the fact that Genthru would not use Go if planning to attack elsewhere. Seeing how Gon is aware of this, Genthru uses Little Flower with both hands. Despite Biski's warning to stick to the plan here, Gon continues, and Genthru grabs both of his hands, expecting Gon to defend one while leaving the other to be destroyed. However, Gon sacrifices one hand and somewhat protects the other, using the remaining aura on his leg to kick Genthru's unprotected chin. Gon prepares to launch a Jonken on the stunned Genthru, but Genthru trips on rock, saving him from the attack. Gon uses Book and threatens Genthru to give all his cards lest Genthru dies. Genthru uses the opportunity to lure Gon close to him and crushes his throat. Gon uses a card that transforms into gasoline to soak Genthru with it, rendering Little Flower dangerous to Genthru. Genthru prepares to use Countdown on Gon, but Gon uses Jonken, hitting the ground instead. This reveals a pit into which Genthru falls. Gon summons a big rock to fall on Genthru. Genthru avoids, but becomes a sitting duck for Gon's Jonken, which successfully hits, knocking Genthru out. The bombers are restrained and surrender their cards to Gon. Biski uses Angel's Breath to heal Gon and then heals Bara and Genthru with others. Goreino arrives and disapproves of healing Genthru, but Gon's team justifies themselves. Goreino gives them all his cards. Gon's team has now successfully obtained 99 cards, but one is remaining, number zero. A quiz is held to determine who gets it, and the questions are about details pertaining to the cards. Gon ends up getting the most correct, giving him the final card. Two players try to steal Gon's card, but they are easily defeated. Kilua uses Drift to go to Lamero, the city where the castle is, and then uses a company to bring Gon and Biski along. The hunt continues. As this is going on, Abigane touches Genthru to release himself with the countdown bomb. He's later seen being escorted to Krolo by Hisuka, excited the fortune he will earn. Gon enters the castle where he meets two game makers, List and Dune. They introduce themselves, talking about the game and the nature of its name, as well as a little about Jin. Dune gives Gon a three-slot holder, which allows him to take three restricted cards to reality. A parade takes place to celebrate the first completion of Greed Island. Gon, Kilo, and Biski talk about which cards to take to reality. Biski has her eye on Blue Planet, and Gon and Kilo think about the other two cards. In the end, Gon takes Blue Planet, Paladin's Necklace, and Plot of Beach. With that, the three leave the game. Biski uses Gain on Blue Planet, materializing it. Gon uses Gain on Paladin's Necklace to materialize it, and then uses it to transform Plot of Beach into a company, having transformed any company into Plot of Beach beforehand. Gon reveals that when he entered the game, there was one name in his book, Neeg. He realizes that Neeg was likely Jin, because Neeg is Jin with rearranged letters, and explained it to be because Jin took him to Greed Island when he was an infant. Gon and Kilwa say farewell to Biski, and Gon uses a company to take Kilwa and himself to Neeg. They end up in a misty forest, where they see a figure who they believe to be Jin. Reunion with Kite after Gon and Kilwa use an accompany card to meet with Jin or Neeg, so they are transported to the Kakin Empire, a country in the ASEAN continent. Upon approaching Neeg, they are attacked by the latter, but it turns out that they were actually saved from being attacked by Chimera Ants. The Neeg they were sent to is revealed to be Kite, Gon's savior when he was attacked by a fox bear back on Whale Island. Kite is surprised to meet Gon there. He tells him that they've been on Greed Island for Jin's request, and that Gon's use of a company instead of magnetic force caused him to meet Kite and not Jin who wanted to make sure Gon and him would be alone if they were to meet. They enjoy eating dinner while Kai tells stories about his life with Jin. Both Gon and Kilwa are left in awe by the revelation that Jin is a double-star hunter who can also qualify to become a triple-star hunter. Kite also tells Gon that he was finally able to find Jin. 
He explains his mission to do a biological survey and to return to his group. The group then discusses a chimera ant leg found on the Balsa Islands. The group surveys the shore to find the ant queen, but to no avail. Kilo asserts that the ant must be over two meters long, enough to easily eat a human. Returning to York New City, they inspect the map and theorize that the queen may be located in NGL, the Leo Nudite nation. On the journey there, Kite explains that Chimera Ants' unique way of reproduction, phagogenesis, and ponders on horror the consequences of a Chimera Ant infestation in NGL. Only five of them managed to actually enter the country due to the harsh anti-technological policies. Goen, Kite, Kilowa, Stick, and Padungo, a greater threat. Meanwhile, on the Yorbian continent in the south of the Balsa Islands, an injured Chimera Ant Queen was left ashore, and was trying to heal so that she could give birth to the king. The queen feeds herself more and gives birth to some soldier ants. She orders the soldier ants to bring food. The crab-like soldier ant hunts two children, and the queen eats them. Finding the human species to be highly delicious and nutritious, she orders her soldiers to hunt more of them, as well as giving birth to the first humanoid ant, Colt. After hunting more humans, the Chimera Ants move to a rock formation more inland, and Chimera Ant populations grow faster than ever. This infestation catches the attention of Puckle, a hunter of fantastic beasts. With Ponzu, Balda, and Pekuba, the group enter NGL to investigate the Chimera Ants. The group is attacked by the ants on their journey, so they retreat to inform the Hunter Association. However, before they can do that, they're ambushed by Zazan's squad. Zazan takes Bakal alive, but Honzu manages to escape, only to be killed by one of Zazan's officers. Before this happened, she manages to use her bees to send a message to the nearest hunter, which happened to be Kite, about the Chimera Ant infestation. Entering NGL, Kite, reading Ponzu's message, realizes that the end infestation was more severe than expected, ordering Padongo and Stick to return and notify the Hunter Association. He allows Gon and Kilua to accompany him, though. They enter a village and are confronted by Ramut. Kite orders Gon and Kilua to fight him, to ensure that they were strong enough to handle other ants. They use Nen, but the ant still overwhelms them. After many clashes, Gon and Kilua use their Nen abilities to defeat Ramut. Since Ramut was severely damaged, Colt comes, having watched from the shadows, to retrieve him. Heading forward, the trio reach a factory where they're attacked by Yunjun's squadron. Kite, realizing the evil intent, tells Gon and Kilua to kill them. Gon fights the centipede and defeats them using Junken, scissors, with Kite giving the fatal blow. Kilo fights Mosquito and kills her, and Kite kills Yunju. Heading deeper into the Ant territory, the group is ambushed by Hagya squad. The squad demands one-on-one -on -one fights, to which Gon, Kilo, and Kite agree to. Gon and Kilo easily defeat their opponents. Frog is angered over the easy deaths of his comrades, but Kite uses silent waltz to kill all the ants. Meanwhile in the nest, Ramut recovers from his injuries and learns to harness Nen. Peggy wishes to interrogate Pockle, who was able to use such abilities. Pockle, having survived, hides in the heap of skulls. However, the newly born royal guard, Neferpito, appears and detects Pockle. Pito interrogates Pockle and learns about Nen types, creating Nen abilities to correspond with those types and how to find Nen type. Pockle is later turned to a human meatball for the queen, whose appetite was growing to 250 meatballs per day as she prepared for the king's birth. Pito leaves the nest and attacks Gon, Kite, and Kilua, managing to cut off Kite's arm. Gon is enraged, but Kilua quickly knocks him out. Kite orders Kilua to take Gon and flee, 30 days without Nen. Kilua returns to the border where he informs the group of Kite's fate. Just then, three pro hunters, Isaac, Netoro, Moral, and Nav appear, deciding to take care of the ants themselves. Netoro orders Kilua to leave since he was too weak to deal with the ants. Kilua is depressed after failing to help Kite. However, Gon, who woke up, asserts that Kite was alive and that they would get him back. In order to do so, Netoro gave Kilua two Wawashu pieces. Their objective was to gain the other two from two assassins who were apprentices of Moral. They meet Palm, Nav's apprentice, who would help train them for one month until the battle against the two, where only one group would be able to go to NGL. Twelfth and train, Bisky returns. Her exercise involves using Ren for three hours. After the training, she would have them battle Knuckle, one of the assassins. Palm is skeptical of Gon and Kilua's chances against him, but Gon promises to her that he will be victorious. The day where Gon seriously fights Knuckle, his penultimate battle comes. Knuckle shows his prowess and easily overpowers Gon. Back at Palm's place, while Gon rests, Kilua trains with Bisky. She chides Kilua for always attempting to flee and warns him that one day he would run and leave Gon to die. So if he lost against Shoot, he would have to leave Gon. The day when the duo fights against the assassins finally comes. Kilua and Shoot leave to the nearby forest. Knuckle begins the battle by a head-on attack, but Gon is able to handle it. He wonders why he was able to, only to find a strange creature called Podclean on his arm with a number on his forehead. It adds interest, which Knuckle explains to be 10% per 10 seconds. Knuckle goes on to explain about AOP, actual aura power, and MOP, maximum aura power, and how Gon's aura techniques consume aura at a greater rate than usual. One aura per second, only to confuse the boy. Ultimately, when Gon expanded aura, he decreased his AOP, but the interest increased. To add to it, Knuckle explained that in about four and a half minutes, his aura would be bankrupt, and a Tora Tatan would be attached to him for a month, and he wouldn't be able to use aura for those days. As for Kilua and Shoot, Shoot begins with Hotel Rafflesia, where three floating hands would attack Kilua. Kilua uses his yo-yos to deflect them, but Shoot attacks him at melee range. Kilua begins to harbor thoughts of fleeing, as his brother instructed him to should he face an opponent stronger than himself. Kilua notices that the spot where Shoot punched him was gone, the left side of his face. Shoot uses the created blind spot as an advantage and overwhelms Kilua. Kilua realizes that he wasn't actually fighting and attacks Shoot head on. At the border of NGL, the two duos arrive. Knuckle and Shoot were victorious. Knuckle promises Gon that they would save Kite. 
Gon weeps over being too weak, as does Kilua. The latter swears to protect Gon for the 30 days he could not use Nen. However, after that, he would leave Gon's side. Meanwhile, in NGL, Netoro's group attacks nearby ants. Moral uses his smoke to confuse the ants, and then Nob uses hide and seek to send him into his dimension. There, Netoro slaughters them. Neferpito is shown to have killed Kite, but keeps his body because he was fun. During the mission, Nob bets that both teams would make it. Moral bets that his disciples would win. The two other royal guards, Shiapuf and Menthuthuyupi, are born. At the same time, Gon and Kilua were fighting Knuckle and Shoot, the queen begins to give birth to the king prematurely. However, the king violently rips himself out of her. As the squadron leaders come, the king shows absolutely no regard for her or them, even killing Peggy and Turtle and cannibalizing them. The royal guards meet with their new leader and leave the nest, Pito refusing to save the queen. As the king searches for humans to eat, Colt approaches Nob and Moral for assistance. Most of the squadron leaders leave the nest as per their instincts. Netero assembles the surgeon squad to attempt to heal the queen in the nest. The dying queen tells the group present to tell the king that his name was Meruem, the light that illuminates on all, and dies. Colt finds the unborn twin. Moral assures Colt that he and the twin could live as long as they didn't hurt other humans. As this was going on, Meruem found a castle he liked in the Republic of East Corteau. During the 30 days that Gon cannot use Nen, he and Kilua train and Gon goes on a date with Pom. During the date, Kilua secretly stalks them and fights Ramut, who happened to be nearby. Despite being unable to fight due to fear, Kilua rips open his own forehead and pulls out a needle that was implanted by Ilami to make him fear an opponent and flee. He manages to kill Ramut. Knuckle and Moral, having returned from NGL, fight Chito, and Knuckle uses Hakawari on the ant, but Chito manages to flee. The NGL group and Gon and Kilua unite at a castle, where it's revealed that they managed to recover Kite. However, Kite was in a wrecked state where he was being controlled by the enemy's Nen. He didn't recognize Gon and pummeled him. Gon, being unable to stand Kite's state, swears to return him back to normal the ants and spiders. Meruem and the royal guards storm the royal palace of East Corton and kill the leader Ming Jol Ik and most of the humans inside. They plan for a selection day where the citizens would come to the palace under the belief that it was a celebration only to be forced to awake their Nen via initiation. 99% of the citizens would die. Gon, Kilua, Knuckle, Shoot, Moral, and Nob head there, planning to work with Netero to take down the ants. Gon gets his Nen back and proceeds to show Moral the tremendous amount of power he has when angered. The six members would be divided into three teams of two on the day of the palace invasion, which was in 10 days since that was when the selection was going to happen. Gon and Kilua were assigned Pito, Knuckle and Shoot, Yupi, and Nov and Moro, Poof, and Netero would battle Meruem. Meanwhile, the Phantom Troop returns to their hometown, Beanor City. Feitan, Shalnark, Shizuku, Bonalonov, Finks, and Kalito are going to take out Zazan and her squad. The squadron had reached Meteor City and was turning the citizens into ants with Zazan's queen shot. Whoever managed to kill Zazan would become the de facto leader. It turns out to be Feitan. Gon and Kilwa sneak through the East Gorto border. They enter a small village only to find it empty. Seeing blood and shallow graves, Kilwa deduces that the selection had already begun and were using the pretense of the celebration to make the mass disappearance of people unsurprising. Kilwa also explains that to select as many as 5 million people and not have so many Nen capable ants means that they can't control them. Kilwa plans to attack the ones being controlled but Gon remains in hiding. As Kilua attempts to prevent the citizens from going to their impending doom, many don't believe him and he garners attention. He's attacked by Chimera and swarming the forest and Leol's squad. While claiming victory against Ikalgo, he decides not to kill him because of the admiration for the latter's resolve to never betray his comrades. He's then caught in a dark game with the Ortho siblings where he's the dartboard. He nearly dies but Ikalgo, having a change of heart, saves him. Meanwhile, Gon continues to wander in the East Gorto's countryside. A squadron leader takes an interest in him, so he sends his officers and soldiers after him, only for them to be defeated. He reveals himself to Gon and joins the boy to get revenge on the king for killing his former self's adopted father, Peggy. Gon agrees, much to Meliar on surprise. Meanwhile, Meruem plays board games with the champions from the Republic of East Gorto to kill time until his selection. Being the genius he is, he masters them in minutes and defeats the champions and kills them. However, the final champion is the Gungi champion, a seemingly dim-witted blind girl named Komugi. Despite her seemingly low intellect, she manages to defeat him in every game, earning his respect. During one of these games, Meruem attempts to throw her off by making her bet on something. He bets on his arm that he would win. She bets on her life. Shocked and intrigued to know why, Meruma asks her about her decision, and Komugi explains her family background and how her only skill was Gungi. In response, Meruma rips off his arm. Pito stops using its end to repair Meruma, and Poof activates his. During this time, Nob infiltrates the palace to set doors with his Nen ability. However, after seeing Poof's heinous aura in a Zetsu state, he retreats after being frightened. He ends up having a mental breakdown due to the aura being so terrible, taking him out of commission. While fighting Pito's puppets, Moral once again comes across Chitu. This time, the latter tags him and uses his Nen ability to put him in a world where he must catch Chitu before a set timer runs out. Moral outwits Chitu by acting distracted only to put a smoke rope around him and tags him. Since Chitu's restriction was that he would lose the technique should he be caught, Leol attacks Moral. He fights him in an abandoned church using Inamura, a technique they end stole from Moral's friend Grachan, to drown Moral. However, Moral uses pockets of air within the church to exhale oxygen and release carbon dioxide which poisoned and killed Leol. Kiel was discharged from the hospital and Gon tries to contact Palm, who had infiltrated the palace acting as a prostitute. He doesn't succeed. Gon, Kilua, Knuckles, Shoot, and Meliora and begin to strategize for the infiltration. Their plan is to make it seem as though a rebel would be merged with the crowd. When the royal guards focus on the crowd on the selection day, the group would intrude the palace and eliminate the king. However, Kilua has doubts. At the palace, Marum goes back on his word to play in rapid succession and orders Komugi to rest. Seeing how this was the first time he did such a thing, Poof and Yupi begin to view the girls 
threat. During the later matches, Komagi awakens her Nen, which allows her to see infinite better possibilities in the game. She requests to leave so that she can remember these moves, and Merum allows her to. When she asks for his name, he realizes that he doesn't know. He consults the royal guards on the matter. They are unable to give him an answer, of which he approves. As he speaks, Poof, to his disgust, notices the king was becoming more regretful and saw the value of creatures he deemed inferior. However, he concludes that violence is the most powerful power in the world. Pondering on his little speech, Merum asserts that she was no longer useful since the selection was near and she would die in the conditions. He intends on killing her and is about to do so until he sees a crow attacking her. He quickly kills the crow and begins to show signs of caring for her by not killing her and asking why she didn't call for help, something that even he himself notices. Debriefing on the facts, Kilua reveals that the end that Nov came into contact with was that of Poof's, not Pito's. Since it had a window in which Nov can infiltrate without being noticed, Kilua theorizes that Pito's healing ability had to be solely concentrated on, which leads him to believe that one of the royal guards or king was injured. Ikalgo asserts that Pito would only do such a thing if the king was injured. Since no one that they knew could do it, Kilua concludes that the king injured himself. The citizens of East Corto begin their march to the palace. Moral strategizes with Knuckle, Shoot, and Melioron in Nov's dimension. Nov arrives and announces that he would inform the group of any changes prior to the operation. As he does so, he notices that Poof is releasing scales, which had a hypnotic effect on the citizens. Go and Kilua and Ikalgo arrive in Nov's dimension so that all of the combatants were ready. Kilua is still unsure about the third party, believing that it could ruin all their plans. Palace Invasion Meanwhile, above the palace and past the clouds, two men, Xenozoldic and Netero, jump off a dragon and begin to free fall towards the palace. Zeno uses the dragon head to attract the attention of Pito, who responds by using N. Once the dragon enters the N radius, Pito releases its N, using its Nen for an upcoming battle. However, Zeno splits the dragon into smaller dragons, Dragon Dive. Pito leaps through the dragons trying to find Netero while Poof searches for the king to protect him. However, Netero was prepared for this. He uses his Nen ability to send Pito flying away from the palace. Pito uses Dr. Blight to prevent itself from leaving the 20 meter radius as per its restrictions and therefore managed to stay near the palace. As the dragons rain down, the invasion squad infiltrates the palace via the doors that Nov set by the staircase. Everyone but Ikalgo enter towards the stairs. Ikalgo goes to find Palm. There, they unexpectedly encounter Yubi sitting on the stairs. Yubi immediately goes into attack mode. As this is happening, the dragons break through the roof. When the group realizes that if Knuckle and Melioran, who are both invisible and undetectable, were killed by the dragons, they could stay invisible forever. Knuckle reassures them by punching Yubi. Gon and Killua rush past him on the stairs, while Moral uses his smoke to hide and escape from him. While Yubi is locked in a direct battle with Shoot, and with Knuckle and Melioran on the side, Knuckle saves Shoot by punching Yubi again, this time activating Hakaware. Shoot begs Knuckle to beat Yubi up for ignoring him. With Shoot nearly dead, Knuckle is forced to fend for himself. At the same time, Netro and Zeno hit the ground in front of the palace and enter where they believe Meruem is. Inside, they find a shocking sight. Komugi is gravely wounded by the dragon dive. Seeing Meruem's regard for another creature's life shocks them, to the point where Meruem manages to get dangerously close to them without them even realizing it. Meruem orders Pito to save Komugi and asks Netro to go somewhere else with him to prevent more innocent deaths, should he wish to fight. Zeno, demoralized by hurting an innocent girl, quits the job, but makes an end dragon to fly Netero and Meruem to another location. On the way out, Netero sees Goni Kilua, who had come to find Pito, and points to the direction where Pito was healing Komugi. On the way in, Zeno tells Kilua to judge what's happening inside for himself. They enter to see Pito healing Komugi. Gon is enraged at the fact that Pito is healing this girl but so heartlessly murdered Kite. Pito, being unable to fight back, begs Gon to allow it to heal Komugi before doing what he wanted, going as far as to break its own arm. Kilua reminds Gon that only Pito can heal Kite, so Gon reluctantly gives Pito one hour to heal Komugi's critical wounds. Moral heads to the throne room itself where he encounters Shai Poof. Taking advantage of Poof's loss of composure, Moral traps Poof with Smoky Jail. Seeing that he couldn't escape easily, Poof turns himself into a chrysalis and uses his Beelzebub ability to split himself into billions of tiny Poofs that can slip through the smoke to create a clone of himself outside the smoke, but leaving his real self inside the chrysalis. Moral attacks the chrysalis, finding that it was empty, and releases Smoky Jail, which ends up releasing the real Poof. Moral tries to attack Poof with Deep Purple, but Poof counters by using Beelzebub above once again to split himself up. Trying to catch the clones, Moral is struck by Poof who ambushed him with his real body from behind. Poof takes Moral's pipe to strip him of his Nen abilities and throws it into a river. He then heads to the palace where Pito is in an attempt to kill Gon from behind. Pito, worried that Gon would get angered and kill Komugi, orders Poof not to do it. Poof leaves the situation to Pito, but when Gon demands that Poof stay, Poof uses Beelzebub to send his tiny form out while a clone remained there to keep Gon satisfied. Kilua also leaves. While this was all happening, Ikalga was in the basement of the palace searching for Palm while he uses Flutter's body in a truck. He uses Flutter's dragonflies to scout the area, one of them encountering Bluster. After investigating a little, he finds a message from Palm written in Nen, stating that she should be presumed dead should she not return before the mission. While leaving, he encounters Bluster face to face, who tricks Ikalgo into revealing that he's not the real Flutter. Ikalgo manages to hide under the truck while Bluster left, convinced that he had killed the imposter. However, when he enters the elevator, he's trapped in it since he needed a passcode to ascend. He shoots the door but is trapped once again, this time by Ikago closing the shutters from the control room. Bluster just shoots the way out again but Ikago comes up with a plan to use a tank to shoot sleeping gas and kill Bluster. He succeeds in sedating him but fails to kill him. 
Welfin then confronts Ikago, using his Missile Man Nen ability to interrogate him. However, Ikago turns the tables on him by shooting him despite the excruciating pain caused from Missile Man. He questions Welfin on his past life as a human. Welfin admits that he remembered being named Zykahal, a friend of Gyro's, and being killed by Yunju's division. He reveals that he wishes to find Gyro. Ikago asks him about Palm, and Welfin explains that she was put in a cocoon upstairs after being found by the Royal Guards. Knuckle continues his battle with Yubi, with Yubi holding the advantage by far. While fighting, Yubi gets frustrated due to not knowing where the king or the other Royal Guards are, and accidentally unleashes Rage Blast, where his feelings of stress were released. Knuckle uses the opportunity to search for Shoot. Finding a puddle of blood, he believes that it was Yupi's doing, and confronts him again. In reality, Nav had helped Shoot retreat. Yupi fakes going into the Rage Blast ability form to lure Knuckle closer to him. Knuckle does so, and Yupi reverts to his main form and is about to kill him when he's suddenly hit by a lightning bolt. Confused by the sudden attack which he didn't detect before, Yupi is paralyzed which gives Knuckle the opportunity to attack Yupi, avenging Shoot. Knuckle flees and Kilua begins his attack on Yupi with Godspeed, a Nen ability he had developed after his battle with the Ortho siblings. During this, Yupi is unable to attack Kilua back due to his paralysis combined with Kilua's sheer speed. However, Kilua eventually runs out of electricity and is forced to flee. Yupi pursues him, but Kilua escapes with Meliorion's ability, enlighten Yupi about the opponent's possible ability of invisibility or teleportation. With Kilua out of commission, Yupi finds Moral, who now doesn't have his pipe. Knuckle rushes in to protect his mentor, and Moral uses the last of his smoke to create Knuckle clones. With this, Knuckle is able to land blows on Yupi. Yupi is enraged by this, uses Rage Blast again, but this time begins to understand it better. He uses Rage Incarnate, which allows him to turn into a centaur, to take out Moral's clones and injure Moral. Yupi praises Moral and Knuckle for being such amazing warriors, though he must eliminate them for that reason too. He strikes Moral, but Moral disappears. Seeing Moral's blood drip, Yupi realizes that the ability being used was invisibility. He prepares to attack Moral and the pinpointed location, but Knuckle stops him, begging him to fight him alone. Yupi denies the offer as it was, but then agrees to do it under the condition that Knuckle releases his Nen ability. Giving into his emotions, Knuckle does so, much to Moral and Meliorin's disapproval. Surprisingly, Yupi keeps his word and leaves with Poof to go find the king. Palm leaves her cocoon, sporting a somewhat different appearance due to being an experimental soldier. Having no emotions, she encounters Kilua and asks about Gohan's whereabouts and proceeds to attack him with killing intent. However, Kilua doesn't reciprocate this intention and begins to break down while revealing the reason he hid Gohan's location from Palm. This sparks the emotions in Palm and she kills the chibi Poof who had been controlling her alerting Poof that soldiers should not retain their human memories. Palm and Kilua reunite with Ikago. He asks Kilua whether they would help go and fight Pito, but Kilua agrees, but notes that they wouldn't be sufficient. They regroup with Meliorion and Knuckle, and Knuckle is insistent on helping Gon. The group returns to the palace. Meanwhile, Meru and Minetoro land at a spot that will be their battleground, a weapons testing ground. Meru tries to avoid fighting by reasoning with Netoro, he reveals his plans to create a world where inequality is so non-existent that the world itself is forgotten. A select few humans would be spared. However, Netero demands a fight. He uses the king's name, which the king is not aware of, to entice him to fight. Meromo agrees to the conditions, and Netero uses 100-type Guan Yin Bodhisattva to make a hole to the underground area where the fight begins. Merum takes a simple strategy of experimenting with arbitrary offensives to determine Netero's attack pattern since Netero's attacks virtually did nothing to him. As the battle rages on, Netero is forced to use stronger moves against him, but ultimately they're proven to be futile since Meruem manages to dismember his right leg and left arm. Netero uses his strongest attack, Zero Hand. While doing more damage than his previous attacks, the attack was barely effective and Meruem is still far stronger than Netero. With all of his aura drained and barely standing, Netero is seemingly defeated. Meruem tries once again to reason with him, stating that Netero's passion had moved him such that when he rules the world, he will now allow humans to survive within a special zone. Netero refuses to accept this and activates his last resort, a poor man's rose, right after revealing the king's name, Meruem. The bomb detonates, incinerating the surrounding region, including Meruem. Poof and Yupi see the explosion and rush towards the scene, finding a badly maimed but alive Meruem. To save his life, they feed him their bodies, such that they are reduced to miniature forms with Meruem emerging more powerful than before but suffering from amnesia. Now sporting wings, he returns to the palace with Yupi and Poof, the latter of which is determined to prevent him from remembering Komugi. Meanwhile, Pito's time is up a healing Komugi, and Gon demands to leave, threatening to kill Komugi. Pito is forced to obey. The group arrives and Knuckle offers to use the APR on Pito, but Gon refuses. He orders them to watch Komugi as a hostage, as they head to Pajin alone to fix Kite. Kilua takes Komugi while Palm uses her Wink Blue ability to see Poof's clone coming. Knuckle punches the clone and activates APR on it, which is transferred to Poof's main body, which is with Meruem. Palm announces that Meruem is still alive. Poof's clone spots Kilua, who's running away with Komugi. Poof attempts to kill her, but fails due to Kilua's vastly superior speed and power and godspeed. Meruem approaches the palace, which Palm consents. Being unable to take Komugi before Meruem arrives, Poof's clones try to clear away the Gungi board in the palace so that Meruem would have no recollection of the game, and by extension, her. With Poof now gone, Kilua takes Komugi to Palm, who with her ability tells Kilua that Gon and Pito are impatient. She also explains her ability and Poof's clone eavesdrops on this, coming up with a plan. Gon and Pito reach the castle where Kite's broken body is. While heading to the room, Pito receives a mobile phone call in its pocket, something Gon is oblivious to, saying Komugi is alright. Poof used his ability to imitate her voice. Believing that it's no longer in a hostage situation, Pito tells Gon that Kite is beyond saving. 
Kite died in his battle with it, and Pito's net ability can only prevent corpses from deteriorating. Goen begins to weep, vacillating between emotions of deep despair and anger. Palm watches this, but is confused as to what is happening since she can't hear what's being said. Poof's clone suddenly appears in front of Palm and Kilua, telling them if Komugi is not returned, Pito will kill Gon. Kilua crushes the clone, then rushes to Pajin, leaving Komugi with Palm. Pito calls forth Dr. Blythe. When Gon sees her, he thinks Pito is going to heal Kite, but then Dr. Blythe begins healing its broken arm, which confuses Gon, but he's still hopeful Pito will heal Kite once finished with its own arm. However, once healed, Pito tells Gon it's going to kill him now. Gon finally comes to the realization that Pito is not going to heal Kite and accuses Pito of being a liar. All of this bottled up emotions are released in the form of a dark aura, which transforms him into an older, taller, and more muscular version of himself. He demands to fight Pito outside, to which Pito complies. Pito uses Terpsic Aura to its fullest extent to try to match Gon, but the strengthened Gon easily pulverizes it and kills him. Kilo arrives, shocked at the immense power Gon is harnessing. Due to its extreme loyalty to the king, Pito's body is manipulated by Terpsic Aura past death and rips off Gon's arm. Gon simply uses the arm to pin Pito and uses a giant Jajan Ken to destroy the body, and thus the surrounding force. Simultaneously, Marom is in the palace. Poof realizes that Marom can regain memories through images and words. Yubi goes to search for Pito. The name Neferpito causes Marom to remember that he asked it to do him a favor. Marom orders Yubi to bring Pito at once, while he goes to hunt down the intruders himself. Poof attempts to dissuade him. Not only does this fail, it arouses Marom's suspicions. Marom uses N to search the area for the enemies. The N leaves all those nearby in shock. He finds Knuckle and Melioron in an instant and knocks them out before they know it. As Marom is about to hunt down Ikalgo and Palm, Poof challenges him to a contest in an attempt to prevent him from discovering Komugi. The contest is to see whether Poof and Yubi could find Pito before Marom could find the other two intruders. Marom may only use his end once, and if he loses, Poof may hide the secret he has. But if he wins, Poof must reveal it. Accepting the challenge, both parties race off. Palm and Ikalgo meet up with Walfin and an unconscious bluster inside of Baiza's palace. Ikalgo orders Walfin to act as an intermediary between them and the king, and offers Komugi in exchange for Knuckle and Melioron, to which Walfin reluctantly agrees. Ikalgo reveals that he knew Welfin's past as a human and that he was a friend of Welfin in his human life, and reminds him that the ants were enemies of NGL. Welfin drives out and meets Yuppie, with whom he shares the bargain. Yuppie agrees to tell the king, but in actuality plans on telling only Poof. Yuppie returns only to be threatened by Welfin to reveal his human memories. Before he can respond, he suddenly bleeds and dies. Maroem demands to know Poof's secret. Palm and Ikalgo debrief on the facts, theorizing that the royal guards were split on protecting or killing Komugi. Palm deduces that hiding Komugi would prevent the king from finding her. Marom and Poof begin to bleed as Yupi did. It's revealed that this is because of the Rose's trump card, a poison. Curious about the secret Poof was hiding, Marom uses N one last time and swats Welfin and immediately teleports him. He asks Welfin if he killed Yupi, and Welfin denies this, stating that Yupi had begun to cough up blood and died. Poof insists on killing Welfin, but Marom continues the interrogation, stating that he could sense Welfin's hostility to him as a result of inheriting Poof's spiritual message. Poof interrupts Marom to reveal that Welfin knew the secret he was hiding. Marom is enraged by this, releasing murderous aura. Welfin, seeing this aura, ages 100 years due to fear and utters the name Komugi as a reflexive action. Marom regains all his memories about Komugi and Gungi, which leaves Poof shattered. Poof later dies due to the poison. Marom finds Palm and asks her where Komugi is. He reveals he knows his fate and admits defeat to humanity. Palm, now partly Chimera-an, reveals the location under the condition that she can watch him. Meroem finds Komugi, and they share their final moments together playing Gungi. Komugi is adamant about staying with Meroem despite the fact that the poison will spread to her body by doing so. Meroem finally passes away in Komugi's arms, having never been able to defeat her even once, and she follows thereafter. Conclusion With the defeat of the Chimera Ants, NGL and the East Corto are taken over by the International Peacekeepers. The 5 million citizens of the countries are declared refugees, and the wealth of East Corto is spread among the three remaining nations of the Mintanay Union. NGL was turned into a nature reserve, the jurisdiction of the Hunter Association. Welfin and Blosser part ways as Welfin is going to seek Gyro and believes he's headed for Meteor City. Welfin, Hina, and Baizev head off, while Blosser and Shidere head to the village. The villagers are at first afraid of the two, but Blosser reveals he wasn't there to kill anyone. Shidori meets Haruna and reveals that she was Reina in her previous life, Haruna's daughter that was eaten by the ant at the beginning of the infestation. Haruna is overjoyed, and Bluster stays with her in the village. Gon is on life support at the hospital following his transformation, in an extremely gruesome state. Nov offers to have specialists come in to take care of Gon, as well as expert doctors. Kilua agrees to this, but reveals that he would help Gon his own way and leaves. Moral receives a phone call from Colt, who reveals that the king's twin sister has demanded to be called Kite, which surprises Moral. In the Hunter Association building, 12 people known as the Zodiacs appear, following Netero's pre-recorded instructions to decide the next chairman of the association via an election. Enter the Zodiacs. Following the death of Chairman Isaac Netero during the event in East Gorto, the Zodiacs have gathered in the Hunter Association building for a discussion. The first 11 members, Misaisam, Pion, Geru, or Jel, Kluck, Sayu, Botabai, Sacho, Kanza, Ginta, Chido, and Jin await for the last member to arrive. Finally, Pariston, the current vice chairman, arrives and apologizes for the delay. As Pariston proceeds to discuss the upcoming election, he's interrupted by Kanzai and Pion, who are none too pleased with Pariston's sudden taking of charge when he is late. Despite apologizing, Pariston emphasizes his rank as vice chairman, though he does offer the lead to Botabai, who is the most senior member of the Zodiac. 
LAX, and to Cheadle, who has better procedural skills. Exasperated, Sayu urges Parison to continue, but a show of hands present that some members are against it. Then Parison moves on to his proposal, to announce himself as chairman and skip the election. This suggestion greatly angers the Zodiacs, all but Jean Freak. Kinta threatens to kill Parison, and Gel transforms her hand into a snake, as Parison assesses the situation. He promises to understand the feelings of the weak, because according to Parison, former chairman Netero was too strong that he was unable to understand them. Mizaistam also points out that 18 people have been declared missing since Parison became the vice chairman, and Parison assures him that the number will decrease. Before Mizaistam could act upon it, Jean suddenly announces his candidacy as chairman, which surprises everyone in the room. Parison mentions the condition of Gon Freaks, whose life is in danger. He proposes to visit Gon in the hospital, but muses whether he should since Gon was dying. Jin, however, assures him that Gon would not die. Suddenly, Parison offers a more systematic way to decide on the candidacy. Cheadle suggests a lottery voting. Despite Sayu's disagreement, Cheadle explains that each Zodiac could propose rules for the upcoming election. Everyone agrees. The Zodiacs decide that Bean should take responsibility, and he agrees. Beans picks up a paper from the basket, which turns out to be Jean's. His rules are, 1. All hunters are both candidates and voters. 2. The election will be repeated if the candidate with most votes has not achieved the majority of the votes in the first election. 3. A particular election will be redone if the voting rate is less than 95%. 4. It's mandatory that all hunters write their names, else all nameless votes will be null and void. 5. The chairman of the election committee is Gene Freaks. Zodiacs begin to disagree with Gene's rules, thinking that the rules were only made for Gene's entertainment. Harrison agrees with rules 1 through 4, but suggests that deciding on the chairman should come later, to which Gene calmly complies, much to the bewilderment of the other members. As Beans watches the scene unfold before him, he recalls how Gene visited him two days ago. Gene requests for a pen and notepad in the meeting room, as well as a dustbin. When Beans asked him, Gene explains that it would take forever for the discussion to end, especially with Pariston around. He gave Beans the rules and explained further that Pariston already has a decisive advantage. Beans listened to Gene's instructions, and when he suggested that Gene may win as chairman, Gene immediately brushed the idea off, claiming that he only wanted to continue Chairman Netero's legacy and didn't want a tiresome job. Start of the election. With everything settled, Cluck disseminates the information regarding the Hunter Chairman election through controlling pitches. The voting will be held on August 8th at midnight with 661 participants. Among the voters are familiar hunters, the examiners from 278th Hunter Exam, bodyguards of Neon Nostrad, and players from Greed Island. Unexpectedly, Hisuka arrives to vote. Kanzai audibly exclaims that he didn't think murderers could care for the event which Hisuka proves to be true, as he shows Kanzai a blank paper. When Ginta questions him, Hisuka answers that he's looking for someone called Jin. Hyun answers for him that Jin has already left. Even in his disappointment, Hisuka gauges the strengths of the three Zodiacs. Kanzai, 85 points, Ginta, 90 points, and Pyon, 77 points. Kanzai berates him for staying within the building, but Ginta shows that the magician is only there to size the strength of the other hunters. As Hisuka mentally notes that he could fight the Zodiacs next, he suddenly sentenced someone stronger with 95 points. Hisuka expresses his dismay as Ilumi Zoldik, disguised as Ginta Rocker, is the one who only approached him. Ilumi explains that they like is held because Chairman Netero died while fighting some foreign ants. When Hisuka shows no information about the event, Ilumi claims that Hisuka has been so busy going after Krolo Lucifer that he didn't get the chance to fight either the ants or the chairman himself. Ilumi tells him that Gon and Kilo and Zoldik also participated in the hunt, Gon is currently dying, and Kilo has returned home to speak to their father, and would only avoid that if the younger brother of the Zoldik family is eliminated. The results of the first election is released, with Pariston in first place with 249 votes, Cheeto in second with 42 votes, and Akshanpei Katocha with 26 points. As the voting rate is less than 95%, there will be a re-election. Gene Freaks coaxes Beans into showing him the results of the votes, but Beans refuses, which prompts Gene to call him with insulting names. Another meeting for the Zodiacs is being held. Parison suggests that in order to avoid blank sheets, Beans must check each paper. He also suggests that hunters who abstain from voting should have their hunter licenses confiscated temporarily. Parison and Kansai then fall into an argument, with the former giving emphasis on Kansai's lack of knowledge in language and arithmetic. The second election results reveal that Parison, Cheadle, and Xanpei are still the leading three candidates. In enraged Kanzai moves to attack Pariston, but is stopped simultaneously by Sayu, Gel, and Mizaistam, who gives Kanzai a warning. To settle the dispute, Cheeto proposes that hunters must be informed before more rules are added and that casting an ineffective vote is against the law. Although Pariston agrees with her first statement, he reminds Cheeto that she's one of the forefront friends of the late chairman. They begin to discuss the difficulty of election and that Chairman Netero entrusted the election to be managed by the Zodiacs. Cheeto admonishes Pariston for suggesting the hunter license should be confiscated, which Pariston claims is something that he doesn't want to do. She begins to think about the voting turnout and wishes that Jean is there to assist. She describes Pariston as an unrestrained beast, and wonders why the late chairman chose someone like him to be vice chairman. The Monster Elsewhere, Sequent expresses his surprise when he finds out from Zebro that Kilua has returned home. He's even more surprised to find out that Kilua opened the testing gate up to gate 5. Zebro says that he's worried of Kilua's expression, but later learns of Gon's current condition. Inside Silva Zoldik's room, Kilua tries to persuade his father into seeing Aluka Zoldik, whose power he needs to save Gon. Silva disagrees, calling Aluka an uncontrollable child, but Kilua insists that his father and older brother could control her. Silva admits that he can't think of Aluka's family, and it's only something that came from a different and dark place. Kilua explains little about Gon and assures that he can control Aluka. 
He reminds his father about the promise they made long ago, never betray your friends. With that, Silva finally agrees. Silva leads him through a series of locked doors. He informs his son that Aliqua has not finished pestering yet and that Miluki's old ex last wish was a PC. He asks Kilua to repeat the rules when asking a wish, but when Kilua disagrees, Silva threatens to end the business then and there. Finally, Kilua complies. A flashback shows Kilua and Aliqua's childhood together. As a child, Aliqua asks her butler Mitsuba to carry her, climb the stairs, and play upsy daisy with her, all of which Mitsuba followed. The female butler was shocked to see Aliqua's eyes become black. She called for help, but Kilua arrived just in time to make wish of giving him an upsy daisy. Afterwards, Alika returns to normal. Mitsuba had already contacted the sibling's mother about the occurrence. In the family room, both Silva and Kikyo Zoldik interrogated Kilua. Kilua explained that Alika's eyes turn white after granting one wish, but if one would listen to her pesterings, they would turn black. In order to test his power, Kikyo ordered Mitsuba to decline all of Alika's pesterings this time. After refusing Alika four times in a row, Mitsuba is suddenly crushed into minced meat as a result. In the butler's lodge, another butler shared the same fate as Mitsuba. Following the incident, Kikyo explained that Mitsuba was in the playroom while Hasan was in the butler building, when they both turned into minced meat at the same time. Sensing the confusion of his parents, Kilua told them that Mitsuba declined Aluka four times. Thus, another test was made. A new butler, Yasuha, listened to all three pesterings, which made Aluka's eyes turn black. Yasuha wished to become a billionaire. Aluka agreed, and suddenly paper bills fell from the sky. Later, a news informed about a transport airship with cash that disappeared. Yasuo had later apologized for giving into temptation, but Ilami didn't think it was a coincidence. Silda and Kikyo wondered why, despite Alika being with them, she was not pestering family members at all. Ilami asked permission to handle the next butler, Kasuga, and instructed her that if she listened to all of Alika's requests, Ilami would overlook both Kasuga and her lover. When he was gone, Alika began to ask for Kasuga's liver, duodenum, spine, and brain, all of which Kasuga could not provide. Back in the present, Kilua recites the rules known to the Zoltics. If an individual grants three of Alika's wishes, she will grant one wish. The greater the wish, the next three requests are more difficult. The next person who asks a wish from Alika has to face the difficulty of requests from the previous wish. If Alika's requests are declined four times in a row, the person who declines and the person he or she loves the most will die. Kilua remembers that 67 people died from the incident involving Yasuo's billionaire request. Kasuga's inability to listen to Alika's request, which resulted in 67 simultaneous deaths. The Request Ilami and Hisuka further discuss the consequences of Alika's power in an airship bar. According to Ilami, their mother sacrificed several pairs of people to make sure, while Miliki traded some tourists for his toys. He explains that between those sacrifices, two big occurrences happened concerning Yasuha and Miliki's request. In a flashback, it showed Miliki walking with his two younger siblings, Alika and Kalito, with a tourist, Muna. Alika suddenly requests something for Muna, but Miliki assures the tourist that Alika was only playing, and he only had to refuse. Ilami then explains that after the incident with Yasuha and Kasuka, it's easy to track down the victims. Those who died in the exact manner and time as Kasuga were her fellow butlers, homeroom teacher, and classmates in the Zoldic estate. It defies the rules about the one who asked for a wish and his or her most beloved person would die, as it's impossible for Kasuga to love all of her classmates. Also, Kasuga's ill mother, whom she could only meet once a month for 30 minutes, didn't die. Hisuka suggests it may have been a change of heart, but Ilumi explains that Kasuga did not love her mother. But Ilumi explains that Kasuga did love her mother, only that she met a man over the internet whom she loved more. The Zoldics then came to the conclusion that if the person who fails Alika's request dies, his or her loved one would die, as well as the people who spent much time with the failed person. Ilumi guesses Kilua would ask Alika to heal Gon, but is sure that Kilua would do it the wrong way. He would have somebody else make the request, but pay the full price himself. Ilumi claims that his younger brother could die trying to fulfill Alika's requests, and Hisuka thinks both Kilua and Gon, the most beloved person, would die. For a moment, Ilumi corrects himself. Kilua and Ilumi would die, instead of Gon. Ilumi doesn't mind, his concern goes to the survival of the whole Zoldic family. He instructs Hisuka to watch Kilua and Aluka. If Kilua agrees to the request but is actually lying, Hisuka has the permission to kill Aluka. Back in the Zoldic estate, Aluka enthusiastically greets Kilua, who apologizes for leaving her behind. She begins to pester Kilua with requests, to which Kilua agrees. Next, Aluka asks to play Shiritori, as Kilua notes that the Aluka who calls him only by his name is an entirely different thing. Meanwhile, the third election has taken place, with Pariston and Cheetah on the top two spots, and Botsubai now in the third place. Pariston notices that more hunters have abstained from voting in fear of losing their licenses. Beans hands out the list of hunters whom Cluck should send messages to. Cheetah notices how Pariston makes decisions that would clearly give him the disadvantage, as though he enjoys challenges. Pariston offers that the Zodiac should hold a lecture to remind the hunters about the importance of the election. Joining the fray. As Kilua and Alika remain in the locked room, Silva, Kikyo, and Miliki watch through a surveillance camera. While Kikyo shows amusement that Kilua has turned into a good older brother, Miliki expresses his disappointment, for his computer wish was a piece of cake, which earns him a glare from his father. Silva asks Miliki to recite the rules once again, which adds that Alika's wishes could not be passed to another person while still in the middle of a transaction. They notice that Kilua has not yet asked for a wish, and Miliki knows that Kilua would not sacrifice innocent lives to save his friend. Then, Kilua carries Alika in his arms and demands that they should be released. Silva refuses and orders him to make the wish inside the room. In order to leave his father with no choice, Kilua wishes for Alika, now turned into Nanika, to kill their mother if both of them have not left the mountain within half an hour. If they're able to do so, Nanika must give Kilua a kiss on the cheek. Kikyo slumps on the floor, being proud of Kilua for saying something as such. Silver reluctantly opens the door and lets him leave. Moral receives a call from Kilua and tells them that Gon's condition remains the same, and a number of familiar friends have come to visit the hospital. 
Morrill suggests that an end exorcist must be called to help, but Kilo assures him that his method is easier, although the process of getting to the hospital would be of some difficulty. He contacts Goto, a senior butler, who warns Kilo about the restrictions of movement. If the restriction reaches level 5, wherein the target must be apprehended for leaving the estate, Kilo may be captured immediately. To avoid complications, Kilo and Alaka are joined by Goto and Canary. Goto questions why Canary has to be with them, and Kilo lectures him that the only female butler could provide Alaka's girlish needs. Then two more butlers arrive, much to the surprise of Kilo. Subone, with her granddaughter Amane, claims that Silva has ordered them to come. When Subone threatens Kilua about breaking the rules, Aluka comes to her brother's defense. Bemused, Subone apologizes. Amane introduces herself to Canary, just as Alaka begins to wish for Subone's fingernail. Subone wholeheartedly complies and tells Kilua that she would conceal herself for the moment to prevent Alaka from requesting to other people. Alaka then asks if he's mad, but Kilua assures her that there's nothing to worry about. The group leaves the Zoldic estate and travels by car. Goto receives a call from Leorio. The two quickly fall into an argument. The butler informs Leorio that Kilua is headed to the hospital, and in doing so, has risked his life. Moral tries to take the call, but Leorio disagrees. When Goto requests that all patients and doctors in the hospital, with the exception of Gon, should leave, Leorio suddenly bursts out, prompting Moral to take the phone and listen to the conditions himself. He agrees and calls now for assistance. As Leorio turns to leave the hospital, he tells Moral that he needs to speak to someone, Kurapika. In the Hunter Association building, the lecture between the Zodiacs and the Hunters begin. Leorio steps in to ask Jean Freaks a question. Why hasn't Jean visited Gon yet? When Jean learns that Leorio is Gon's friend, he expresses his gratitude and would be relying on Leorio. The indifferent answer enrages Leorio, inducing him to deliver an attack to Jean's direction. The hunters who have witnessed the exchange cheer enthusiastically. The fourth election results end with Parison, Cheadle, and Leorio as the top three. Due to the previous election exceeding the 95% rule, Beans proceeds to introduce the top 16 candidates. The Chase, Kilua vs. Ilami. Still traveling by car, Goto receives another phone call and is surprised to hear that Ilumi is older. As Kilua takes the phone, he realizes that his father, Silva, has sent Subone and Amane to learn more about Alaka's power, and when Ilumi's name is mentioned, it's confirmed by Amane's anxiety that Ilumi's desire does not match that of Silva and Zeno's desire to control Alaka's ability. Ilumi inquires about the needle, which Kilua replies that he's already removed it. In an intermission, according to Ilumi, family members are not allowed to kill each other, implying that none of the Zoldics think of Alaka's family. It angers Kilua, who suddenly challenges his brother. Amused, Ilumi states that he will begin now. At once, the car in which the group travels is crashed by an oncoming truck, whose drivers are killed and manipulated by Ilumi. The vehicle falls off the cliffs as both Ilumi and Hisuka watch from afar. Ilumi instructs Hisuka to eliminate the butlers and take Aluka away, but when Hisuka asks if he could kill Kilua, Ilumi's composure immediately changes as he threatens Hisuka. Below the cliffs, Kilua senses his brother's killing aura. Amane suggests that the group must stay away from Ilumi, and tells Kilua she and her grandmother Sabone are not the enemies. Their only goal is to ensure Kilua's safety. Kilua uses his godspeed and ability to separate from the group, just as Hisuka arrives to confront the three butlers. Meanwhile, Saboni chases after Kilua and Alaka, who amuses herself on how Kilua would become a splendid assassin. When they've stopped, Alaka asks her brother if she's the only hindrance in the family, but Kilua assures her that she's not. The Magician and the Butler Goto, Canary, and Amane confront the newcomer, who simply identifies himself as a magician. Hisuka attacks the butlers with his cards, but the cards are deflected by Goto's coins. Goto instructs Canary and Amane to save their energy and to chase after Kilua instead, while he deals with the enemy. Hisuka praises the strengths of the coins, which are stronger than bullets, as he explains the properties of his bungee gum ability. Once again, Goto fires his coins, but Hisuka easily catches them using bungee gum. However, he's surprised that the strength of the coins has increased, rotating Hisuka's arms while still fastened with bungee gum. He releases his ability and escapes to the trees. Hisuka proposes a riddle to Goto. How many coins should he return? He hurls the coins back to Goto, who deflects all the attacks and is unaware of the incoming attack from above. Hisuka beheads Goto, as the answer to his riddle is death. Arrangements. Using Godspeed, Kilo intends to reach the nearest airport as soon as possible. Unable to keep up with the speed, Subona contacts Amane and Canary. She transforms herself into a motorcycle, which uses the rider's nan to propel itself. Kilo was surprised that he had been followed, and so escapes his pursuers by jumping off the road and traversing the forest instead. Subone's group arrives in the airport earlier than Kilua, and Amane informs him that they have one airship prepared. Kilua scolds her and orders her to prepare five more airships. Amane and Canary do as they're ordered until Amane notices that Kilua and Aluka are gone. She gets flustered and puts all the blame to Canary, who insists on being innocent despite teasing Amane as well. In the airship, Kilua explains this situation the moral. His younger brother's ability would save Gon. Alko's ability would save Gon while risking to kill the whole Zoldic family. To make matters worse, an older brother tries to kill the younger one. Realizing that they could not chase Kilua, Ilumi relies on the help of his needle people. Kilua gives consent that hunters may try to hunt his brother Ilumi. The moral thinks Teradine Neutral and Bushidora Ambitious could agree into it. Later, Teradine, Bushidora, and Lope Highland announce that Ilumi and his needle people must be captured. As both hunters and needle people move out, Ilumi asks Hisuka to hunt the misses for him, which Hisuka gladly accepts the Pure Paladin Squad. Through television broadcast, Teradane expresses his interest in reviving the Pure Paladin Squad, a team of elite hunters in which former chairman Isaac Netero once belonged. According to Bushidora, Teradane would be the representative, Lope the vice representative, and himself the captain of the forces. Thus, both him and Lope seek others to vote for Teradane in the hunter-chairman election. 
Teradain announces that his group is in search of hunters who have committed crimes. The results of the fifth election end with Pariston, Teradain rising to second place, Cheadle and Leorio descending to third and fourth places respectively. Their candidates for ninth place and below then give out their losing speech. Elsewhere, Hisuka beams at Ilumi for finding a map and proposes to make a copy of it. Ilumi, however, declines as he's already acquired one from the idiot who was following him. Hisuka remembers the peeping Tom and discards his map. In the shadows, Suboni calls for Amine and uses her ability, Riders High, to chase Kilo's airship. A hunter who Ilumi manipulates has informed the Hunter Association that there are no more movements. Bushidori suspects that the call came from a controlled hunter while Teradane and Lobe are startled that the 20 dispatched hunters on the field are all eliminated. Bushidora announces his determination to go there himself to prove himself worthy to become a captain of the Pure Paladin Squad. When Lobe inquires Bushidora about the votes, he responds with all that can go should go. Even if none of those out of the hunt currently vote, they should still be able to get in the top four. The sixth election results are released and the top four from the previous election remain the same. Lobe rushes in to inform them that all temp hunters dispatched are eliminated, and Teradane is horrified to think that Ilumi must have dozens of strong people helping him. Confrontation. Kilwa calls Canary and orders her to have three cars waiting until the airship has landed. Then he orders the butler driving, Hashida, to take him and Aloka to the hospital. Suddenly, the car stops and two needle people appear, blocking the pathway. Kilwa orders Hashida to leave immediately, yet the butler does not comply, being one of the needle people now. More manipulated people arrive and surround the vehicle as Ilumi himself appears from the shadows. Ilumi asks his brother to hand Aloka over, but Kilwa refuses. Suboni appears and informs him that she has fallen into Ilumi's trap and that their mother, Kikyo, is watching through her scope. It's also possible that Miluki is cooperating as well by sending feedback to Ilumi. Ilumi suspects that even if Saboni realized she was being watched, she couldn't remove her scope, as it's an order from her superior. Suddenly, Aluka requests Saboni's fingernails. As Saboni easily complies, Ilumi is shown to be somehow displeased. With Nanaka in tow, Kilua is able to wish. In the shadows, Hisuka contemplates to himself whether to kill Aluka and earn Kilua's hatred, or let Aluka live, save Gon, and make Ilumi his enemy. Then Ilumi begins to question his brother whether Kilua would kill him and save Gon. As Kilua cries, he wishes for Nanaka to heal Saboni's hand instead. He explains that healing something requires a lot of energy, and as Aluka turns back into her usual self, she falls asleep in Kilua's arms. Kilua threatens Ilumi for referring to Aluka as a tool, and Ilumi complies, relieved that there's a way to heal Gon without putting Kilua at risk. However, until Kilua is still hiding some rules, Aluka would never be free of Ilumi. Finally, they come into an agreement, and Kilua and Aluka continue towards the hospital. Meanwhile, Teradain gravely announces the death of Bushidora, along with over a hundred hunters who were sent to eliminate Ilumi. While he asks for more hunters to vote for him, Hisuka slips in his room and kills him. With Teradain eliminated, the results of the sixth election have Pariston in first place, Leorio in second, Cheadle and Mizai Stamnana in third and fourth places. The election would then continue with only the top four candidates. In the Hunter Association headquarters, Jean Freaks is confronted by Cheadle. She learns that Jean plans to leave and asks him about it. While Jean only explains that he only has fun during the election, with meaning Leorio one of his biggest gains, Jean also asks that he plans on voting for Cheadle, who immediately accuses him of being a able to win the election by gathering votes from the Zodiacs and that of Teradanes. Jean shrugs her off and mentions about the next day. With no other options, Cheadle asks for advice on how to beat Pariston. Jean begins to explain that in order to defeat Pariston, Cheadle must understand how her opponent thinks. He adds that after the death of Chairman Netero, over 100 airships from the Hunter Association headed to Republic of East Gorto and picked up 5,000 cocoons. Jean assumes that the cocoons have already hatched and that Pariston intends to use them at the end of the Hunter exam, the X day. The 8th election for the 13th Hunter Chairman begins with the enumeration of the Hunter bylaws. Pion once again hosts the event and announces that the speeches should begin. Botabai encourages the other hunters to vote for Cheadle, and Ikshanpe claims he doesn't care, and warns Jean not to despair and offers a card. Meanwhile, Kilua and Alka arrive at the hospital where Gon is kept. Some of their friends are also waiting, including Palm, Knuckle, Melioran, Ikalgo, Hanzo, Biski, Melody, and Goroyinu. Finally, Pion announces that no hunter should leave the hall until the candidate becomes victorious. The 13th Chairman among the four remaining candidates, Mizai Stum goes first and inspires the hunters to vote for Cheadle instead, hoping that his announcement would knock Pariston out of the competition. Cheadle comes next and briefly announces that she supports Leorio as the next chairman. Everyone in the hall, including Mizai Stum, Pariston, and Jean, are surprised. Leorio then steps on stage. Although he admits to himself that he's not ready, he honestly claims that he intends to make the whole association his private property and that his first act as chairman would be to save Gon. His heartfelt confession about being unable to help Gon earns him the support of all the hunters within the room. After the thunderous applause he receives, Pariston steps forward to give a speech. Cheadle seems so sure that Leorio would become the next chairman. Back in the hospital, Aluka finally awakens. Kilua explains that a friend of his is sick in bed, and he wants to make him feel better again. When Aluka refuses to transform into Nanika, Kilua assures him that they would always be together thereafter. Elsewhere, Ilumi contemplates on the power of Aluka and finds out that the rules actually don't apply to Kilua at all. Subona refers to his ambition to control his siblings as sinister and cruel, to the point of straying from the path of an assassin. Kilua wishes for Nanika to bring Gon back to normal, with Nanika responding positively. On the podium, Pariston delivers his speech and declares that Mizai Stum should win the election. He explains that strength, experience, and caliber are the characteristics of a good chairman, all that Mizai Stum possesses. After his speech, the four candidates begin their debate. When Cheadle glances towards Jean's direction, she finds him dozing off in his seat, much to her annoyance. 
Mizaisam sternly proclaims that he doesn't want to be a chairman, but Paristan intercepts him, say saying that Mizaisam initially claimed that he didn't necessarily want to be a chairman. Chidal and Mizaisam come to a conclusion that Paristan needs to be defeated. While the results of the election are in progress, Nanika touches Gohan and proceeds to heal him. The tremendous amount of aura surprises the people outside the hospital, the Zoldix who are currently watching the live video, and Ilami who is waiting nearby. Ilami becomes delighted and is confident that Nanika would be his. The results of the election ended with Leorio in first place, Paristan in second, Mizaisam and Chidal in third and fourth places. Alaka's aura reaches the Hunter Association and is felt by the three candidates except Leorio. And Jean. Another re-election is needed, thus Paristan convinces Leorio to repeat his objectives when he becomes chairman. Leorio does repeat his previous statement about saving Khan, while Paristan looks at the doors, seemingly waiting for something. Then, Paristan suggests that the hunters rethink about the rules of the hunter bylaws and abolish the current hunter exam regulations. From the audience, Kansai angrily disagrees and reminds him that the commandments are absolute. However, Paristan disagrees and argues that now is the perfect timing for it. Cheeto interjects and declares himself to become Leorio's advisor if he ever wins, and she would improve the rules of the exam. Leorio immediately refuses the motion, as he's only interested in saving Gohan's life. Finally, the time Paristan had been waiting for had arrived. Moral bursts through the doors, crying profusely, and gives Leorio a thumbs-up sign. Leorio's tears show when he sees Gohan striding towards down the staircase, all healed up. He rushes to his friend and gives him a tight hug. Moral makes Leorio promise not to tell Gohan that it was Killua who saved him, and Leorio agrees. Everyone in the hall then applauded. Cheeto realizes that Paristan intended to save Leorio for last, knowing that Gon would appear so that Leorio would lose his motive for running as a candidate. When she asks how Paristan knew he would win, but later answers that it was when Jean announced he'd run as candidate. Jean was confident Gon would live, and Paristan trusted Jean as an enemy. Gon astounded at the overwhelming applause, he sees in the crowd Dune and List waving to him over pointing at someone seated between them. Gon wonders if it's Jean. Jean, on the other hand, looks uncomfortable and realizes meeting Gon is now unavoidable. Jean, Gon, and Kite. Left with no other choice, Jean waves his hand and greets Gon for the first time. Gon immediately rushes towards him and apologizes that Kite turned into a little girl. He begins ranting about the events during the Khmer and Crisis, which overwhelms and flusters his father. Jean explains that it was Kite's fault for misjudging the situation and that it's Gon's responsibility to apologize to Kite, not to Jean. Gon agrees and asks Jin if they could talk later, which Jin doubts. The crowd within the election hall goes wild and begins calling Jin names and insults. When the crowd didn't stop, Jin takes them on a playful fight. Hyoan orders everyone to be quiet since the election is still ongoing. Before Gon could leave, Paristan asks who Gon should vote for between him and Leorio. After a slight tension on Cheeto's part, Gon simply answers that he would vote for Paristan because Leorio intends to become a doctor and therefore he couldn't be a chairman. Leorio and Gon proceeds to leave, but not before Jin explained that he taught Kite his crazy slots ability. It may have been the reason why Kite is still alive, driven by his strong desire to live. The ninth and last election for the Hunter Chairman declares Paristan Hill as the new chairman. He announces that Cheeto would be his vice chairman, while he himself would step down from being chairman. All Zodiacs are surprised, including Jin, who admits he didn't anticipate the outcome. Enraged, Cheeto confronts Paristan in the hallway. Paristan explains that he only wanted to play with previous chairman Netero. He tells Cheeto to reform the commandments and Hunter exam, and if the association becomes dull under Cheeto's leadership, he would become serious about toying with her. Meanwhile, Ilmi arrives at the hospital in pursuance of both Kilua and Alduka. He deduces that Kilua hasn't wished to Nanika, but rather issued a command to it. Once he confronts Kilua again, Ilmi states that he's the only one who could safely use Nanika's ability for the Zoldic family. He promises Alaka would also have the freedom under his supervision. Kilua, however, replies that he would be the one to protect Alduka, and commands Nanika to teleport Ilami back home. In Kukuro Mountain, Silva, Kikyo, and Miliki, who are all watching, are surprised to see him instantly teleport. Ilami confidently confides that there would be no more risk of Alaka's requests, as long as Kilua commands her. Back in the hospital, Kilua also asks for Subone and Amine to leave. Nanika requests to be patted on the head, but Kilua refuses and tells Nanika that it could not come out any longer. Nanika cries and goes back to sleep as Alaka awakes. Alduka cries as well and scolds Kilua for making Nanika cry, and insists that he should apologize. Though he thinks that she still may be under Ilumi's control, Kilua agrees and apologizes to Nanika. He tells Nanika never to grant other people's wishes anymore, so that Kilua would pat her on the head. After a tearful exchange, Nanika forgives Kilua. In the corner of the room, Subone is revealed to be watching and crying, as Kikyo orders her that the restrictions upon Kilua are cancelled. In a mansion, Koala remembers the red-haired girl he killed. According to him, shooting people to death had always been his job, and he repented the day he was born as a Khmer ant, that the cycle of him killing people still continued. Yet he also admits that the ones he should have killed were ants hunting the red-haired girl. He thanks Meruem's twin sister, the reborn Kite, for listening to his story until the end. However, Kite orders Koala to keep on apologizing and never lose his resolve, unless Koala wanted to be killed by her. Spinnerclo appears by the doorway and announces that the visitor has come. Gon sits in front of her and confesses that he wasn't strong enough so they could fight together, that he would protect Kite next time. Gon acknowledges the help he received from Kilo and the others, who helped him recover after his battle with Neferpito. Smiling, both Gon and Kite can see that they didn't have enough training. Then Kite shifts the conversation to Jean, after hearing that Gon and his father have already met. She encourages Gon to hurry back to Jean and promises that she would contact Gon and Kilua if she ever needs her help. As Gon finally departs the mansion, Koala also apologizes and assures Kite that he would live his life to the fullest now. On top of the world.
In order to meet Jean again, Gon is instructed to climb a world tree. Together with Kilowa and Aluka, Gon travels to the foot of the tree and learns information about it. Standing at 1,784 meters, it's the tallest tree in the world. Before parting ways, Gon thanks Kilowa for everything he's done, which prompts the latter to enumerate times when Gon annoyed him, but only as a tease. Kilowa informs his friend that Aluka was the one who healed him, and also calls forth Nanika. Kilowa explains that it's Nanika's wish-granting ability that caused him to be imprisoned back home. Aluka assures to return Kilowa once both of them have had enough traveling together. Finally, with another farewell, Gon and Kilowa part ways. Gon proceeds to the information booth and gets access to climb the world tree. On the way up, he encounters a fellow climber calling out for help. Gon requests for aid and sees the climber rescued, before going on his own way. After a few minutes, he reaches the top and is surprised to find a large nest. Gina waits on the other side and tosses an apple for Gon to eat. As they both enjoy the view at the top, Gon asks his father what he truly wanted. After a while, Gina explains that he wanted something that was not before him, which was a royal burial site that time, and could only be achieved if he had the means to do so. Before and after he became a hunter, Gene acquainted himself with various archaeologists. According to him, the journey before reaching his goal was more important than the goal itself. When asked about what he wants now, Gene claims that the world tree they just climbed is only a sapling that stopped growing. The real world trees are located somewhere else and needs magma and mountains to grow at its full height. Currently, the one Gene wants is something he could not see in front of him. According to him, he still doesn't have the qualifications to explore the outside world, but he could wait for the time to come. As the day wanes, Gon returns his father's hunter license, the one he received from Kite long before. They continue talking about their adventures with each other. In Whale Island, Peter receives a card and picture of Gon and the small build Juan. Moral Nob finally take their bets and spend the money buying wine and toasting for the former chairman Netero. Gon returns to Kite and her group of amateur hunters. Knuckle, Shoot, Big Man, Melioron, Ikalgo, and Palm are all back in the hospital and are enjoying a small picture of the small build swans as well. Elsewhere, Gon's other friends receive the same images. Leorio simultaneously tries to call Karapika, but receives no response. Karapika is revealed to have found five pairs of the Brethren's scarlet eyes. In Kukuru Mountain, Canary and Amane erect a grave for the recently deceased Goto, while Akiriko disguises as the former butler. Canary convinces Amane not to tell Kilua. Lastly, back in the barren Republic of East Gorto, a dead Komugi and Meruem are seen holding hands. The Special Assignment Beans comes inside a room chatting about a big emergency. Sayu guesses Shida wants to resign her seat, however she assures him that she won't, and lets Beans talk. He shows a video in which Kakin Empire's king, Nasubi Hoikoro, declares his country's intention to travel to the Dark Continent. The Zodiacs are surprised except Kanzai, who is clueless about the Dark Continent and Kakin's king. Jell explains that the Dark Continent is a place outside of the world's map. It's also where magical beasts are believed to originate from. Mizaisa adds that every time humanity had tried to venture there in the past, a disaster was brought back. 200 years ago, the Continental V5 Forum made an agreement not to go there. Chido explains that Kakin could technically be considered a new nation after their transition to a parliamentary democracy 30 years ago, so they may have neglected to renew the treaty. Beans interrupts them with a more serious problem. The video shows King Hoikoro as he introduces the person who will lead their expedition, beyond Netero, the son of the late Isaac Netero. The Zodiacs are once again surprised not knowing that Netero had a son. Jell suggests they need a confirmation. However, after Beyond starts his speech, Sayu questions if there is a need to confirm him being Netero's son as they notice their similar attributes. Beyond promises that he'll take care of everything and that all will have an equal opportunity to join his team as he encourages everyone to come to Kakin. Everyone in the room is shaking as the video ends. Beans lets them know that there's a second DVD that the chairman had left with him, which he's only allowed to show to all members of the Zodiacs if someone claimed to be his child. Since Jean and Harrison are not in attendance, Cheadle makes an announcement. Meanwhile, people from all around the world are ready to follow Beyond, who decide to ignore the prohibitions of the V5 about exploring the Dark Continent and makes a speech to his expedition team, Paris that is seen there, saying that he's willing to go where no one has gone before. Cheeto tells the Zodiacs that they don't need to wait for Jean and Paris to see the DVD as she approved both of their requests to leave the Zodiac. She then announces the special assignment given directly from the V5, Hunt Down Beyond Netero. The director and the deputy secretary of the International Permit Agency, IPA, discuss the role of their agency in restricting people from traveling to the New World. The director mentions that Kotkin, however, succeeded in bypassing their screening process since they haven't signed the treaty and now are demanding unlimited access. Should the negotiations fail at the summit next month, it'll be difficult to stop them. The director opens a door to the agency's basement that's filled with various atrocities and wrung corpses that were a result of humanity's attempts to colonize the Dark Continent. Discussing the importance of preparation before the venture, the director hands over the book to the newly appointed man, explaining that it contains travels that were published hundreds of years ago. He instructs him to memorize every detail of the book as they move through the basement. As they walk along, one creature slams against a glass wall which takes the young man by surprise. The director explains that the creature is the only survivor in their facility, which used to be human, and now has been self-sustaining for almost 50 years unable to die. The Zodiacs are shown a video of Isaac Netero discussing the V5's plan to explore the Dark Continent and requests that his son be not elected as the head of this expedition. The Zodiacs debate on its assignment to hunt Beyond and even mention Jean's possibility of joining. Beans then comes in. Having received a call from Beyond himself, Beyond appears before the Zodiacs and orders them to tell the V5 that they've already captured him. The young man reviews a report on the previous Dark Continent explorations and the five threats that were brought back as a result of those explorations. Unnerved and anxious from the reports, the young man believes that the Dark Continent is no place for humans to return. Cheadle interviews Beyond 
Beyond, which is locked in a prison cell, and Beyond declares that the Zodiacs will release him. Chido dismisses this as absurd and continues the interview. Sajo interprets the interview for Kansai, explaining that the King of Kakin has allowed for Beyond to go to the Dark Continent provided he makes the King famous. Beyond declares war against the Zodiacs, which Chido accepts. Misaisam later informs Chido that the V5 has authorized the voyage to the Dark Continent, and the Zodiacs will accompany Beyond even against their will. In the meanwhile, the Deputy Secretary of the IPA gives a speech to the V5, making them realize that the only way to stop Kakin is through military might. He recommends that they invite King Nasabi to join the modern nation leaders, and that they endorse his project, partaking in possible profits while letting King Nasabi take the fallout. To ensure the safety of the civilians, he advises the V5 pretend one of the islands close to the waters of the Dark Continent is the actual Dark Continent. Cheeto contacts Leorio and offers him to be a Zodiac, as he was now a popular finger in the hunter community. At first he declines, but then asks if there's another spot in the Zodiacs. He recommends Kurapika, who is then scouted by Mizaistam. Mizaistam deals with guards and is approached by Kurapika himself. Mizaistam uses the Scarlet Eyes owned by Surijini Soikuro, the fourth prince of Kakin, as a motive for Kurapika to join. While traveling by car, Kurapika communicates with Leorio for the first time in a while. He inquires about Gon's condition and Leorio asks for Kurapika's email address. Kurapika refuses to share this information. Kurapika thanks Mizaistam for the connection to Prince Suridnik and assures him that he can deal with the prince's dark side. They reach the Hunter Association building, where Leorio reunites with Kurapika briefly before they're taken to the meeting. At the meeting, Cheadle informs the Zodiacs that the V5 has been changed to V6, as Kakin is now a member. She reveals the reason for the failures of previous Dark Continent expeditions, the Five Threats. The danger of these threats were level A, one rank higher than the Chimera Ants, B. Cheadle reveals their objective, to travel to the New World, capture at least one of the threat, and bring it back safely, as well as deal with Beyond. Kurapika asks the other Zodiacs if they've identified a member of Beyond's team in the Association, stating that Beyond must have planned this all for when his father died. He confirms that Pariston and some Temp Hunters are allies of Beyond. Misaisam leads Kurapika out, and advises him not to inquire about a mole because the mole would be on alert. When they return, all the Zodiacs explain their roles on the voyage. Kurapika oversees the 289th Hunter exam, where one stage is to answer a questionnaire concerning their knowledge of Kakin's imperialistic ambitions. Kurapika uses his dousing to see who's lying and therefore working for beyond. Mizaistam praises his ability, but Kurapika asserts that it isn't all that powerful, and that someone with a similar ability could counter this one. Mizaistam explains that there probably isn't even a person within the Zodiacs like that. Meanwhile, Jin confronts Pariston in Beyond's lair, with a double objective of joining Beyond's expedition and putting a stop to Pariston's plans. He explains that depending on what the Hunter Association will do concerning Beyond's challenge, Pariston may send in 5,000 Chimera Ants. He promises to play with Pariston if Pariston can keep up with him. Pariston demands to know what he's deduced, so Jin explains that if the Hunter Association accepts the V5's terms, Pariston will let loose 5,000 Chimera Ants to the world chaos and forcing changes in the policies, because to him that is a boring course of action. Pariston angrily interjects that Netero would never conform, but would defy both the V5 and his son and go to the Dark Continent on his own. Jin then adds that if the Hunter Association does decide to go against the V5's wishes, Pariston will use the next Hunter exam to infiltrate his 5,000 men using Chimera Ant into the organization. The members show reluctance in having Jin be second in command. Jin promises a double beyond pay to them. Pariston shows no objection. Jin educates them in the five threats and how their threat level surpassed that of the Chimera Ants since there was no countermeasure for them. A member asks Jin how he knows so much, and Jin explains that the Dark Continent was being recorded by Dawn Freaks. Gon attempts to use his Nan but is unsuccessful. Jin explains that it was there, Gon just couldn't see it. He tells Gon that it could have been much worse and advises him to go looking for something. Gon heeds Jin's advice and returns to Whale Island and Mito. When asked by Mito if he was disappointed that he couldn't go, Gon says that he would be a burden due to his lack of Nen, and that his goal was to find Jin, not meet him. A month later, Jin continues to display his prowess and skill and knowledge with the expedition team, gaining the respect. Pariston suddenly shows up and divulges the failure of the assassin sent to the hunter exam. He acknowledges that the ability of his successor, Kurapika, one of the assassins, Muher, claims that Kurapika can read minds. He orders Jin to leave, believing him to be an agent of the Hunter Association. However, Jin assures him that his goal is to support Beyond, but stop Pariston. Usamen supports this claim, advising Muher to wait a few days to see really why Jin should be number two. Just then, the other temp hunters arrive and reveal that number two would not be in the chain of command. They force either Jin or Pariston to leave. Jin comes in with a third option. The assassins leave, whereas Pariston decides that the assassin should be killed. Muher gets his assassin to shoot at Jin and Pariston, so they flee. Jin uses Leorio's remote punch technique to attack their assailants. He also uses his aura to produce an ultrasound which can be used to detect enemies. He uses this to find the other two henchmen and knock them out. When they find no enemies, Pariston reasons that they must have fled, but Jin corrects him by saying that their mission was complete. The entire scenario was set up by Pariston himself. He learned this when one of the temp hunters didn't bring up both Jin and Pariston leaving as an option. Muher wonders how they figured out his plan. Jin is more concerned about his men, stating that they're too weak for the Dark Continent. Muher reveals that they're simply backup. Shooting would be taken care of by Gollum. Jin is impressed by Gollum's capabilities, but Gollum refuses to give any more details about their true identity. Jin asks the soldiers to take his money, but Muher assures that the soldiers can't be bought with money. He questions Jin's motives for sponsoring the soldiers, and Jin says that he didn't know the main reason, though there were a number of possible causes. He reveals that he simply wants to support Beyond but thwart Pariston, and the money would act as a gift and a convenience. Muher finally agrees to talk to the soldiers. Jin declares himself as number two, but asks him how to leave. 
Curious to see what he would do, Jin replies that he wouldn't hold back. In Kakin, Prince Benjamin contacts his younger brother, Prince Serednik, to inform him that their father has accepted their offer that he who could survive the Dark Continent would be king. Overjoyed by the news, Prince Serednik declares that victory will be his. While taunting his older brother's intelligence, his subordinates who have entered the Hunter exam reveal their success in becoming hunters. After weeding out the spies during the 289th Hunter exam, Kurapika and Mizai Stum focus again on the possibility of a mole among the Zodiacs. Kurapika volunteers to test them in secret, while Mizai Stum gathers them to disclose details regarding their abilities. The normally politically divided Zodiacs were working with each other to help with a mission to show their cooperation and thereby innocence. Since there was probably no risk of it failing, Mizai Sam asks Kurapika to listen to the others as they state their abilities and find the liar. During the assembly, Mizai Sam speaks openly about the possibility of a spy. As they speak in turns, Kurapika reveals the informant to be Sayu. Voyage Preparations King Nasubi's personal butler, Nugui, explains to Sridnich that the succession war will begin once the voyage began, but if any of the participants, the king's legal children, died before, the war would be cancelled. Sridnich then participates to a Kakin Empire of Right, receiving, unbeknownst to him, an egg from which his guardian spirit beast will hatch. In the meanwhile, Kurapika and Mizai Stum watch a recording in which the ox interrogates Beyond on the identity of the spy in the Zodiacs, stating he will let him participate in the sailing ceremony that will take place on the eve of the departure in 34 days. Beyond declares he doesn't know anything and doesn't care about the ceremony. Rather, the V5 will most likely pressure the Zodiacs into letting him go. Using his ability, Kurapika confirms he's not lying. They conclude the safest course of action would be to restrain Sayu shortly before arrival. Shortly afterward, they discover some of the princes are hiring bodyguards, which would allow some of the spies to board the Black Whale. Kurapika recruits Biski, Basho, Izanabi, Hanzo, and Melody to be hired as bodyguards by each of the six princes of the Kakin Empire and get information regarding Prince Soridnich. Izanabi points out that something significant must have happened for all six princes to put up job postings simultaneously. Hanzo states that Soridnich is likely not among them as he's a veteran at this, and he likely has a private army. Basho expands on that, saying that the naive princes are the ones using money as a reward. Melody argues that if that is indeed the case, then it'll make things easier. Bisky counters saying that the elimination of threats sounds suspicious. Kurapika sums up that all he wants is information, no matter the means. The information would have to allow Kurapika to come into physical contact with Soridnich, since that way he could use more abilities effectively. If they could do that, then they could abort the rest of the mission. Bisky asks to confirm that Kurapika would still give them the money even if they aborted since the contract would be in effect once they've applied. Kurapika states that that was obvious, angering Bisky. He recalls Kilua's advice on dealing with Bisky and proceeds to reluctantly flatter her in order to ensure her loyalty. Kurapika looks at the six profiles, which look virtually identical, and observes the fine details of each prince. First the post, highest pay, and the competitive one, the ones willing to interview, etc. Kurapika focuses on two profiles, the one that had the highest reward by increasing theirs over the others, and the one who never changed at all. The former is competitive and likes to display power, the other has strong self-esteem. The one who matches these profiles is Prince Halkenberg. Kurapika thinks about his past, an honor student who had poor relationship with his family, save Suridnich. Kurapika decides that Halkenberg is the best option for getting close to Suridnich, and chooses the one that he believes to be Halkenberg. He gets a response which invites him to a hotel owned by the Hoikuro family. Kurapika meets his employer who turns out to be Queen Oito, mother of Prince Wobble. Kurapika is surprised and disappointed, something that she senses. However, she states that his disappointment is all the more reason that he's a worthy candidate for the job. She reveals that they're looking for someone who came under the pretense that they would be hired by Prince Halkenberg, even with the fewest of indicators. The information put on the site was purposely vague to prevent anyone who might want to hurt the princess from pinpointing their target. As that applied to Prince Halkenberg, he didn't put up a post. She explains Halkenberg's reputation and the various viewpoints surrounding him. As such, many applicants would be assassins or fake followers, which would be convenient for Oito since they have similar aims. Anyone who could reach their goal by protecting Oito. Kurapika asks why regular applicants couldn't be used, and Oito divulges the true nature of the expedition, succession war. Oito can't get out because King Nasubi strictly believes that his children should aim to be king, and deserters would be killed. If Halkenberg becomes the king, then he can be blackmailed for participating in this barbaric event. So the job is to get Wobble and herself off the voyage ship for 10 times the payment or keep the conversation confidential and leave for the original fee. Kurapika agrees to do the former if Oito agrees to certain conditions. Oito agrees to them. Oito reminisces on her life and how she thought that wealth was everything when marrying the king, only to discover her true value laid in her daughter, Wobble. She allows Kurapika to hold Wobble. Izanabi is hired by Prince Tyson, Biski by Prince Mariam, Basho by Prince Luzerus, Melody with Prince Kacho, and Hanzo with Prince Momose. Heaven's Arena battled to the death. At Heaven's Arena, Hisuka challenges Krolo, who has become a fuller master to a duel. Krolo decides to have a fight to the death, to which Hisuka consents. The battle begins with Krolo using Black Voice, which he apparently stole from Shalnark to manipulate the judge. Hisuka realizes that Krolo was using the time he spent fleeing from him to steal more abilities. After having the judge manipulated, Krolo uses him to pin down Hisuka so he can stab him with his second antenna. Hisuka deflects, but Krolo uses this opportunity to launch a series of stomps. Amazed by Krolo's resolve, Hisuka figures out the purpose of controlling the judge is to tire him out and strike while he's still weak. Hisuka attempts to slash the judge, but instead the judge detonates. Krolo reveals his ability, the Sun and Moon, which allows him to imprint seals whether either plus or minus on a target. And when the opposite seals meet, an explosion takes place. Krolo also demonstrates his other ability, Double Face, which allows him to use a bookmark on a page to maintain this page's ability. With this, he no longer has to hold the book open to use that ability. 
though he can use two abilities by having the book open to another page. However, this brought out new limitations to Skill Hunter. Crollo says that he'll show he's got three more abilities, thus setting a new record for the most abilities it's taken to kill someone. After a small talk, Crollo explains the rest of his abilities. Order Stamp, which allows him to control any inanimate object, provided that its head is still connected to the torso. But since the former owner didn't consider a real corpse to be an inanimate object, Crollo makes use of Cortebee's ability, Gallery Fake, and make a copy of the judge's corpse. After that, he uses Order Stamp to command the copy to kill Hisoka, albeit unsuccessfully. He then reveals his final ability, Covert Hands, which allows him to switch appearances with the person he touches. He reveals that one of his abilities belonged to a now-deceased person. Hisoka realizes that it remained after death because the person's Nen became stronger post-mortem. The ability is the Sun and Moon, which belonged to a Meteor City Elder that once turned his brethren into bombs in order to purge an outside threat. The seals from the Nen ability cannot be removed. Crollo declares that he will win, but Hisoka is insistent on continuing the fight. Crollo jumps into the audience and uses Black Voice to control a large spectator. Crollo hides behind him and manipulates another. By the time Hisoka deals with the two, Crollo is gone from his sight. He realizes that Crollo originally bookmarked Black Voice to control the spectators, activated and changed his appearance with covert hands, and then shifted the bookmark to that page so he can retain it and hide. A panicked audience begins to flee the arena, despite being told not to rush the exits all at once by the commentator. Several audience members notice they've been duplicated, which alerts Hisoka to the fact that Crollo is using Gallery Fake. Shortly, many of them begin rushing towards Hisoka, who realizes that Crollo is currently using Order Stamp to command the copies to kill him. He uses Bungie Gum to propel himself towards the ceiling, away from the puppets. However, this was proven futile as his pursuers are capable of reaching him. Hisoka blocks her attacks, but leaves himself open from behind. In opening, Crollo exploits to land a hit on him. Despite being pummeled, Hisoka is enjoying the fight by continuing to decapitate the puppets, while Crollo uses openings to land guaranteed hits. Crollo tries to attack from above, but Hisoka anticipates this and attaches Bungie Gum to a decapitated head, flinging it at Crollo, who dodges it easily, having expected it, and proceeds to stomp his opponent. Hisoka, however, knew this and has swung his foot with a head attached to it, hitting Crollo while he's lying injured on the ground. Crollo manages to recover from Hisoka's sneak attack. Hisoka uses several heads to smash the still attached heads of the remaining puppets, thus incapacitating them. He launches an attack on Crollo, who retreats again into the audience. Hisoka restrains one puppet to see through Crollo's next actions. One, keep the bookmark on gallery fake, open order stamp, command the waiting puppets to kill Hisoka. Two, keep the bookmark on gallery fake, use both hands to create more copies. After that, he would either A, open order stamp, command the puppets to kill Hisoka, B, open covert hands, change his appearance with his left hand. The stamp vanishes from the puppet Hisoka is restraining, which leads Hisoka to believe Crollo chose the second option. Hisoka realizes the audience should panic at the sight of Crollo if he plans to copy them, so he's wary that Crollo would opt for option B to avoid the risk. Hisoka understands that Crollo might go where his copies are already on standby in order to both create more copies and stamp the previous ones. Using this logic, he spots Crollo, pursues him into the stands, and goes on an all-out offensive to pressure him. He begins to consider a third possibility. C. Open Black Voice, conceal the cell phone and antenna in his left hand. Hisoka makes sure to keep his distance, then flings several audience members to whom he attached bungee gum towards Crollo who dodges them. However, Hisoka managed to attach bungee gum to Crollo's leg. He drags him and launches several strikes, apparently killing him. He finds out that it was simply a right-handed copy of Crollo, meaning the bookmark is on covert hands. Hisoka is confused about why the severed head he was carrying from the start is still existing after Crollo had removed the bookmark from Calorie Fake. He quickly realizes that it was a fake out, and the puppets that have been afflicted by the sun and moon won't vanish. Hisoka comes to the conclusion that Gallery Fake, a double-handed ability, can still be used in conjunction with another ability. Crollo may imprint the plus mark with his left while he's opening the book on the sun and moon, and keeping Gallery Fake bookmark. He comes to the final conclusion that instead of following option 2B exactly, Crollo added another step. Open the sun and moon, imprint the plus mark with his left hand, deactivate either or both, open order stamp, command the puppets to kill Hisoka. Hisoka decides to go on the defensive to prevent the puppets from detonating near him. Crollo steals the microphone from the commentator to issue a break Hisoka command. From there, hundreds of audience members begin rushing towards Hisoka, which excites him. He uses bungee gum to swing the copies and smash the rest. However, the bodies can't handle constant collisions, and the control puppets continue to pour in. All of a sudden, Crollo has the head Hisoka is using detonate when he's still holding it in his hand. After one of the bodies explodes, blowing off his left hand, Hisoka tries to assess the situation. He soon comes to the conclusion that Crollo figured out which body he decapitated, imprinted a left hand plus mark on the body with his open book, before imprinting another minus mark on the different individual, then manipulating the individual using black voice, making them touch the body's plus mark and creating a maximum power bomb. Hisoka realizes the dangerous situation he is in and chooses to go all in, decapitating several puppets and climbing up the Heaven's Arena walls using bungee gum in order to find Crollo on the second floor. With the puppets in pursuit, Hisoka is faced with even more directly ahead of him, which has been ordered to self-destruct after spotting Hisoka. Due to this, a large explosion comes from the second floor, sending Hisoka flying towards more puppets on the arena floor and blowing off his right leg. Before he's able to use bungee gum on his remaining leg to escape to the ceiling, a puppet from the second floor flies into his chest due to Crollo's intervention. Hitting the floor, Hisoka is surrounded by a crowd of puppets before a large explosion engulfs them. 
Later, a news report at the scene of Heaven's Arena confirms the end of the deathmatch, which resulted in several audience casualties. Hisuka's dead body is seen before Shalnark, Kortopi, and Machi in another room. Shalnark explains that the large crowd of puppets had a cushioning effect that protected him from the bulk of the explosion. However, Hisuka ended up dying from lack of oxygen due to the blast and the mass of flesh. Kortopi and Shalnark then leave after Machi says she'll stitch him up. Before she can do so, Aura begins to reemerge from his corpse and Hisuka comes back to life. It's later revealed that he placed bungee gum on his heart and lungs in order to restart them after his demise. After a brief conversation in which Hisuka admits he bit off more than he could chew, he says it'll be his enemies which won't have a choice in where and who they face. He then proceeds to restrain Machi using bungee gum before she leaves, saying that he won't stop until he's killed all of the spiders. He then leaves Machi, who continues to threaten him. Shalnark talks on the phone with Krollo, who is planning to board the Black Whale of the Kakin royal family in order to seal their valuables. After he hangs up, Shalnark wonders why Kortobi is taking so long at the toilet. As he receives another call, Hisuka exits from the toilet with Kortobi's severed head in his hands. He throws it at Shalnark, causing him to scream out and become distracted. Hisuka dashes forward and delivers an extremely powerful strike to his head, killing him. Shalnark's mangled corpse is then seen tied to a swing with Kortobi's severed head placed in front of him. The Black Whale departs, the succession battle begins. The day before the voyage arrives and the Eve Festival celebrations start, all the voyagers gather in Kakin in front of the Black Whale. The Kakin royal family is gathered at the assembly with some princes believing they will win the succession battle. Passengers begin entering the Black Whale. The first tier is structured for the Kakin royal family, V5 politicians, and industry dignitaries. The second tier is for the rich and celebrities, while tiers 3, 4, and 5 are designed for general passengers. Balsalmico, captain of the guards of Prince Benjamin, begins discussing the schedules of the princes for the other soldiers, noting they will act as guards until the disembarkation ceremony, also telling them that actual opportunities to assassinate the other princes may not come. Kurapika and Queen Oito are discussing ways of escaping the Black Whale. Kurapika ponders the quality and strength of the other prince's forces as well as the consequences of the frivolous examination conducted by the Dark Continent Committee. Misaisam calls Kurapika to inform him of the increase in conflict levels on the third and fourth tiers due to fights, apparent ticket forgeries, larceny, etc. Because of this, the Zodiacs are unlikely to meet up as planned. Kurapika assures Oito that there's escape routes if the worst happens, to which Oito reacts emotionally because she was initially prepared to face death. Kurapika calls the system controls room to get data when he senses Nen coming from Prince Wobble, shocking him. The Black Whale 1 sets off for the Dark Continent. It'll take three weeks passing through territorial waters before venturing on the more volatile uncharted water for five weeks. The ship will make a nominal stop at the new continent to avoid public outcry, while beyond, the Zodiacs and other hunters will head to the Dark Waters using Moral Ship after crossing the gate at the Far Ocean Boundary. The departure ceremony takes place with the king, princes, and queens attending. Kurapika demands to know if the guards can use Nen, but they all claim they haven't heard of it. Some guards chastised Kurapika for mentioning Nen, believing that their mission was simply to protect Queen Oito and Prince Wobble. The royal family attends a banquet with the royal attendees believing they will kill their siblings and win. Prince Kacho, Melody's employer, forms an alliance with Prince Fugetsu and acts like a diva. The latter action is discovered by Melody to be a facade. Kurapika comes across more murdered guards, prompting him to use Chain and interrogate the people in the room. While interrogating the other bodyguards, Kurapika reveals the true nature of the voyage was a succession battle among the princes of the Kakin Empire. Several guards admit to being aware of this and also confess to not being aligned with Prince Wobble. They explain that seven bodyguards were chosen to keep tabs on Wobble, one from each higher rank queen. While they're assigned to keep Wobble alive, they must make sure that Wobble doesn't become a threat to their clients. One guard divulges a seed urn ceremony, which gave Wobble an egg that would hatch into a guardian spirit beast. Kurapika theorizes that one of the murdered guards had tried to act on his own, and the guardian spirit beast reacted to him. However, the other guards disprove this by saying that the amount of time since Wobble received the egg, one month, was too short for her to master Nen to such a degree. All of a sudden, some guardian spirit beasts start crawling over the Nen oblivious guards, and the room becomes infested with guardian spirit beasts. Kurapika makes an emergency call using all channels and contacts his fellow hunters, but they all state there's nothing abnormal going on. Kurapika realizes that the princes themselves are unaware of the guardian spirit beasts. Kurapika asks Bill if the parasite type Nen acts like a curse, to which Bill confirmed. Bill decides that he and Kurapika must be more open to each other. The guardian spirit beasts have disappeared, except for one sticking to Sayard, influencing him to murder the other guards. He goes to kill the other two, but Kurapika prepares to fight him. Kurapika easily restrains Sayard and asks Bill whether Sayard's Nen ability is necessary for the mission. Bill reveals that Sayard's ability is mission manipulation based that allows him to project his aura into a ball and then control any creature caught inside the ball. Reminiscing on a training succession with Izanavi where he told Kurapika to focus on cooperation with allies, Kurapika uses the steel chain to absorb Sayard's aura in the hopes that it would draw at the parasite in his body, which turns out to be a small spider-like creature. Though it manages to escape, Kurapika finds out that Sayard's Nen ability is called Little Eye, and it allows him to control captured creatures, excluding those that are created by Nen. Free from the Guardian Beast's control, Sayard admits that he was not in control. Because he's under arrest, he informs Kurapika that the largest creature he can control is the size of a hamster, but one can get sensory information from the creature. Additionally, he recommends that Kurapika not use tiny creatures like flies because they could easily be killed. With only two guards left, Bill says that without Curtain, in order to escape, they would need either Parison or Beyond, both of whom would be difficult to cooperate with. Prince Momose allows her bodyguard to be transferred to Prince Marion, 
feeling pity for him and his mother as they would be unable to win in the battle to the throne. Prince Halkenberg announces to his father that he will be withdrawing from the battle, stating he initially joined to merely save his father's reputation and he doesn't wish to earn the crown through bloodshed. Nasumi accepts his son's withdrawal. Bill discusses the key issues surrounding countering parasites, which is the parasite's propensity to being made through the host's thoughts and feelings. Oito states that the first through the fifth princes lost this upcoming battle and would never willingly opt out. Meanwhile, Suridnich and Tubepa agree to an alliance as the lower ranked princes are either unwilling or unable to fight, and the top three princes have massive character flaws. Nasubi's monologue explains the rules regarding the usage of a guardian spirit beast as follows. Guardian spirit beasts may not directly attack other guardian spirit bearers. His monologue goes on to explain the guardian spirit beasts are designed to protect the princes, but it's up to the princes themselves to figure out how to kill their brethren. During the age of rival warlords, Nasubi's ancestors created the urn, and his children helped build the Kakin Empire to what it is today. The guardian spirit beasts are supposed to protect the one who possesses the legacy of the Hoikoro family, one who has foresight, carefulness, and strong planning abilities. Theta discusses how she will instruct Suridnich to stay in his quarters without leaking the secret of Nen to him with Salkov. Salkov suggests that she inform him about Nen, but train him to use it in an inefficient way, such as having him use his weakest Nen type in battle. Luzerus and Tyson become aware of Nen and the guardian spirit beasts that surround them. Halkenberg is horrified as he stumbles upon the unconscious bodies of at least 11 of his bodyguards. Theta is confronted by Suridnich and his guardian spirit beast, and he begins interrogating her about Nen. Theta admits that she's both aware of it and capable of using it. Zhang Lei learns of the death but all of two Wobble's bodyguards. His bodyguards bring up the issue of guardian spirit beast, a topic which they are all unfamiliar with. Camilla asks her father to make sure that the condition for dropping out is biological death. Her father tells her that the sole survivor will be the official successor to the throne, as he told Zhang Lei earlier, though it's up to her to interpret that. Benjamin arrives and tells Camilla not to be so focused on others' interpretations of the rules. Camilla argues that she wants them to feel despair to the point that they willingly die. She leaves after being called arrogant by her older brother. Benjamin makes an oath to his father that he would win and defend Kaki. He then decides to kill his first target, Suridnich. Benjamin's bodyguards talk about the Guardian Spirit Beast and deduce that there are unknown rules about them. Balsamico instructs Benjamin to stay put as the introduction of Nen makes things more dangerous. Benjamin inquires as to why a hunter would leak the existence of Nen, but Balsamico reasons it's to prevent the others from making strikes as the hunter's goal is to get to the Dark Continent. Benjamin orders his bodyguards to act as royal family bodyguards. They are to observe the hunters and Guardian Spirit Beast while having permission to kill if they are threatened. Kodapiga and Bill discuss when to employ Seir's power. The royal bodyguard Vincent shows up and kills a servant, claiming she attacked him. Kurapika realizes he is not a bodyguard, but instead an assassin. Kurapika decides not to fight with Vincent because of the legal ramifications that would rise. Vincent says that he wishes to cooperate with Kurapika and the others, but Kurapika remains on the defensive. He transfers the right to use Little Eye to Oito. Vincent is distracted by the situation, which he perceives to be Kurapika attacking Oito, which allows Bill to get close to him. Vincent attempts to fend off Bill, but Kurapika steals his aura, and he's restrained. To avoid being forced to confess to attempting an assassination, Vincent swallows a poison he had behind his back teeth. Kurapika decides not to report Vincent immediately as it would be ineffective and risky at the moment. Listening to the ordeal remotely, Balsamico and Benjamin discuss the nature of the guards' abilities. They struggle to understand what happened, but Balsamico theorizes that the guards lied verbally to mislead any eavesdroppers. Benjamin orders all guards to use Nan immediately after announcing the right to self-defense and sends Bobby Mina after Wobble. Kurapika decides Little Eye would best be used on Mariam's fat hamster at the next banquet, but due to time restraints, instructs Oito to use Little Eye on an insignificant insect like a fly to avoid suspicion. Despite the advantages of giving the dolphin his newly acquired ability, Kurapika decides not to do so because it would force him to say an Emperor time, which takes an hour from his lifespan every second he uses it. They receive a phone call which is a message from three princes, Benjamin, Zhang Lei, and Tubepa which presents an issue as choosing a prince with whom to talk first will imply an alliance with that prince. Additionally, Bobby Mina rings the doorbell, causing further pressure. Kurapika cannot comprehend why Benjamin would set an assassin and call at the same time, but he believes Zhang Lei and Tubepa want to learn more about Nen, meaning that no one in their troops has a Nen user. Kurapika orders Bill to remain with the soldier. Shimano connects Kurapika to Zhang Lei, much to his surprise. Zhang Lei asks why he was chosen over Benjamin, and Kurapika says it's because he perceives Zhang Lei to be more open to discussion due to his desire to learn about Nen. Zhang Lei invites Kurapika, Oito, and Wobble to his quarters. Kurapika then contacts Tubepa, whose guard Maurer offers a truce in exchange for information about guardian spirit beasts. Kurapika, preoccupied with Benjamin's guard in the upcoming meeting, informs Maurer of the circumstances, so Maurer gives him one hour to deal with the issue. Kurapika then interrogates Shimano about why she chose Zhang Lei. She justifies herself, saying that Benjamin is a callous individual and that he would likely have his captain of the guards act as a proxy. His intention is likely to kill Kurapika and herself in order to avenge Vinjin. As her desire strictly to live, she connected Kurapika to Zhang Lei, whom she perceives to be more of a humble individual, but not humble to the point where he would accept being spoken to second. Additionally, if Kurapika manages to get on his good side, he's likely to hold off killing them until later, if at all. Tubepa is a more patient individual and is strictly devoted to finishing off the princess older than herself while allowing the young ones to survive. Shimano dissuades Kurapika from allowing Bobby Mina to remain at the door since spurning his request would result in arrest by the royal army which would give Benjamin an opportunity to kill Oito and Wobble, and then pretend it was a murder-suicide on Oito's part. Kurapika informs Bobby Mina that he, the queen, and the prince are going to meet Zhang Lei. Bobby Mina decides to wait in the room while they are gone. Kurapika instructs Bill to tell Tupepa that the situation has been dealt with if she calls. The three enter Zhang Lei's chamber, where he greets them. 
Kurapika explains the basics of Nen and reveals the Guardian Spirit Beasts were assigned to the princes during the ceremony. Kurapika then asks Zhan Lei if he's willing to have the next part of the conversation in the room considering that the information could change the tide of the succession battle. Hanzo and Biski note that Mariam's Guardian Spirit Beast is growing, and one of Momose's guards plans to kill her in a way to make their work obvious to their employer, but not to the authorities. Kugetsu's guards Roji and Bachem discuss how they're the only two legitimately protecting her while the other guards are assassins. Kacho vehemently complains about the food prepared for her, much to the annoyance of her guards and servants. Hockenberg awakens from Sumler, where he finds his guards to be alive, suggesting to him that he merely dreamed of his guards' demise. Salisale invites his mother's anxiety, as he's rather frivolous about the succession battle, but he guarantees her that things would change in the next banquet. Lazarus smokes a healthy drug created by Basho, while discussing how he could distribute the drug as a therapy for addicts if he becomes king. Tyson lavishes her book, while Izanavi praises her attitude in such trying circumstances. Mar heads to Oito's room while Tabepa contemplates on how to get rid of Benjamin's guard Butch. Zerignitch trains in Nen with Theta, where she discovers that he's a Nen genius. Kurapika wraps up his conversation with Zhang Lei, and he sends his personal bodyguards Sakata and Hashito to assist Kurapika. Slaka notes that he's colluding with Unma's soldiers because they have mutual interests. Kovintoba stays with Zhang Lei while Slaka accompanies Sakata and Hashito under Queen Unma's orders. Camilla orders her mother to get close to Hulkenberg so she can kill him, as well as Benjamin. However, Benjamin's guards Musei eavesdrops on her conversation and plans to use his Nen ability to get physical evidence for her assassination plot. Benjamin comments that Kurapika is doing a good job of holding off his guards to force a stalemate. Kurapika returns along with the new guards. Slaka and Baba Mina conspire to keep tabs on Zhang Lei's guards. Kurapika frets over the difficulty of applying Sayert's Nen ability. Meanwhile, on one of the lower tiers, a passenger meets Krolo and remarks that Krolo looks as if he wants to kill someone. He suggests that Krolo should forget his worldly ties, but Krolo insists that ties are not forgotten. Rather, they are severed. Kurapika, Oito, Bill, and Shimano search for a small insect on which to use Little Eye, which earns the curiosity of Sakata and Slaka. However, their search is cut short when Maru arrives. Agreeing to divulge the nature of Nen, Kurapika has the guards and Oito convene in the back room so that Bill and Shimano can continue their search. While Presto explain why he moved rooms, Kurapika lies and says it was to reduce Oito's stress. Kurapika explains how the princess acquired Nen via the initiation, and the result was a protective force. Oito notices the cockroach near the door and stares at it, drawing everyone else's attention to it. Kurapika, needing to activate the ability on the cockroach immediately, deceives the guards by pretending to showcase the capabilities of Nen. Bill quickly catches onto Kurapika's ploy and pretends to shoot Aura at the cockroach as Oito activates her ability. Oito requests the rest, which allows her to control the cockroach without being noticed. Bill commands the cockroach to move in specific ways to prove that Nen was controlling it. Kurapika asks Bobby Mina to confirm the accuracy of his lesson, and Bobby Mina agrees. Kurapika tells the guards that he would be able to learn the basics in two weeks, allowing them to stand a chance in a Nen battle. Bobby Mina notices that Bill released the cockroach through a vent, and using his end, deduces that the cockroach is being used for surveillance. The cockroach enters Mariam's room, and Oito sees Mariam, his mother, and his guardian spirit beast. Oito uses Little Eye clandestinely to survey the rooms of the other princes, and records the information such that Bobby Mina cannot read it with his end. Kurapika is concerned about the consequences of using Emperor time for the extended period of time he did. Oito inspects Momose's room, only to find her being suffocated by a bodyguard. Oito warns Kurapika of Momose's plight, so he has Bill and Bobby Mina get in contact with Momose's operator. They're too late as Momose's already died. Bill reveals that the guards were outside her room when the murder happened. Momose's mother, Savanti, is advocating for the execution of the six guards since she believes they are complicit in the assassination. Sakata asks Kurapika why Momose's guardian spirit beast didn't protect her during the incident. Kurapika explains that because Momose retired to her bedroom earlier than usual, she must have been fatigued. Because the beast draws its power from the host, it means that a significant amount of her aura was taken by the beast for some other activity, and while she was weakened, the perpetrator stuck. Bobby Mina asks Oito why she took such an irrational approach to reveal Momose's situation. Oito explains that while this was a survival contest, she still has the humanity to care for someone else's daughter. Bobby Mina leaves the room and retracts his end. Oito goes back to surveying with Little Eye. Bill returns from a phone call and tells Kurapika that they would receive bodyguards from ten of the other princes, all of whom are likely to be stationed there to monitor Kurapika and Bill. The other hunters have agreed to the two-week timeline to teach Nen, although this could mean that many guards will be sent to learn Nen. Kurapika suddenly faints from the extended usage of Emperor Time, much to Bill's shock. Hanzo laments over his failure to protect Momose, and Biski comforts him. Hanzo deduces that the culprit used the clone to commit the murder, and arresting the six guards would only help vindicate them should another murder happen. Hanzo goes on to say that the murderer likely had to focus all their attention on the clone, and Biski continues the logic by saying it had to be an off-duty guard. Hanzo vows to avenge Momose and catch the criminal. Sredinich asks Theta about the amount of time required to learn Nen, referencing a message he heard from Zhang Lei stating that Nen can be taught in two weeks. He threatens her to tell the truth about the time needed to learn Nen. Theta responds that while it's possible, it's hazardous, and her method is best. Sarid Nitch's guardian spirit beast comes threateningly close to Theta as she promises that she's telling him the truth. Blood splatter then comes onto the ground. Kurapika regains consciousness after being unconscious for nine hours. Oito had also passed out as her condition is linked to Kurapika's. Kurapika urges Oito to survey Suridnich, to which Oito cynically asks if Kurapika is acting out of self-preservation. Kurapika justifies himself by explaining that the first two princes likely have Nen users in the ranks, and Oito has already established good relationships with Zhang Lei. Wobble suddenly shows affection for Kurapika, encouraging her to obey. 
Oito sends the cockroach through the vents to Surid Nichi's chamber, but Surid Nichi's Nen beast devours the bug, forcing Little Eye to end. Oito requests Kurapika to teach her Nen, but Kurapika reveals that she's already activated Nen by using Little Eye. The next day, the bodyguards and servants of several princes convene in Oito's room to learn Nen, and each thinks about how to gain leverage in the situation. Benjamin's bodyguard Furikov already knows how to use Nen, but is there to learn about Kurapika, and if Kurapika tries to fight, he would exercise his right to defend himself. Unbeknownst to everyone, a feminine doll easily reads Furikov by his aura and will appease to his demeanor with its Nen ability, Silent Majority. As Kurapika lays down a line of white tape, telling everyone not to cross it or they'll be asked to leave and force may be used, the still unknown person controlling Silent Majority says that the only ones that can see the marionette are themselves and Lobberry, and Lowberry, a servant of 10th Prince Kacho, the one possessed. One of Suri Dinch's bodyguard, Milhan, crosses the line to provoke Kurapika, but the situation is quickly resolved. The user of Silent Majority speaking to themselves says that everyone's attention was directed at Milhan, but he wasn't one of the 10 within range. They go on to say that if the marionette is deactivated without killing anyone, the curse rebounds to them. Furikov analyzes Kurapika, determining that he's most likely a conjurer by examining the aura around his body, particularly his right hand. While everyone begins introducing themselves in the main room, Bill is helping Oito with Nen. As instructed by Kurapika, Furikov approaches Bobby Mina and asks him why he releases his Nen. Bobby Mina shrugs it off, but Furikov says he needs Bobby Mina's report of the enemy's power. Bobby Mina tells him that Kurapika is the key and is most likely hiding other abilities besides forcing confessions. He still hasn't seen Wobble's Nen Beast and doesn't know Bill's ability, letting Furikov know that he'll form a plan after the next banquet. After the introductions, Kurapika asks the 16 students to raise their hands if they already know Nen. Furikov raises his hand, as does Bellarante, a hunter and bodyguard for the 13th Prince Mariam. As Lowberry wonders why they're here then, she looks back and sees the marionette, with a user of Silent Majority wanting her to attract everyone's attention. As Kurapika explains that both Furikov and Bellarante will judge his teaching, giving any advice when possible, and Furikov wonders what Lowberry is looking at. Lowberry begins directing everyone's attention to the marionette, but they see no one there. With everyone focused in that direction, one of the bodyguards, Berrigan, starts to act like he's choking, and the others notice something white around his neck as the life is drained out of him. The silent majority user monologues that there are four snakes in total, and if all four attack at once, they can drain the entire body of blood in 11 seconds. Sakada draws a gun and fires at the snakes on Berrigan, and asks that the royal army be contacted. Kurapika worries about the use of firearms, and that Gyo won't be enough to stay unharmed. Lowberry says that the weird woman's gone, with Kurapika now focused on finding who the assassin is among them. Giving her involvement in the death of Berrigan, Lowberry is restrained by Hashido, while Sakata contacts Supreme Magistrate Cleopatra, asking her to charge Queen Seiko with being an accomplice in Berrigan's murder and plotting to kill the 14th Prince Wobble. She denies his request, but an investigator will be sent to Seiko's residence to monitor for 72 hours. It's 9.45am on the second day of the voyage. Kurapika refuses to give the bodyguards their weapons back and gives them 15 minutes to decide if they wish to continue the training. Shurikov continues pressing Bamimaina on how he's handling his mission, but the latter says he'll handle it his way. As Shimano is preparing dinner, Bill and Kurapika sneak up on her, the latter with gun drawn and dousing chain out. He asks her if she attacked Berrigan, and if she can use Nen. She denies both, panicked, and Kurapika apologizes. Shimano wonders if it could have been Wobble's Nen Beast. But Kurapika explains that everyone, even those without Nen, saw the white snakes, but only a Nen user can see the prince's Nen Beasts. As the three discuss the situation, Kurapika realizes that if just one prince was able to withdraw from the contest, there's a possibility that all Nen Beasts might vanish. None of the remaining guards or servants left, and Kurapika instructs each to put their hands together in whatever way feels natural, giving different directions to the three Nen learning groups. In Tier 5, three thugs working for the Ruar family are extorting money from passengers trying to get to the dining hall. They're interrupted by Franklin, Finks, Nobunaga, and Feitan, who quickly deal with the thugs and extract information about the Mafia from them. There are three main families, the Ziyu, supported by Zhang Lei, the Hei Li, supported by Surijnich, and the Sha'ar, supported by Luzerus. They ask the thugs how they can get to the upper tiers, planning to get involved in the Mafia's dealings. In addition, Finks tells them to find everyone taller than 190 centimeters and to get their room numbers, attempting to track down Hisuka. Krolo and Machi meet up in a crowd of people, and each says that they're the ones who's going to kill Hisuka. In a large, ominous room filled with 14 capsules with one more in the center, King Nasubi looks upon the deceased Momose lying in one of the capsules and says to Nugui that she will become the foundation for the Tree of Kakin. At Kurapika's Nen training, Firakad sees two of Halkenberg's guards, more are than the others, and wonders why they're being so obvious if they said they didn't know Nen. They want to talk to Kurapika alone, and he says he'll talk to them after the session. Furikov continues analyzing the situation, saying that the two aren't self-aware and are either being manipulated or it involves Halkenberg's Nen Beast. He confirms Lowberry's arrest by the Royal Army and says there's one secret Nen user among the group who's hiding this fact well, and that they must be the assassin. The investigator sent by Cleopatra is questioning Queen Seiko, but she refuses to answer anything. She assures her she is protected under royal privilege, but she still refuses. In Prince Mariam's room, his Nen Beast has grown even larger, and Hanzo guesses that it's because of his sister Momose's death. Hanzo and Biski end their shift, and Hanzo readies to find Momose's killer, hoping it'll calm Mariam then Beast. Biski agrees to act as his lookout since no one can touch or talk to his original body or he'll be called back. Hanzo uses his ability, Hanzo Skill 4, and enters the cell of Tufti, one of the arrested bodyguards for Momose. Hanzo says Benjamin wants to see him, and that another guard is going to take the fall in a suicide note. But for court records, Hanzo needs to know the method of killing. Tufti reveals that his ability, the touch, allows a doppelganger of himself to do anything within 20 meters, as long as he's lying prone and has his eyes closed. 
As Tufti then wonders how Hanzo knew it was him, Hanzo suddenly takes out a rope and begins choking Tufti from behind, killing him. In Prince Sali Sali's quarters, Rihan observes the Nen Beast, which is closely linked to the prince's libido, and plans to destroy it as soon as possible. In Prince Tyson's quarters, she continues to get her guards to read the Book of Tyson, and Giuliano and Izanavi wonder what the Iwags are on their shoulders, thinking they're related to having favor with Tyson, since Benjamin's soldier's Ora has none on him. Back at Kurapika's Nen training, the session ends at 12.30 p.m., and Sakata is urgent about hearing the situation with Halkenberg's two guards. Yuhirai tells them that Halkenberg wants out of the contest, so they need more information on the Nen Beasts. He shows them his left hand in the mark of the feather and tells them what happened. Kurapika says memory revision is common in manipulator attacks and asks Yuhirai what he thinks the mark means. Yuhirai thinks it shows solidarity with and allegiance to Halkenberg. Kurapika points out that while the contest is the perfect opportunity to abolish the monarchy, which Halkenberg greatly desires, he doesn't want to achieve this by killing his own siblings. Kurapika determines that Yuhirai is only half awakened with Nen because of his connection to Halkenberg. He's also worried that Halkenberg's ability is too risky and could have severe consequences. Sakata and Yuhirai eventually agree that the lower ranking princes should band together, and Kurapika plans to make appeals to the other princes also hoping that it's possible to withdraw from the battle. After dealing with Tufti, Hanzo returns to Mariam's quarters to find the place completely empty except for the prince's Nen Beast, which is now smaller yet more sinister, ready to attack if Hanzo steps any closer. Outside her quarters, Second Prince Camilla approaches Muse and says she's on her way to kill Benjamin, telling him to help her or die. Muse immediately draws his gun, telling Camilla she's under arrest for conspiring to assassinate Benjamin, and that he's recorded her conversations. As Camilla continues to calmly walk forward, Muse worries that she's a counteractive type because she's closed off her aura with Zetsu, increasing the potential power of her counterattack. Hoping he'll be able to kill her, or at least find out her ability, Muse fires three shots, two in the chest and one in the head, as Camilla falls bloody to the floor. He realizes he can't let his guard down before fulfilling his conditions, and reaches down and touches her neck. Suddenly, a giant cat-like creature appears behind Muse and smashes him between its paws. It kneads him into a liquid which flows to its tail, and pours the substance into Camilla's mouth, bringing her back to life. Life. Camilla's ability, Cat's Name, is a counteract of Nen Beast that activates after death, reviving the user with the life of their attacker. Camilla says she doesn't need a guardian spirit beast, and that this ability makes her invincible. Her guards rush out, and Camilla tells them that Benjamin's soldier shot her and ran off, but her mother Dwazu tells them to let Camilla do as she pleases. On her way, she encounters two of Benjamin's guards, Fury Cobb and Wolf. Benjamin radios them to let her through and not attack her. Camilla suddenly shoots both men in the head, killing Wolf and crazing Fury Cobb, who use Nen to avoid a shot between the eyes. The two walk into Benjamin's quarters as the prince himself sits in the middle of the room. Benjamin refuses to go along with her charade, and Camilla fires multiple shots at her brother, all stopped by his Nen Beast. Out of bullets, Camilla yells at them to attack her, but Furikov calmly restrains her. They lock her in a cell, and Balsamico confirms to Furikov that Musei's ability, Secret Window, is already active in her. A small owl-like creature hovers near Camilla. It allows Musei to use three different birds as spies. The owl is activated by touch and can only be seen by the user, transmitting the target's every word and action to them telepathically. It's revealed that Benjamin's ability, Benjamin Baton, allows him to inherit the abilities of those who swore loyalty to him. They have to have graduated from the Kakin Royal Military Academy to be part of Benjamin's personal army. There are three stars on the palm of his right hand, below his index, middle, and ring fingers, signifying that he possesses the abilities of three of his soldiers, Vincent, Musei, and one who must have died before departure. The ability of his Nen Beast is still unknown. Hanzo attempts to enter room 1012, but the guards stationed there inform him that if the prince drops out of the contest, the residence is sealed and the phone lines cut. Hanzo then goes to Prince Wobble's quarters and informs Kurapika of the situation with Mariam. Given the strict hierarchy of queens and princes, they can't contact Mariam's quarters right away, but Shimano urgently tells them that Mariam's captain of the guards is online. Hanzo quickly runs over to the room 1013, but there's still no one there. Introducing himself as the 7th Queen Savanti's captain of the guards, Verge says there's something he wants to ask Kurapika. Asked by Kurapika where they are, Verge angrily replies that they're still in room 1013, and that he'll be asking the questions. Kurapika would prefer to talk to Biski since Verge is likely unaware of Nen, but informs him that the room is under someone's ability. Verge takes all this as an observed claim, and asks what the situation is with the six suspects of Momose's death. Kurapika informs him that they know the identity of the assassin, and asks Verge to trust them and form a coalition and ceasefire agreement, which they already have with the 3rd, 5th, and ninth princes. Verge pretends to go along with the Nen situation, but quickly returns to his angry self, citing the violent deaths that have occurred in Wobble's quarters, and how deceptive Kurapika could be. Kurapika gives in and reveals the identity of the assassin, and says Tufti committed suicide in his cell, leaving a note behind. Kurapika provides him with even more information that isn't public yet to gain his trust, but Verge continues his hostility, suggesting that the Hunter Association is using the Seed Urn ceremony to destroy Kakin from within. The call ends and Hanzo leaves, planning to look into things until he and Biski start their ship, and he'll run to his body. Sakata asks Kurapika to tell him about the situation with room 1013. Kurapika tells him what he knows, and he's surprised that Bobby Mina isn't interfering. It's been 37 hours and 30 minutes since the departure. The 11th Prince Fugetsu lies in bed, tears in her eyes and looking at a picture of her sister, Kacho. She notices a strange door on the wall, the exact one that was on the Magic Worm, a tunnel the twins would play when they were younger to pretend they could go anywhere. Fugetsu enters the door and goes through the tunnel, popping up from below Kacho's bed, who is also looking at pictures and crying. Startled after seeing her sister, Kacho signals for Fugetsu to stay quiet and head back before the guards find out. Melody notices Kacho's increasing heart rate, but Kacho puts up a front and Melody understands this. Melody decides to talk to her about Nen. In Prince Sali Sali's quarters, Rihan continues analyzing the Nen Beast. It's a manipulator, diffusive induction type, able to control people with the white smoke it emits from its many mounts. The more smoke someone breathes in, the more goodwill they'll have towards the prince. 
with the small clone of the main body eventually appearing above the head, which also emits smoke. Rihan goes into more and more detail because it's essential for his ability, Predator. Once he chooses a target and activates his Nen, a Predator begins growing inside. The Predator's effectiveness depends on the accuracy of Rihan's analysis and understanding of his target's ability. As a result, it's powerless against simple enhancement and a mission attack. While eating dinner in his quarters, Zhang Lei notices a coin dropping to the ground. The two guards present say it didn't come from them, but one of the guards, Koventoba, a soldier of Benjamin, knows that the coin dropped from the mouth of the prince's Nen beast, which dropped the coin the previous day as well. In her quarters, Tyson preaches about the power of love and the Book of Tyson to all her guards. Giuliano and Izanavi are still unsure about the little creatures on their shoulders but figure they can't be harmful since Tyson talks so much about love. It's revealed that Tyson's Nen Beast is an emitter, diffusive levy type. If one receives the Book of Tyson, the Iwa creature clings to them and collects aura in exchange for happiness, depending on how much they've read from the book. But if one breaks the book's soul taboo, severe punishment follows. Camilla's Nen Beast is a manipulator, coercive type. It's able to control someone if its conditions are met. Tobepa's is a transmuter, collaborative type. Needing a research partner for activation, it can create a variety of drugs inside its body, and Luzerus is a conjurer, with a pseudo-coercive manipulation ability. It sets a trap by conjuring their target's desires, and activates once the target falls for it. In Hulkenberg's quarters, all the guards stand around the prince in the moment of silence for Momose. Shikaku, Benjamin's soldier stationed there, notices that each guard's aura has risen now that they're all gathered together. It's revealed that Hulkenberg's Nen Beast is an enhancer, symbiotic type. The more people with the mark of the feather that gather under the prince, the higher their potential. Once the group assembles and activates its ability, it's among the top tier of Nen abilities. Panicked by this, Shikaku thinks he should kill Hulkenberg right after the moment of silence, but notices that the Nen Beast is watching him carefully. He deduces the memory revision aspect and worries that it could force him to attack Benjamin. Right as Shikaku backs off and realizes it's best to wait for backup, Benjamin radios to him after he feels a spike in aura. Shikaku explains the situation, and Benjamin now has Alkenberg to focus on, in addition to Suridnich and the assassin in Wobble's quarters. Not wanting to see any more of his siblings killed, Alkenberg prepares to go see his father again, which is forbidden outside of the banquets. Back in her room, Forgetsu tries to make the door appear again, but it doesn't work. Bisky wakes up Hanzo and he returns to his body, informing her about what's going on with the room and Mariam's Nen Beast. They're both worried about Verge, who doesn't want to let Bellarante go back to Karapika's classes after Berrigan's death. Bisky suggests that they could teach Nen here, but Verge continues to question the existence of absurd powers. Bisky changes into her true appearance and says she can't guarantee learning Nen in two weeks like Karapika, but can at least double physical abilities in a month. Verge is in disbelief, admiring her muscle tone and strength, and begs her to teach him Nen. He also agrees to send Bellarante back to Karapika's classes to get information on the other princes, not because he's accepted the existence of Nen. Bellarante opens the door and the hallway looks completely normal. Bisky explains the three categories of Nen space, permeable, one way, and they get confirmation that it's the third, when Bellarante's body begins to vanish once he steps outside the door and the room appears empty to him once he's in the hallway. Verge is again in belief, and Bisky begins their Nen training. Hulkenberg is denied in his attempt to see the king, and is told to wait until the next banquet. He says he'll keep coming back every day with a letter. Benjamin and Camilla sit in a courtroom, with one of Camilla's soldiers acting as her lawyer and Balsilmico acting as Benjamin's. The two go back and forth with Camilla's lawyer arguing that Benjamin is harboring Muse. Cleopatra orders that the royal family will perform a search of both quarters and both princes will be confined to the VVIP area, under surveillance until Muse is found. As they leave the courtroom, Benjamin keeps observing Camilla with secret window. It's 10.05 a.m. on the third day of the voyage. Kurapika and Sakata come upon Mew Han dead in the bathroom, another victim of Silent Majority. Kurapika is worried that everyone will think they're behind these murders, given the earlier dispute with Muhan. And that's exactly what happens. Bellarante speaks up and convinces the others to continue with their mission so the real culprit doesn't get away, and they don't disappoint their respective queens and princes. Kurapika takes him aside and personally thanks him. In exchange, Bellarante asks if he can borrow Bill for 10 minutes so he can give information to those of Marion's quarters, while not appearing to be talking to himself. Kurapika agrees, and Bellarante and Bill have their mock conversation in front of the room 1013. Kacho coarsely asks Melody to help her with her studies, and then begins using a device called Mosquitone to send out Morse code to Melody. She directs her to a cupboard in the kitchen, where she finds another Mosquitone device. Melody reads realizes that Kachun is doing everything she can to survive, and swears she'll protect her. In Zhang Lei's quarters, the prince finds another coin with a one on it, wondering if it's from an beast and what effect it has. Kovantor provides some information about conjured objects, and surmises that the coins must have an effect that's unique to Nen. It's revealed that Zhang Lei's beast is a conjurer, compound type. Someone who possesses a coin will obtain various abilities after fulfilling specific conditions. Late at night on the fourth day of the voyage, Fugetsu stays away trying to figure out exactly how the door works, saying she'll save Kacho with her magic. In room 104, Suridich continues his Nen training with Theta. Dungeon informs him that Muhan had been killed, and it involved Nen. He surmises that they're teaching Nen to create a stalemate among the various groups. Suridich agrees, but wonders what if the act of teaching is a condition to manipulate people with a Nen ability. Theta is terrified by how quickly the prince can consider the complexities of Nen. She's covered a wound on her face previously infected by his Nen beast, and guesses that it must be a requirement of the creature. Suridich tells Danjin that if he continues, he'll need to bring something back to prove his innocence once the class is end, regardless of whether the Nen training is successful or not. Theta thinks to herself that she should have enough time to teach him Zetsu in the 11 days remaining before Karapika's Nen class is end. Suridich thinks he's ready for the water divination, and Theta eventually gives in, realizing it would be beneficial to know his Nentite. After the prince uses his aura on the water, it begins to darken and bubble, emitting a foul smell and breaking up the leaf in the center. Theta has never seen anything like this, confirming that he's a specialist and a sinister one at that. 
Kacho asks about her mother and Fugetsu and her putting on a musical show at the banquet. Her mother Seiko thinks that's wonderful and will make another appeal to their father. But Kacho assures her that she's willing to fight in this battle to decide the king of Kakin, bringing her mother to tears. Seiko leaves and Kacho then starts badmouthing her mother behind her back, in front of the investigator, putting up a front. During this, she starts sending code to Melody and the arrangements for the banquet next Sunday, where they plan to play the performance over the speakers across Tier 1 and for the king to keep it a surprise. As Melody hopes that the two will be able to escape from the ship, a fellow guard and hunter, Kini, approaches Melody and informs her that with his nan, he detected a head pop out from Kacho's bed earlier. The two agree that it was most likely Fugetsu, and Kini's worried that if anyone finds out that the two lack a combat ability, they'll become targets. Melody focuses on securing the route and timing for the escape, but is concerned that they haven't seen Kacho's nan piece even once. In the central dining hall at Tier 5, the 10 current members of the Phantom Troop have assembled. Crawler says they still don't know which tier Hisoka is in, but found out that the movement between tiers 3 and 5 is limited by the Mafia, with the three main families controlling a tier each. Multiple men with rose tattoos approach the troop as Krolo asks Ilumi to introduce himself to the others and tell them what he thinks Hisoka may be doing. Ilumi gives a quick introduction and says he joined the spiders on Hisoka's commission since both knew that they would end up killing each other. Ilumi's commission target is Hisoka himself, and the two have a prenup where Ilumi will be paid once Hisoka dies. They're both taking this seriously, so Ilumi doesn't know where he is. One of the men with tattoos tells Krolo to leave the table. Krolo refuses, and the man recognizes them as a phantom troop. He thanks them for the madness they caused in York New City, offering to help them if they leave the table. The spiders all stand, and Krolo tells him they're looking for someone named Hisoka. The man says he can check the passenger list, but doesn't expect he'd be on there. He asks the troop to join them, and he'll offer them tickets to access tiers 3 and 4. Krolo again refuses, and the troop leaves. The man asks one of his comrades, Sunbin, if they should worry about them. Sunbin says they'll go wherever they please, and worries the whole thing will come crashing down if they reach the upper tiers of the ship. Finks noticed that the man gave himself away when Krolo mentioned Tier 1, and that there must be a treasure. Krolo says their first priority is fighting Hisuka, telling them to do as they please in order to bring Hisuka's head. The spiders go their separate ways, but Shizuku and Bonolodov ask Krolo if they can team up with him since their abilities don't work well against Bungie Gum. Krolo agrees, but his condition is that he gets to kill Hisuka himself. Shizuka plans to look for Hisuka in disguise, and Bonolonov tells Krolo that he can take many forms using Battle Cantabile, Metamorphosin, but isn't sure how to best utilize it. Krolo tells him there's something he wants him to do. Shizuka then asks if Krolo can read their fortunes again, but Krolo says the ability disappeared from his book, insinuating that Neon Nostrad is dead. The head of the Ziyu family, Onuar Longbao, and the head of the Sha'ar family, Rocco Lee, both half-brothers of King Nasubi, are discussing the situation with the spiders and how to keep them under control. They order their respective underbosses, Hinrai and Kenny each brief their subordinates on the mission, and say they'll take care of things once Hisuka is found. Morina Prudo, the boss of the Hei Lee family, an illegitimate daughter of Nasubi, addresses her 22 subordinates who were forced to kill each other, comrades, until only this number remained. She asks each to come forward so she can grant them an ability. A young woman approaches, and Morina kisses her on the lips. Through her ability, Contagion, Morina uses her saliva to affect up to a maximum of 20 three individuals, including herself. Each infected levels up as they kill, increasing their aura and power. They gain a unique ability upon reaching level 20 and can create their own community of infected at level 100. Herself at level 95, Morna informs them that killing a civilian is worth one level. Those with Nen abilities 10, and a prince 50. Three mafia bosses all have a scar of two slashes somewhere on their face, and it's explained that this marks them as illegitimate children of the king, unable to become rightful heirs. This scarring is done at birth, and they're only allowed to live as long as they agree to do so in the shadows. But Morina likes her scar, and it's what keeps her going so she can tear down the cruel world around her. Nomonaga, Finks, and Phaeton plan to head to Tier 4, leaving the bottom tier to Boar family. Nobunaga explains that the Char'ar control all commodities in Tier 5, the Ziyu trafficking of humans and goods in Tier 4, and the Haley act as go-betweens for the upper and lower tiers in Tier 3. But before going up, Nobunaga needs to get his katana from the warehouse. Finks says he needs something as well, and Phaeton needs his umbrella, which was hidden in with smuggled goods. Finks and Phaeton say they need to stay together so Hisuka has absolutely no chance if they find him. They're led in by a group of thugs, and one leads them through the warehouse to the weapons. But as the thug turns the corner, he completely vanishes from Nobunaga's end. They look around the corner and see no one. Turning back, they find the thug with his throat slit. Finks and Phaeton just move on since a corpse can't help them, and Nobunaga feels out of place. Someone's hand begins making an opening, as the focus shifts to the general passenger area in Tier 3. Mizaistam comes upon a crime scene with 20 victims. A man disguised himself as a soldier and killed them with a blade. There was one witness who says the attacker was 185 to 190 centimeters tall, with a crescent scar on the left side of his face. Mizaistam plans to talk to the witness as the focus shifts back to the warehouse where the man with the crescent scar watches the three spiders from an opening he's created in the ceiling. A member of the Hailey family, and currently level 21 after his killing spree, Luini hopes that he and the troop members can destroy the world together. Mizaistam interviews the witness, who details her encounter with the killer. The man let her go and somehow escaped from the bathroom, which was still locked from the outside. Given this and the fact that he was talking about levels and numbers of people, Mizai Sam surmises that this must involve Nen. The woman gets emotional over the death of one of the victims, and Mizai tells her to go rest before they talk again. It's revealed that the woman, Kashu, is a member of the Heilu family, still level 1, and she planned this whole stunt with Lini because the latter wanted to find out how good the officials were at investigation. Kashu says she'll take things slowly when it comes to leveling up. Talking to himself, Luini says that if he's in a closed room with one door and impenetrable walls, he can make an opening in the walls or floors, only able to go somewhere he's been before. 
He's able to return to the original room at any time, but if the door to the room is opened, his ability resets and he can never use that room again. He's unsure if he can use it to go outside of the ship, concerned that the ability will get reset while he's out there. The three spiders make their way back to the warehouse entrance and find all the thugs went following a blood trail leading down the hallway. The three carefully consider the situation, with Finks determining that the person doing all this wants a confrontation with the char R. The blood trail ends at a locked door with security cameras. At the end of the hallway, Kenny Wang and four char members with machine guns block the exit. He asks them if they attack the guards in the warehouse. At the tier 5 cafeteria, Franklin sits alone while eating a meal. He's approached by five men, one of whom sits across from him at the table. The char R, consigliere of the char R family, asks him why he's not looking for Hisuka. Franklin says that Hisuka is looking for them as well, so if he waits, Hisuka will come to him. Itoku tells him about the dead warehouse guards, but Franklin says they had nothing to do with that, unless the guards themselves started it. Before leaving, Itoku asks if the choke came on board just for Hisuka, and Franklin says they're still thieves, but with their focus on Hisuka first. Back with the three spiders, Kenny realizes that they weren't involved, and says that someone at the base let in a man carrying a bloody guard. The man's face too bloody to recognize, and saying that the spiders did it. Kenny guesses it's a hitman from another family who desires conflict, and Fink said that maybe he needed to get inside the room so that he can mark it for the teleportation ability, explicitly mentioning Nen. Kenny asks if they would like to work together, while also thinking to himself that the spiders can't be controlled and needs to be eliminated. Speaking to a large group of cocky and military officials, Misai-san brings up the recent murderers on Tier 3, stressing that it seems to be the work of multiple serial killers and is connected to the seed urn ceremony. The officials are outraged that he would suggest that a prince is involved, but Misai-san explains that if a prince was actually behind these murders, it wouldn't be a problem since the prince are exempt from all repercussions for their actions besides directly killing another prince, and he and the Kakin officials would need only to set up someone as a true culprit. Since the princes are so well protected, others may be driven to kill in order to gain favor from them. Given the ancient nature of the cedar and ceremony, it's only natural that they would believe they can gain supernatural power through ritual sacrifice, and the killers aboard the ship may hope to gain powers this way as well. Misai Sum stresses that the crimes will only increase, causing the 200,000 passengers to panic and riot out of fear. He suggests sending 800 soldiers to the lower tiers to stop the killings and calm down any panic from the passengers. The officials quickly object, but Mizai reminds them that Benjamin is the head of national defense and would agree with him. He sees the issue mentioned in the minutes of the meeting, they'll all be punished. The meeting ends and Mizai's thumb feels bad about having to phrase things the way he did, but Botobai assures him that it was the best option without explaining Nen. Botobai plans to get in contact with various hunters on the ship, as well as to issue a gag order for the Kakian officials. In the Char-R base on Tier 5, Kenny leads the three spiders inside and shows them the security footage of the culprit, who made sure his face was kept hidden. There's an ominous door in the base which the culprit tried to enter in the footage. Kenny asks the spiders if they want to see what's inside, and Nobunaga offers to kill the culprit in exchange. Kenny agrees and introduces them to some Char-R members. The supervisor, Sudonke, Tells them that there are around 250 total Char members on board, secretly hoping to chat with them one at a time since he's a big fan of the spiders. A large overview of the Black Whale is shown, detailing the current locations of many notable characters. It's 10 a.m. on the fourth day of the voyage. In Tier 3, an announcement goes over the intercom that a stowaway with a weapon is on the loose, and all passengers should stay in their cabins unless escorted by the military to the dining hall. Botobai leads a group of soldiers who sweep the tier looking for anyone without an ID ticket. On the observation deck, they come across two individuals holding them at gunpoint. It's Ilumi and Kalito Zoldik. Kalito says they were asleep and didn't hear the announcement. Ilumi offers his ticket, and a soldier wonders why a VVIP is down in his tier. Ilumi says he has official business down here. The soldiers inform him that the passage between tiers 2 and 3 may be closed for the duration of the voyage, but Ilumi is adamant about staying in tier 3. Mizai Stem and Botobai take it from here, as the former asks if the spiders are on the ship. Ilumi says they're all on board, and Kalito wonders why he told him that. Ilumi says he'll stay quiet from now on, and Mizai Stum offers the two a room at the central police station. Mizai Stum had known that Kalito had joined the spiders, but didn't know about Ilumi, and wonders what they could be plotting. He remembers their connection to Kurapika, and worries that the troop may be here to exact revenge on him. As Mizai Stum considers whether he should tell Kurapika about the troop, an official approaches him and says they found someone without a ticket. Mizai Stum is startled and quickly returns to HQ, leaving the Zoldix and Botobai and Ginta. The female passenger without a ticket is mentioned, one that several soldiers recognize. Mizai Stum orders the gag order to be imposed on the soldiers and that they are to be put into custody from now. Mizai Stum approaches the person and it's revealed to be Prince Fugetsu. In the central police station on Tier 3, they confirm with those in her quarters that Fugetsu isn't there, discussing how she got here through no existing corridors. Mizai Stum tries to question her, assuring her of confidentiality and that they're here to help her, but Fugetsu says she'll only talk to Kacho. The hunter working with Mizai Sum contacts Melody and informs her about the situation, telling her the twins are most likely plotting an escape and to continue assisting Kini in preventing this. An exchange is shown between Melody and Kini, with no words given. Melody seems startled, but after Kini walks away, she says to herself that they still have to proceed. As Mizai Sum escorts Forgetsu back up to her quarters, she thinks to herself about her ability. She creates the initial door, and once she reaches her destination, the return door appears which only Kacho can open. As long as they close the door, they can use the return door to go somewhere else, resembling one of their favorite games when they were younger. The investigator tells Fugetsu she'll have an escort for 72 hours and can still attend the Sunday banquet. In Kacho's quarters, Melody plays a piece on the flute for Seiko and the investigator. Seiko hopes to hear more of her playing at the banquet, and says she'll arrange for the broadcast they discussed earlier. Melody and the investigator walk off together, with the latter offering to protect Kacho until landing. 
Melody says it can draw suspicion, and the investigator agrees. However, he continues to offer his support in keeping both Kacho and Melody safe, saying he feels he has to do something. As he leaves, Melody reads his heartbeat, describing it as he's trying to suppress his emotions while on the job, and not ruling out the possibility of him being manipulated. She says 76 hours are left until the banquet. In Solid Solid Quarters, Rihan notices that Koro Abde has become a supporter of the prince, now affected by the Nen Beast. Rihan has all the information he needs, describing the Nen Beast and how it works in thorough detail, the necessary conditions for his ability. He calls forth the Predator. A four-legged creature with long black hair and a giant mouth full of razor-sharp teeth appears. It first destroys the clone above Koro Abde's head, ending his infatuation with the prince. As Sale Sale lies in bed with two women, his Nen Beast floating above them, the Predator leaps towards it and devours it whole. Once his predator finishes a mission, Rihan is unable to use his Nen for 48 hours. He radios to Benjamin's quarters that he's disposed of the Nen Beast, requesting to sub out for Yushohi. Rihan will now go to Fugetsu's quarters. Yoshihi's ability is the best among Benjamin's soldiers for assassination, and it should be easy to take out Sale Sale without his Nen Beast. Yoshihi radios to Rihan, informing him of Fugetsu's translocation ability and telling him that she may be able to become invisible as well. Rihan is slightly upset since its ability is predicted on he himself finding out the information on another's ability, worrying that Predator could get neutralized. Yoshihi's ability, How to Get Away with Murder, involves the use of Stinger Ball that must go unnoticed by the target, taking longer on those who aren't end users while Yushohi remains close within 20 minutes. If the ball is found and removed, it'll never work on the target again. It's also a good way of detecting Nen users since they'll react to the buzzing near the air. Yushohi is contacted about switching with Rihan now that Sali Sali's Nen Beast is gone. He enjoys taking his time but enjoys the moment his target dies even more. It's announced over the intercom that they've caught the stowaway and the lockdown order is lifted, allowing the passengers to move about the ship again. It's 8pm on the fifth day of the voyage. There are 72 hours left until the Sunday banquet. Hulkenberg once again attempts to see the king, with the soldiers expecting yet another letter. But he and his five guards draw their guns, holding the soldiers at gunpoint as the prince makes his way, guns still drawn, into his father's chamber. Nasubi says it's too late since he's already consented to the ritual. But Hulkenberg was never told the siblings were going to kill each other. He orders him to suspend the contest or he'll shoot, but Nasubi refuses, saying that Hulkenberg needs to participate and take action. Hulkenberg fires one shot at Nasubi and a bullet appears suspended in midair inches from his face. Nasubi says one must fire three shots when trying to kill, telling him that he can't die until the ritual ends. Nasubi's butler enters, informing Hulkenberg that he and his guards won't be punished for their actions since this was all expected. But suddenly, Hulkenberg turns his gun on himself, firing one shot. His Nen B stops the bullet inches from his head, and Nasubi asks him if he's awake now, bringing up the prisoner's trolley problem. Hulkenberg wonders if he means that he has to choose either the citizens of Kakian or his siblings. His binary way of thinking disappoints Nasubi, who stresses that the country and its people are what matters most, with the question being who pulls the lever. The only way for him to change the country is to become king, and Nasubi challenges Hulkenberg to tell him that he doesn't need a king after he becomes one. In Hulkenberg's quarters, Benjamin radios over Shikaku about the situation with Hulkenberg and the king. Shikaku normally wouldn't be sleeping when Hulkenberg's away, so he thinks the Nen Beast must have attacked. Benjamin tells him that Hulkenberg failed to kill the king, but he's now resolved to go all out in the contest. Hulkenberg and his guards return, and Benjamin orders Shikaku to obtain his ability. Aura swells around Hulkenberg, and it's revealed that his follower's aura turns into armor for the prince as well as an arrow. Hulkenberg's own aura becomes a bow to fire the arrow. When the arrow is shot, it pierces any manner of defense and steals the enemy's will in exchange for the body of one of his followers. During the shot, Chicago attempted to use his own ability, Cold Sept, which apparently turns another's ability into a card to use, but since the arrow is unblockable, it broke the card and pierced Chicago. Benjamin's shoulder rises from the floor, addressing Hulkenberg as your highness and asking for his orders. Behind Chicago, there stands a specter of Hulkenberg's sacrifice guard, insinuating that this guard's consciousness now inhabits Chicago's body. Kurapika feels this second spike and rumbling of aura. The first was when Hulkenberg and his guards had their moment of silence for Momose's death. The assassin hasn't attacked in a while, but Kurapika wonders about this new threat, especially if it's only one person with that much power. In Sale Sale's quarters, the prince lies asphyxiating in bed, with one of his girls attempting CPR as Yushohi looks on and radios to Benjamin. It's now 8pm on the 8th day. Nasubi, Melody, Kacho, and Fugetsu are all shown in a large ballroom as the Sunday banquet begins. As the attendees take their seats and pick up refreshments, it's announced that the first Sunday banquet will feature a concert hosted by the royal family. But Prince Sale Sale isn't feeling well and will not perform. Kacho and Fugetsu are told about the program changes, but it doesn't change the order of performances. Melody is confident about their plan, glad that Benjamin and Camilla are not present since both are probably Nen users. As various groups perform on stage, their focus shifts on Mariam's quarters, where an unnamed hunter is worried that the servants at the banquet won't be able to return to the Nen space. Verge assures them it's for the best, and thinks that the prince and others will be able to stay safe in the fake room 1013 until they land. Bisky agrees, though, suggests sending the hunters assigned to Mariam to the real 1013 in order to lessen any suspicions. She says she'll stay there once the prince has taken a liking to her. Verge watches on as Mariam plays on Bisky's shoulders. Back at the banquet, Kini finishes up a piano solo and Melody bows in front of the king before her flute solo. Both Kacho and Fugetsu put earbuds in, 
telling a soldier that they're preparing for their act. Melody says that for three minutes, she can entrance everyone who listens. She begins playing the flute, and a wide vista of mountains, flowers, and butterflies surround everyone. The music plays over the speakers, and even the guards outside the banquet hall are entranced. Kini leads the twins to the lifeboat, explaining to them that they should only use their ability when they think they're going to get caught. The ability should work on the lifeboat, and he tells them to imagine Kakin. But if the door doesn't appear, they should go back to their bedroom, assuring them that they'll find another way. Once the twins are aboard the boat, Kini cocks a handgun, and the missing dialogue from the earlier exchange between him and Melody is given. Kini had a wife and daughter who died two years ago in an accident. He had been looking for a place to die, saying that if it's found out that a hunter helped two princes escape, the entire association would be affected. He hopes to see his family again, glad that he can help save the twins' lives. Melody continues playing, saying she couldn't stop him once she heard his heartbeat, and Kini shoots himself in the head. The lifeboat races down the escape tunnel, and right as it nears the exit, a swarm of shadowy hands surround the two. Kacho realizes that for the princes, trying to escape from the ship only leads to death. They hurry away from the hands and forget to summon the door to return to the ship. They race towards it, the door slamming shut, and forget to find herself alone in the tunnel, crying for her sister. But the door suddenly opens and Kacho appears, the two embracing and deciding to lay low before trying another plan. The Nen beasts of both princes are cooperative, with Fugetsu's being the tunnel and Kacho's indeterminate. Fugetsu's guardian spirit beast ability, Magical Worm, allows her to control the journey outward, with Kacho controlling the return. As the two enter one of the bedrooms and lie down beside each other, it's revealed that the ability of Kacho's Nen beast, without you, activates if either of the two die, taking the form of the deceased to protect the other until her death. The body of the real Kacho is shown still on the lifeboat as it drifts out to sea. A flashback 21 hours and 30 minutes ago, before the Sunday banquet, the Char's second search for the hitman Luini was again unsuccessful. Kenny Wang tells another man as they entered the Char base through the ominous door mentioned earlier. They're worried that the army may suspect the mafia soon, which would lead to the search of the Haley's hideout as well as their own. The man Kenny was talking to, Ta Zhao, is revealed to be the assistant of the Char boss, as well as the military advisor for Luzerus' army. They describe the situation to him. The Haley hitman can use something called Nen. Eight members of the Char and Ziyu family each have gone missing, and 300 workers are missing in total. Kenny thinks the man who went on a killing spree in Tier 3 has come down to Tier 5 with accomplices to continue the murders. Tachao wonders how that involves the spiders, and Finks tells him about the search for Hisuka and that they want to search for him on the higher tiers. If the Char can get the Ziyu in Tier 4 to let the troops search there, they'll eliminate the hitman for them. Finks tells him about the likely Nen ability the culprit is using, and that he probably wants access to the ominous door, which he guesses is a shortcut to the upper tiers. Taja says that Haley have their own door through Serednich, but Finks says that maybe the hitman wants to kill the Char boss. Kenny asks Taja to check with Boss Lee to see if Morena is in tier 1. Taja tells the troop that if Morena isn't up there, it'll be an all-out war. Kenny explains that the Kakin Mafia has a code. If a member wishes to make a hit or a raid on another family, they have to inform their boss before doing so, who then contacts the boss of the other family within 24 hours to make a deal. Tajo adds that it's key that the boss was away from their turf when the initial incident occurred. Nobunaga surmises that on the ship, only tiers 1 and 2 are considered away from their turf. Tajo confirms this, saying that if Morena was in tier 3 and doesn't make contact, there's nothing they can do to stop the war. And if the troop were to take out the hitman, they would also be at war with the Haley. Upon hearing this, Nobunaga decides it makes most sense to go after Morana herself as well. Finks asks them about verifying her location, saying they'll contact the rest of the troop and hunt down the hitman first. Both Kenny and Tajao realize how dangerous the spiders are. The bosses of the Ziyu and Char'ar are shown in their respective quarters on Tier 1, but Morana's room has no one in it. All three are known as second-track fakers, having lavish accommodations, but this is only if they maintain absolute obedience to the Kakin monarchy system. Someone calls Serednich about Morana's location, and he confirms she's not in the VVIP area. He tells them that she's most likely on the lower tier since boarding, hidden with help from her butler. He says they can do as they please and he'll address the issue when he's free. As his guards mop up a pile of blood and guts, with bloody weapons sitting nearby, he orders them to get the soldiers in the lower tiers to search Morana's hideout. Serednich resumes his Nen training, creating a massive dark aura behind him that turns into another Nen beast. Theta is horrified by the aura, saying that his guardian spirit beast was created through ritual, but the specialist Nen beast was conjured without intent and that it represents his own alter ego created through instinct. Extremely worried that she'll miss her chance if she waits too long, she applauds his progress and decides to move on to teaching him the four major principles. Ten, Zetsu, Ren, and Hatsu. He'll have to practice each one every day to strengthen his Hatsu, but she stresses that Zetsu is the key to mastering Nen. She tells him to close off his aura in sections, and then to do so for his old body for more than an hour. The Guardian Spirit Beast becomes suspicious of Theta, who says to herself that this training is necessary for learning Nen, and she hasn't told a lie. The Nen Beast backs off and Serednich works on his Zetsu. Theta says she can do it tomorrow if she has to. Another flashback to 25 minutes before the Sunday banquet. Theta works with Serednich on his Zetsu, telling him to close his eyes, focus, and maintain it for 60 minutes while ignoring all sounds and disturbances. She says there's something on his shoulder, and he lets a little aura slip, but Theta says the enemy will be harsher. Serednich refocuses as his Nen Beast slowly disappears behind him. Theta talks to herself, detailing her plan to kill the prince. She considers the possibility that his Nen Beast may hold a reserve of aura that he could use even when he's maintaining solo Zetsu, so she thinks she must have him maintain it for at least 40 minutes. As she drops a mug to the floor, shattering it, two guards rush into the room, but she orders them not to interrupt since it's part of the prince's training. Serednich starts over and gets serious this time, saying he won't open even one pore. Theta begins by flicking a small ball of aura at its forehead. It pops upon impact, and the prince appears to open his eyes, closing them again. More time passes, and Theta quietly draws a handgun, but there's an announcement that a surprise performance from the banquet hall will play over the speakers, the first act being a flute solo by Melody of the Hunter Association. 
the prince's eyes remain closed, and as she wishes that he were the type to use his talents for others, Theta fires one shot at his head, saying that she will follow him soon. Sarednich so falls to the floor, blood and brains splatter behind him, but suddenly the two are surrounded by a vista of mountains and flowers and butterflies. The prince's body no longer lies on the floor, and Theta is in disbelief. The two guards brush back in after hearing the gunshot and orders her to freeze. As she wonders if it's his ability, the prince appears behind her, assuring the guards that it was part of the training and telling Theta he was unfazed by the gunshot. She falls to her knees, looking ill, and Sarednich's Nen Beast bends down near her, telling her that if she lies to the prince once asked the question, she will no longer be human. Theta falls down to the floor, passing out. One of the prince's guards tell him about hearing the gunshot and then immediately seeing a beautiful landscape. They were unable to move as time passed, guessing it was due to the performance of this person named Melody. So Rydnich says to call her over, and to make it sound like an invitation rather than a summons. As Theta sleeps, she has a nightmare of the prince's head on his Nen Beast, a bullet hole through his head as he asks her if he can trust her, referencing a question that the prince actually asked her. Salkov sits by her bed as she wakes up, saying she was only asleep for 15 minutes. He says he'll take things from here and she should rest, as what looks like an affection covers the left side of her face, around the area where the Nen Beast first attacked her. Salkov says that the Nen Beast marked her for the first lie, and now this is a warning. He guesses that it's giving those who lie so many chances because it plans to add them to the prince's pawns by turning them into something inhuman. He assures her he'll figure something out, and Theta wonders what, with Salkov hoping she could figure it out while she rests. Theta is still in disbelief over the incident, and Salkov tells her that there was no blood when he tested the spot for Luminol. But she did fire the gun and tries to figure out what was real and what was an illusion. It's the ninth day since departure, in the Justice Bureau in Tier 2. The still unharmed investigator is questioning Melody about the banquet. He tells her that Keeney left a suicide note explaining that he alone was involved in the twins' escape. The investigator adds that a few of the princes were impressed by her performance and have invited her to their quarters. Melody realizes that she's being held to protect her from the more dangerous princes. She asks about the twins, and he says they are also answering questions, having said that Keeney tried to force them aboard the lifeboat. He isn't exactly sure about the situation and will continue questioning with them. Melody decides to use her time in custody to plan out her next moves. In Halkenberg's quarters, the guard named Sumidori, who was sacrificed so that the prince could shoot an arrow lies on the table, wearing a device on his head to monitor brainwaves. There's nothing unusual, and he's apparently just asleep. Their understanding is that Sumidori's soul has possessed Shikaku's body, which Sumidori Shikaku confirms, saying it doesn't feel too different from his own body. But they wonder where Shikaku is, with Halkenberg suggesting four options. Shikaku's soul is gone and he's dead, his soul is in Sumidori's body, the two coexist within Shikaku's body, it's somewhere or in someone else. They plan to learn what's going on with Shikaku's soul. Halkenberg tells them that after the confrontation with his father, he gained the resolve to do what he has to, and the ability awakened with him. Halkenberg shares his hypothesis with them, saying he'll have to contact an expert on Nen to see if it's possible. He asks Sumidori Shikaku for his help, and he gladly obliges. In Luzerus's quarters, Basho feels a rumbling of aura from Halkenberg's room, and the doorbell then rings. It's Sumidori Shikaku, and they ask him what he wants. He salutes and exclaims, Long live his highness, First Prince Benjamin! Putting a gun to his head, he pulls the trigger and falls to the floor. In disbelief, the royal bodyguard watching the monitor says he killed himself. Basho feels the rumbling stop. Balsamico informs Benjamin that Chicago has committed suicide, most likely due to Halkenberg's Guardian Spirit Beast ability. The two agree that he's now the top priority, and Benjamin orders that Kanjidal return from Luzerus's quarters to report everything he witnessed. Back in Halkenberg's quarters, they've tied Sumidori's body to a chair as he wakes up. Halkenberg asks him for his post and service number to confirm whether Sumidori's soul has returned or not. In Wobble's quarters, both Kurapika and Bill felt the rumbling of aura, the latter guessing it was from the ninth, seventh, and fifth prince. Sakata asks if it could have been from Zhang Lei, but Kurapika says it wasn't his Nenbi Stora. A large amount of energy disappeared instantly, like a balloon popping, and Kurapika says this is common with emission abilities, which can often go through physical barriers. There's one week left for the Nen training, and Sakata tells them that the others are starting to question whether this will actually work. Kurapika says they'll move to the next step tomorrow, bringing everyone together as he performs the water divination test. The water changes color and the leaf starts spinning. With Kurapika explaining that this determines an N type, and telling them that his ability is of a specialist type, it can only be done if one can produce enough aura, and Kurapika chooses to start with Latiolus, who has been the quickest to learn. Bobby Mina notices that in an attempt to spur on the others, Kurapika picks someone smaller and weaker to show that gender and physical strength aren't related to Nen talent. Kurapika plans to perform water divination behind closed doors so that everyone's den is kept confidential. Satobi objects to this, and Donjin is also suspicious. Kurapika explains that to achieve learning Nen in the two-week period, they'll be performing the test in a way that requires assistance from him and Bill. In addition, Kurapika and Bill learning the Nen types is payment given the risk. Lastly, he assures that they're teaching them Nen in order to empower the guards, the lower-ranked princes, so a stalemate can be created, telling them to quit right there if they disagree with the terms. Furikov and Bobby Minus stand off to the side, glad to learn that Kurapika is a specialist. They discuss Rihan's ability, saying that after dealing with Salir Salir's Nen Beast, he's now monitoring Tubepa, whose Nen Beast isn't showing itself. Furikov asks about Wobble's Nen Beast, but Bobby Minus says it still hasn't revealed itself, whether because Wobble is too young or it's a counter-attacking type. In Sorednich's quarters, Salkov is now helping the prince with his Nen training, shocked that he's working on the four major principles in only a week. Sorednich is working on entering Zetsu as quickly as he can, telling Salkov to time him, and when he could do so in less than a second, the two will spar. He tells Salkov that he's had a change of heart, and he now finds two-faced women cute. Flashback to 25 minutes before the Sunday banquet, this time with events from Surednich's perspective. 
Once he closes off all his aura, he suddenly sees an overhead view of himself and Theta, with static all around like he's watching a television screen. He and Theta talk in the exchange he's watching, and wonders if it's a dream. He loses Zetsu, and Theta repeats the exact line she said in the vision, even when he changes his own dialogue. The vision lasted 10 seconds, and he guesses it was some sort of precognition. It starts once he closes his eyes and achieves Zetsu, but he worries that he can't move during the dream, being defenseless for 10 seconds so he can see 10 seconds into the future. He enters Zetsu again and maintains it past the previous point, realizing he can move now and that he can stay 10 seconds ahead of the actual events. Theta sees him as it was in the vision, and he realizes that he's the only one who can change what he does within those 10 seconds. He wonders if it will reset once he opens his eyes while in Zetsu and talks to her, then closing his eyes again. Theta still sees him with his eyes closed and doesn't react to his comments. He closes his eyes and confirms he can do it in a row. He says Theta draws her gun and shoots him in the head. He quickly opens his eyes, darting to the side and falling to the floor, but he realizes that Theta will think he's still standing there and that she shot him. Theta fires and the beautiful vista of Melody's playing suddenly surrounds them. So Nitch is confused at first but realizes this is another person's ability, excited by how fun Nen is. The aftermath plays out exactly as before and he thinks that he'll ask Theta later why she tried to kill him. After she's led away, he goes over in great detail how he thinks his ability works, and that he needs to test it more before addressing the issue with Theta. In addition, he realizes that the time it takes to enter Zetsu and being able to maintain it will prove essential to perfecting the ability. Once he can control Zetsu at will, he declares that he'll dominate not only the contest for succession, but the world itself. At Kurapika's then training, the guards still worry about the test being conducted behind closed doors, but Furikov assures them that he and Babubina can tell if anything suspicious is going on, like manipulation, once Latiolus comes back out. Babubina thinks it's possible for Kurapika to semi-coercively open nodes, but then Kurapika's aura would be mixed in, and Furikov will be able to tell if someone is being controlled by it. They also worry that Bill's ability could be the factor, impressed by how intelligent Kurapika is. Latiolus comes back out, and Furikov can't believe the volume of aura around her, as if she'd been practicing the basics for three hours every day for a year. He can't be entirely sure with just this one case, but he doesn't think she's being controlled. Kurapika informs them that there will be a gag order on all their results until everyone has taken the test. Maurer is next and walks back with Kurapika and Bill. Kurapika informs him that they'll be using a Nen attack to force the process to speed up. Maurer is rightly cautious, but Kurapika assures him he won't be harmed at all. Bill then puts his hand around the glass of water, which has a seed in it, causing the seed to sprout. Kurapika says he's an enhancer whose ability allows him to cause the growth of his target. Maurer asks if that ability will be used on him to awaken his own, but Kurapika says he will borrow Bill's ability and then lend it to him, which will semi-coercively awaken Nen in someone, just as he did in Oito. Maurer exits with aura surrounding him, and Furikov again confirms that there's no manipulation here. Babimana is now convinced that Kurapika is using his specialist ability to awaken Nen, and that this is likely only one of his abilities, possibly having one for each of his chains. Maurer tells Longhi that everything Kurapika said was true, and he can feel himself brimming with vitality. As he focuses his breathing and works on maintaining it, Babimana considers that Kurapika will only continue these classes to make as many Nen users as he can, wondering if there's any plausible excuse to stop him. Yuri goes through the process next, and Kurapika explains that by learning Ten and Hatsu, she'll be able to perform the water divination test confidentially on her own. He also tells her that they're planning more classes, asking her if she can talk to Kacho and Seiko about sending more people. Bill thinks to himself about the benefits and risks about Kurapika's stalemate strategy, worrying that some could become power hungry and use Nen offensively, but he knows Kurapika inevitably has more to his plan to counteract this. Kurapika thanks him for allowing his ability to be disclosed, especially since it's rare for male enhancers to have a supportive ability. He asks Bill if he's sure he wants to continue. He says maybe, explaining that Beyond ordered him on board to travel to the new continent, but he's the one who chose to be a guard for Wobble since he thought there wouldn't be much combat protecting a baby. When Vincent appeared, it really angered him, and after hearing Kurapika's conversations with Oito, even though he's a coward, he says he finally gained the resolve to prepare for the worst. But Kurapika assures him that cowards don't gain this level of resolve. Hashito and Sakata interrupt the two, with the former asking if he can do the water divination test as well, since Tamtori will be the last to do it and he'd feel better if one of Zhang Lei's guards could use Nen sooner. But Kurapika denies his request, saying that he hasn't practiced the basics like the others, and would be much more fatigued. Into Beppa's quarters, Maur informs her that the training worked, and they should send more of their guards, with Dubepa allowing him to choose. Rihan wonders if he shouldn't be going after Halkenberg's Nen Beast instead, since Dubepa is enjoying itself. But that doesn't mean that hers is less dangerous. He also notices Maur's aura, understanding the stalemate that Kurapika is trying to create. He would prefer eliminating Kurapika first, but knows that it's not realistic for Predator given the number of abilities he can have. Since Halkenberg is already making moves, Rihan decides he should go after him first, before Tubepa. Even with Balsalmico's experience, and telling them to be patient, he worries that they're being too cautious after Shikaku's suicide. The focus shifts to Balsalmico, who desperately wants Rihan to figure out the situation with Halkenberg and Shikaku, but can't give him any information since the condition is the crux of Predator. He wonders if Shikaku committed suicide in an attempt to guarantee Benjamin's safety, given the power of Halkenberg ability, but realizes that Shikaku knows Benjamin despises begging for one's life the most. Now with Tobepa's perspective, she says that Salisali wouldn't have backed out of the concert just because he was sick, guessing that he was killed by Benjamin's men since they've started changing their shifts. She focuses on finding out Salisali's cause of death and whether Nen was involved so she can develop countermeasures. She gives a flash drive to one of her researchers, Heisen, hoping
hoping the mission will in some way affect any emerging abilities, which was a concern of Rihan's. Tuepic tries to come up with numerous ways to access the shift logs and find out what happened in Sally Sally's room, but realizes it would draw heavy suspicion. Maurer isn't skilled enough with them to defend her, so she considers enlisting the help of Kurapika. It's 11.30 a.m. on the 10th day of the voyage. Kurapika, Bill, and Oito feel the fourth rumbling of the aura, as the time between them is getting shorter. Flashback to 10 a.m. on the ninth day. Kanjidal is relaying the incident at Luzaris's quarters to Benjamin and Balsamico. He was in the prince's bedroom with the prince and four other guards. He tells them about the rumbling of aura and Chicago's suicide, saying the two must be linked and that it may have been forced in some sort of deal to keep Benjamin from harm. Balsamico agrees with the evaluation overall, but has three problems with the theory. First, Hulkenberg would have to have shot the emission ability through the rooms of the 11th and 13th princes in order to strike Benjamin in the VVIP area. It's not in Hulkenberg's character to force suicide or sacrifice the lower-ranked princes to get to Benjamin. Second, if Hulkenberg was able to order Chicago to do something, he would have had him go after another prince, not commit suicide. Third, Balsamico theorizes that in this contest, princes can't kill one another, and their Nenbis can't harm other Nenbis or the princes themselves. Since killing a royal is a capital crime, even for a prince, Balsamico thinks it makes sense that the Nenbis would follow this law. So, Hawkenberg's Nenbis would never support an ability that could kill a prince directly. But Balsamico is still unsure about the reason for Chicago's suicide, telling Kanjidol that the key is that had happened in front of Luzaris's quarters. He orders him to remember whatever he can and to observe everything that happens there from now on. Back to 11.30 a.m. on the next day, Benjamin and Balsamico feel the fourth rumbling of aura, and the former wonders what's going on with Vict, who's now stationed with Hulkenberg. Vict radios them using an emergency signal saying something about Hulkenberg in a boat, and as he mentioned that the prince is invincible and that attacks won't, he screams and the radio goes silent. Benjamin hopes that Vict's ability, Tackle Shield, would be able to keep Hulkenberg in check, but realizes that Hulkenberg's aggression and strength are greater than he thought. The two guess that it involves all his guards, and that he must sacrifice one of them for every shot. Benjamin's hand is shown with four stars below the four main fingers on his right hand. After Shikaku's death, he now possesses the abilities of four of his soldiers through Benjamin's baton, saying that Vict is still alive, but worries about wasting any more of his men. Benjamin asks Balsamico if they should transfer Muse's owl from Camilla into one of his guards, but Balsamico says they know even less about her ability, advising to keep it on her. He thinks that given the death of Chicago and now what's happened to Vict, Hawkenberg can be arrested on suspicion of premeditated murder, which has the added benefit of separating him from his men. Steiner and Pukert, both from the Restricted Voyage Permit Agency's Special Task Force, now working with the Kakin Justice Bureau, arrive at Hawkenberg's quarters and take him into custody. He'll be unable to contact his men until after the trial, and since Vict's status and location are still unknown, he'll be put under surveillance just as Camilla was. But Balsamico declares that the trial is their golden opportunity, and they'll make their move there. In Tyson's quarters, Izanavi tells Giuliano it's time for a shift, but the latter's enraptured by the Puko Tyson, saying that he was wrong about the prince and would love for her to be king. But that would be in complete contrast to her principles, and describes the book as sort of a parting message. Izanavi reminds him that his real job starts after after he's protected the prince once they reach the new continent. Giuliano knows this, but is unsure if he'll be able to just move on when he can see, as he describes, the tragedy to come. He makes his way to the main room and everyone's waiting for him, suddenly surprising him with birthday wishes. It's not his birthday, but Tyson, who's made him a cake, knew that they would have to say goodbye in two months anyway. She says she's so glad to have met him, and Giuliano begins to cry with happiness. In Luzaris's quarters, Kanjidol tries to get information from the other guards, but they're hesitant or unwilling to do so. Kanjidol thinks Shikaku's suicide was done in order to create a diversion, turning everyone's attention to the hallway while Hulkenberg had Queen Dwazul's man do something in the room itself, possibly attempting to assassinate Luzerus. Besides Satobi, five of the guards belong to Dwazul, and two of them may have tried to do something to two guards not affiliated with the Queen, Makne or Scared. Kanjidol thinks about what to do, worrying that he may draw suspicion, and thinks that Dwazul's men may be trying to manipulate Makne to kill Luzerus, but wonders how feasible that is with everyone else around. In addition, he believes that going after Hulkenberg should be Benjamin's priority, rather than investigating Luzerus' quarters. Lastly, he approaches Basho to ask him if he'll help with the investigation. Basho also thinks Dwazul's men are involved, and suggests that Makne and Scared be put under surveillance as suspects, but he says Luzerus disagrees with this, and that Dwazul's men don't help any prince. Even though none of her men know Nen, they could be pretending in order to throw him off. Kanjidol agrees and walks off, but Basho was just feigning that option, and actually believes that Benjamin's men are all behind this, and that Shikaku's suicide was necessary for an ability to activate, citing the power of Nen after death. He thinks they may have done it to put suspicion on Hulkenberg, while they actually go after one of the higher-ranked princes. With Camilla still under surveillance in the VVIP area, the focus shifts on her guards, one of whom has a picture of Benjamin in her shirt pocket. Maswana says she'll curse him to death so Camilla can take the throne. It's revealed that ancient Kakin had an unusual burial practice known as afterlife companions. They were taken from the lowest of the caste system, the have-nots, and were used to supervise in the land of the dead those princes who couldn't become king so that they wouldn't turn into vengeful spirits and curse the king or Kakin itself. The custom is no longer practiced, but Kakin's caste system remains, with these have-nots unable to hold public office or join the military and gain rank. Camilla, however, allowed them to join her personal army, giving them the same rights as Kakin soldiers. With Camilla now supporting them, they called for the practice of afterlife companions to be brought back and combining this with their Nen abilities, these have-nots become curse assassins. There are soldiers assigned to curse each of the remaining princes. They must carry the target's name, a picture of them, a piece of clothing, or something from their body at all times and curse them as much as they can. The longer this goes on and the closer they are to their target when they themselves die, the stronger the curse becomes. 
with the strongest to be committing suicide in front of the target. Sarah Hell, Camilla's captain and assigned to curse Prince Wobble, says that Chicago wasn't a have-not, but that he still could have used a similar curse. If this affects Camilla, they have their own exorcists ready to deal with it. The soldiers formerly assigned to curse Momose and Sally Sally will now investigate whether the enemy has any exorcists. The ability of the have-nots, Yomotsu Hegui, is explained in further detail. One carries a dagger and something connected to the target. After cursing the target every day on the day of the curse, they burn the object and drink a tonic of the ashes, then committing suicide with the dagger to activate the curse. The curse puts the target into a state of force zatsu, and the strongest of curses can take effect and be fatal within a couple of hours. Sarah Hell worries about the prince's then beasts as well as the hunters, hoping to curse one of the princes so they can find out if the association has an exorcist with them. She summons Fukutaki, the major domo, who explains how much time each curse would take before being able to activate. Another soldier informs Sarah Hell that Kacho and Fugetsu are being held in custody for an escape attempt, and Fukutaki says it would take much longer given their current location. She also explains that with the Nen Beast factor now, the curses won't be successful unless they're close enough to touch the princes, looking into their eyes when they curse them. Even though she hasn't been cursing her for a while, Sarah Hell thinks of Wobble as the best target, especially since the hunters are still offering Nen classes. Fukutaki asks her if she's aware of the risk, and Sarah Hell says even if she fails, she has nothing to lose as a have-not. In Zhang Lei's quarters, Temptori informs the prince that the Nen training was successful, now able to see his Nen beast. Zhang Lei gives him a coin as a reward thinking that it's the first one he's given to someone. Kobentoba, however, still has the coin he secretly picked up, but notices the coin's number has gone from 1 to 10. Kobentoba thinks it may be a different coin, but realizes it has the same aura as the one he initially picked up, guessing that it has something to do with the Nen Beast's ability. He asks to see Temptori's coin, and it also has a 10 on it. Zhang Lei thinks to himself about the ability, saying that the Nen Beast drops one coin a day and it would be pointless to keep them himself. He's unsure about the purpose of the coins and thinks they would be more useful after he becomes king than for the contest itself. After he becomes king than for the contest itself. Now with renewed resolve to win the throne, Zhang Lei goes to meet with the boss of the Jiu family, telling him that three of his siblings are already dead. He asks Oniara about the Nen Beast and Nen, with Oniara oblivious to both, but he does know that some of the younger members have weird powers. Oniara tells Zhang Lei that Nasubi won his succession contest by being patient and waiting, saying that he'll look into what happened back then. Zhang Lei leaves, saying to himself, I'm counting on you, father. Hinrai contacts Oniara about the situation with Morena and the Heili, saying that it's worse than they thought, and several members of the Cha'ar and their own family have been killed. Oniara still wants to find Hisuka first so they can control the troop, and Hinrai lets him know that Hisuka wasn't in Tier 4. Oniara tells him to give the spiders permission to search Tier 4, while he goes up to Tier 3 to look for Hisuka and kill Morena as well. Hinrai meets up with Zakuro and Lynch, telling them that they're resuming the search for Hisuka and they'll be crushing the Heili. Hinrai bribes a soldier to let them up to Tier 3, and he says it's calmed down up there, but the Haley is on a rampage. As the three arrive, two Haley members spot them, and the ZU members notice this. Zakuro and Lynch approach one of them, but a third Haley member sneaks up behind Zakuro and slashes at their throat with a knife. Zakuro puts her hand to the wound, while the first man kicks Lynch hard in the stomach, knocking her to the floor. Hinrai catches up to the female Haley member, saying that if she takes him to Morena, he'll spare her life. The woman casually walks away, saying a few words about still being civilians, and that the soldiers will get involved if they continue to escalate things. Hinrai realizes that this is the case because Morena's people didn't list themselves as official mafia members. The Haley member who punched Lynch tries to question her, but she points his attention to his friend, whom Zakuro has wrapped in a web of blood that's coming from the wound. They hurl the man into the air, slamming him down to the floor. Zakuro's full name is Zakuro Custer. Their manipulator and their ability, Bloody Mary, allows them to control their own blood. They keep the IV line with them since it's practical, but also has a limitation. Lynch sneaks up on the other man, startled as he is by Zakuro's ability, and asks him how many Haley members there are, punching him hard in the stomach. A voice comes out of his body that says 23 people. She then asks how many of those have abilities and what they are, striking him with a flurry of punches. More voices come out, saying that he doesn't know how many have abilities and that they have to kill people to increase their level to 21 in order to attain one. Lynch's full name is Lynch Fulboko. She's an emitter, and her ability, body and soul, causes the target's inner voice, not audible to others, to come out once she asks them a question and hits them. Hinrai regroups with them, saying that they have to back off since the Haley members are listed as civilians. A soldier lets them off with a warning, but tells them to stay out of tier 3 from now on. Hinrai gives a roll of money to each of the two soldiers, touching both of their guns, and promises that they won't make use of their weapons, and that they won't come back to tier 3. The two soldiers are happy to have money, but suddenly the barrels of both their guns turn into snakes, firing bullets into each of their heads. Hinrai is a conjurer whose ability Biohazard allows him to turn a weapon or piece of machinery he touches into an animal that he controls, which is still able to function as the original object. There you go. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. I'm Adrian, this was the speedrun of Hunter x Hunter. Let me know what other series we should speedrun next. I'm out, I need to get some water.